Good morning to everyone. Thank you very much for uh, attending this workshop. Uh, happy New Year. Thank you very much for the invited speakers. And uh, let me introduce you uh, Mercedes. He's the director of the Institute of Physics, and she's going to uh, inaugurate this uh, workshop that I hope uh, you enjoy. Mercedes, thank, thank you, you very for much. Thank you. Well, everyone, good morning. Welcome to Mexico City. Welcome to the Institute of Physics. And it's for me a great pleasure and honor to inaugurate this uh, 70th anniversary of the CN Accelerator, the Graph Accelerator. Although we are talking about the 70th anniversary, I must say that in reality, we have, a, we have had this accelerator for only 36 years in operation. Mm -hmm. It took several years from its donation to actually bring together all the pieces. And it took several years, well, I mean, I don't know, maybe six years, I don't know. Yeah, from the donation until we had, yeah, exactly, yes. So it was back in 1998 when we had this accelerator in operation. I must say that it's been very important for us to have this accelerator working. And it had several updates that fortunately the researchers from the nuclear physics and departments have been working on with very promising uh, uh, results. So this has been a real challenge, but as I said, it's going to be very, very interesting to have the accelerator updated and working in optimal conditions. We had several important contributions for this workshop from work, uh, participants from the USA, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, and I think it's going to be very productive. I hope this will be very exciting for all of you and particularly important for the students. We'll have this bridge to reinforce all the research ties to have very interesting results on the research projects. And of course, I just wish you all the best in this academic activity. And as I said before, welcome to Mexico City. Welcome to the Institute of Physics. And I wish you all the best for this workshop. Thank you very much. Now we are going to start the yes. workshop uh, and, you're to stay. <laughs> and also you are welcome to the uh, round table. We will talk the round table is going to be a bit late. Right, yeah. yeah. I will do my best. I will do my best. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, I think I will stay for the first talk, then I have to rush, but okay. it's important to mention that this uh, workshop is going to be recorded, so I will have yes, the opportunity. Exactly. Thank you, thank so you for mentioning. So hopefully you don't mind, but I will take a look at your talks later on, if yes. you don't mind. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So if you mind, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> Just let us know. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay. So our first uh, talk uh, is going to be Efraín Chávez, and he is going to talk about the present and the future of the Pandemic Accelerator. And yes, we are going to turn off the lights. Thank you, so much, It doesn't say that. It says present and future. So this is. Uh, uh, philosophy class. Uh, uh, my my talk is uh, is the least uh, important in this meeting. Uh, we are here uh, to to talk about what uh, what we do and what we uh, uh, think that can be done with uh, electrostatic accelerators. Uh, we have uh, here. Uh, the largest model that was ever built, the uh, 5.5 megavolt CN model by Carabotos. Uh, and uh, I will then show you um, what uh, what we're doing and what we think that can be done. And I will also talk about uh, projects to um, further uh, upgrade the accelerator to have a different uh, uh, perspective with, with a new accelerator. So this is a, a, a map that was done uh, by one of my students. It's not complete, but it's not his fault. It's not complete because there is not a, a database that's uh, available with all the accelerators in the world. So even what, what, was, what was possible and uh, actually 
database that we have now is better than any other database that it's in, in available anywhere about the particle electrostatic accelerators in the world. And you can see that there's many uh, accelerators in, in Europe, in Asia, and in North America, and even in South America. There's one here, uh, well, there's, not sure. there's two here in Mexico. Uh, actually, the, we're counting only the, the tandem actinine and the 5.5 megawatt. Uh, so they're, they're smaller accelerators, and I will speak about those too. Okay, so uh, so the question now, is why are there so many electrostatic accelerators in the world? And uh, that's why we're here. We're here then to discuss what can be done, what are we doing, what is the more challenges or more exciting uh, topics that can be addressed with these kind of accelerators according to the ones that, that are present here. And uh, uh, what are the advantages that these machines present in, the, in relation to all the kind of machines that uh, uh, been built and uh, became more uh, popular. So this is a machine. We will go uh, across the hall and, and visit the in person. Uh, it's it's a giant. It's a 5.5 megawatt, and it's been working for 70 years using these beams. Protons and alpha and alpha are, are the prepared beams to do ion beam analysis, and there will be uh, a, a very nice talk that will be close and the uh, talk of the, of the conference by Stephen Moore. He will tell us a lot more about this, which has been the, the main uh, topic of uh, scientific interest in, in this uh, laboratory for many years. Deuterons and helium 3 are more exotic uh, beams, and those are reserved for, for more special kind of work. And those are uh, have been the, the door that we use to try to do some nuclear physics at a very low energy scale. So that, those are beams that came with the accelerator in 1984 when it was uh, donated to the university. Uh, there has been, as I said, uh, ion beam analysis. This technique has been used uh, extensively and over 100 publications that uh, can be found. And uh, this is mostly the work led by Eduardo Andrade, who's been the head of the accelerator since the beginning of the, uh, the idea and the conception of the project, to recently, uh, until recently, where he essentially. Uh, <clears throat> Was uh, um, how <laughs> by, by, by another responsible Oscar the uh, uh, and then uh, more recently I started taking this. So the ion beam analysis has been part of also this laboratory, and it will continue to be. The reason is that this is something that can be done and will be done, uh, no matter what happens with this accelerator. This is something that has proved to be uh, important for uh, uh, the development of uh, applied and in, in, in disciplinary science, uh, engineering services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That, uh, uh, in 1994, there was a failure of telephone the Berkeley Institute, and it came uh, equipped with a modern uh, uh, or professional uh, chamber that can do all these techniques is in things. So uh, many of the scientists that were working on, the, yeah. on this Van der Graaff migrate to this laboratory and didn't look back. So they, they're, they're not coming back. So uh, although the, 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 the idea you know, when this accelerator was first uh, uh, imported was not to do this I mean, analysis uh, work. Essentially, that's what's been going on since it's arrived. Then in 2017, uh, an extension to the AMS laboratory uh, was uh, commissioned. This uh, beam line here, and you will have time to go to this, this laboratory also after lunch. Uh, and uh, sure enough, we started doing also in the characterization in this, in this week. So it's, uh, it's a situation where we have 
the, the, the big accelerator that has been doing time analysis for long, for very long time. But now uh, it needs to open new new eyes, new eyes. So I, 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 I really need to to just to, to take a moment to talk about this work that was very important. Uh, uh, it was published in 2021 after some debate with the editors and the referees, and it describes uh, the uh, restoration of the iron source of the accelerator that was almost destroyed completely after an accident in the end of 2017. So that, that, that work uh, is uh, the work of uh, uh, students, uh, Christian, uh, who's here with us now, Alan, should be here also, uh, let me see, uh, led by uh, Raul Tejel, uh, Roberto Luis and Ricardo Valencia. Uh, I have to say that Javier Mas, you will see his name coming up, uh, coming uh, very, very frequently. He's been here and supporting uh, our research in many different ways. So this is uh, uh, how you, what you look when the accelerator is open. Now it's closed, you will see this, but this is essentially the column, the high voltage terminal, the tank. This is the source. And this is a dark view of the, of the time when it's, it's coming. And it's great. So um, last year we uh, we modified the configuration of the of the iron source so we can inject into the into the accelerator any masses because of this uh, slight uh, deviation in, with a magnet uh, that was there to select masses up to four. Now we took out the magnet and we can do everything. <clears throat> and we can we can get beams of uh, arbitrary mass and then we analyze them uh, with the radio green magnet. Uh, still, this uh, radio frequency source will produce only uh, low charge states. And, uh, so the energy uh, for these heavy ions is very limited and they're not very useful for motor cells. So that's why uh, we. Uh, we walk into the idea of uh, changing the iron source for a PCR source uh, uh, that uh, looked to us like uh, very original. Now I know it's not very original. There are other accelerators that have done already the same. Even to put an accelerator, they put uh, a source of this kind inside to, to have high uh, charge states. There are commercial. Uh, uh, iron sources that can be uh, found in the market. This is high voltage engineering. This is the nature of the accelerator. We have the AMS facility and they provide high, higher charge states uh, for the uh, times they produce. Uh, this uh, source is optimized to produce. High currents, so we're we're not very much interested in this, uh, and the price makes it even less. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are there are other options, and this is the one that we are trying to pursue. We have the option of building themselves the iron source, so so we have to learn uh, our hands and and uh, uh, get students into it, so so we we can design. And construct an iron source that can work inside an accelerator and provide the, the, the quality and the ions that we need. This uh, particular um, kind, 2.45 gigahertz, is kind of weird now. But this is the uh, uh, frequency that's used in the normal the microwave ovens that we have in the house. So the, all the electronics for these kind of uh, oscillators is, is well known and developed. This is a source that. Uh, uh, we will try to, to to build even without much help. We, we think we can do it ourselves and they start uh, playing with, with iron sources that produce high currents of light times. But this is not what we need for the 5.5 megawatt. We need a higher frequency, uh, uh, easier. Uh, this is an example of, of uh, 14 gigahertz. Uh, um, and source 
So you can see right away that there are higher church states. So if you multiply that for the five and five, you will you get to the DNA for the Halloween energy. For the decrease in energy that you will get. And uh, the advantage, the, the additional advantage that we have for the single ended accelerators is that you don't need to produce negative values. So, so you get, uh, you, you, can, you can have beams from for every element in the, in the periodic table, uh, inclusive uh, noble gases that cannot be produced and accelerators. Uh, so, from the, you look at the uh, everybody's reference in this iron source. Uh, Corbinus is uh, one of the uh, uh, people who originally designed these this, uh, iron sources. You see there are uh, different uh, frequencies, and you, you get up to now over 30 gigahertz, and it depends on the, on the magnetic field that you can produce to. to um, uh, hold the, the, the plasma inside the, the dinosaurs. And of course, uh, the, the charge states that you get and currents that you get increase when you increase the magnetic field and the frequency of the dinosaurs. This is a different kind of ion source. This is an electron, electron gun. So you have just a very powerful gun tubes. Uh, uh, pulse of electrons and it peels at the atoms that are there, and then it will give you pulse beams with very high charge. So this is gold, example of gold. You see here uh, gold at 60 plus. So obviously the, the energy that you get there is very high. You can get those too with an uh, easy source of gold. So you need the frequencies that uh, go up. Um, I mean, this uh, 300 MeV. Gold uh, beams. This is something that you cannot get easily with a accelerator. This is the the largest tandem uh, accelerator in the world. This is the uh, accelerator, and you get uh, here with 25 megavolts. Uh, well, it's, uh, 25 megavolts in, in the terminal. You get a charge state of 15, something like this. So that's that's the energy that you get out of the largest. It's not, it's not a competition, but uh, just to say that just by changing the energy source, you, you will get uh, much higher energy and you will open uh, a lot of possibilities, new possibilities for us. So I, I will not uh, go very much into what I think can be done with, with the new source, but I will uh, tell you what we have been done, not just in this accelerator, but in, in, the, in the accelerators that we have. And uh, essentially, we, we cover this. Uh, and we know a bit about um, ion beam analysis. I uh, uh, let Eduardo and Steven uh, talk about that. Uh, they're, they're more uh, uh, suited to do this. So, I will talk about what I like, which is uh, fundamental physics, and then I'll talk about uh, adronic radius. We know about Hadronic radius, you know, electromagnetic radius, and Corp is going to tell us more about weak radius uh, today. So, this is uh, very interesting. Nuclear astrophysics, of course, this is something that uh, is, it's, it's been done in many, many low energy accelerators. We do some structure and also we, we work uh, also. So, what's the radius of the nucleus? Uh, you you ask yourself what's the radius of nucleus, you, you, you still have to tell you what kind of radius you're talking about. The electromagnetic radius, like this one that's measured by the shift of the epiphine uh, uh, separation of the electronic levels, that's, that's an electromagnetic radius. Uh, the radius of the nucleus, this is the hollow halo nucleus, so this is a different kind of radius, and you can measure this using the strong force scattering of the nucleus. And uh, so we, we've been doing this. We did this very difficult experiment, protons and aluminum. You would think this is a very simple thing. Everyone can do it. And it surely be, has been done. And uh, you look at the literature, and you don't see here, but uh, there's no agreement. So everyone 
measures if, if it claims that they have the lowest misconceptions, and then they plot it next to the next guy, and the next guy has a different, uh, different value for the system excitation functions. And these are general distributions that we measure. We measure only the backward angles because at this low energies that we have uh, is where, where you expect to see a difference with the, with the Coulomb uh, scattering alone. So, uh, for neutral astrophysics, when we started uh, some time ago, in the Libertad, that's, that's the Libertad's thesis, the carbon carbon fusion reaction. And we were able to measure the fusion cross section down to 225 uh, MeV in central mass. That was a uh, world record for a few months. Then the Germans measured 20K lower, and then they had the record. Um, okay. And then we take advantage of the fact that we have an AMS facility here, and so we are combining the uh, particle accelerators and the nuclear reactors to measure cross sections using the AMS as a detector. So, this is the, uh, an example, this is the first example that we tried the silicon uh, to make the alpha reaction. This is, this is a mystery reaction in, in, in nuclear astrophysics because nobody uh, takes into account the deuterons. In, in the calculations, uh, although there are neutrons everywhere. So anyway, this reaction produces aluminum 26, and aluminum 26 is one of the uh, uh, most important uh, products, uh, gamma ray uh, sources in the, in the cosmos. We also did this uh, reaction, and then we did again this uh, reaction, and with the uh, Daniel Marine here and and Peter Libertad, they did we, we, we went to the nuclear reactor at V and we measured some more cross sections. So, in the end, there is a summary of we've been, done, we've been doing with this activation method in this paper. This is a, a review paper on <clears throat> activation method, uh, not just what we've done, what has been done before. There was published recently. Uh, Okay. okay, this is a, this is a good uh, moment to to uh, mention background uh, records. And then this is part of the work uh, of many many people. Uh, of course, um, Eduardo Andrade is here, and he's been the, the head of the laboratory for many years. Uh, Roberto Gleason, he is in charge of the five five megawatt accelerator. Arcadio Huerta here, he's the, the technician uh, operator in charge of the AMS facility. Uh, Paulina Solis, she is the head of the AMS laboratory. Maria, she is in charge of carbon 14, measurement percent of every, every other isotope uh, available. Libertad Barron, she, uh, she is uh, more working now in, in neutron physics, but uh, She's participating with us also in these measurements. Daniel and Luis Acosta, uh, the nuclear young guys. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Vicky and uh, with Javier, uh, they, they are the, the senior students. They're, they're the ones that uh, are uh, PhDs and uh, have been really uh, collaborating with the group. For Santiago Padilla, we're missing him very much here. He was uh, forcing the AMS laboratory to, to work with uh, uh, cosmogenic uh, isotopes. And Alan, of course, he's that's, that's he. Okay, for the nuclear structure, so we have a, a gas target. Uh, this is a uh, a supersonic uh, target, and we have this kind of uh, area densities, uh, which is good for those who know. This is very good for those who don't know. This is very good. Uh, this is a, <laughs> this is a, this is a, to, to have a flow of, of gas and uh, my connection is unstable. Uh, so we put the beam in 
In here, in this, you can see very well, but there is, there is, there is a, a, a high density form where we, we have to put the beam, and then we can do reactions directly. But this is uh, one because uh, the developers experiment that we did. And that spectrum here, which was commissioning spectrum, turned out to be very interesting because it shows the structure of carbon 12. Uh, from a new uh, nitrogen for the neutron uh, uh, reaction. And turns out this is, this is really very important to study the uh, high excitation states in carbon 12, the whole state and the rotational band on top of it. So that, uh, that was uh, very interesting. That was Francisco Favela's crazy thesis. We continue with this effort and that was Elaine's uh, the master thesis uh, that we tried with the solid target that turned out that it was very, very complicated. Still, she did a very good job extracting cross sections from this uh, experiment. Of course, uh, uh, Daniel's uh, thesis with this is not on here, that was on a cyclotron element, but uh, that's where we can see the, the motivation for these experiments to see the rotational bands of uh, excited states in carbon with different. Uh, in moments of inertia, this is the ground band, or band. So this is this is all things that have been done in, in everywhere in the world. There are some calculations here that were done by uh, Rudolf here and uh, and collaborators. Uh, it's uh, half a cluster model. Standard model. So what do we do with this thing? I, I like this picture. We call the Aztec, but it's a representation of the world. Really, it has four different worlds, and uh, each each of these worlds represent this world is water. This one is there. This one is wind, and this one is fire. And, and this is Aztec. So that's that's. Uh, Funny because it, it, it resembles very much the Greek conception of, of, the, of, the, of the world. And this is the modern. There's a difference between these two guys. Now, that's the, the middle. The, this is a particle, but this guy is time. That's moving. So the standard model, model doesn't have a timing for the static and that has time. So it's 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 a okay. So the the Newman is being the subject of the discussion in uh, uh, in the previous uh, conferences, and uh, this has to do with the extraction of the nuclear uh, matrix elements for the double beta uh, neutrino less decay. Uh, we we are part of this collaboration, and we we've been working here in the development of targets for that experiment. This is picture that we take of the cool targets that were tested here in the Netherlands. And uh, these are the temperatures that were used. We're also now uh, producing implanted targets. Of course, the targets that are of interest are triton and xenon targets. And those can, can be done only in the 5.5 megawatt. Uh, these are examples that we did with the older isotopes. This is iodine, and this is uh, bromide. And of course, in general, the students that were uh, in charge of this work, the other guy is not a student, so it's not uh, So that has to do with the neutrino uh, identity, whether it's Dirac or Majorana. And this was a uh, uh, work that we did with neutron scattering, neutron elastic scattering at four angles, trying to see if there was. And interference of, you know, of the gravity uh, and the nuclear force at very short distances. If the string theory has some, uh, it, it can, can, can be tested at these very short energies uh, because then the gravity will have more dimensions. And then, the, since it's a geometry uh, thing, then instead of going down like one of a R square, it will go down like a point. Uh, up to the 10. Uh, so, we did this experiment. We were hoping to see how much the 
we, we can find a deviation between calculations and the data at short angles. The, the problem is that the calculations themselves don't agree with each other. So that's, uh, that's, that's another point to the, to, to the theoreticians. And that will uh, uh, essentially end here. Uh, what uh, we have is, is a number of, of, uh, of experiments that are waiting to be executed. Many have deuterons uh, as projectiles, and some uh, have area image. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have uh, a window of opportunity if we can, uh, when, we, when we have the new fine source in, in, the, in the accelerator, and we can do diverse kinematics for all these reactions, and then talk to solve the, the reaction flows forward to see. So those are uh, uh, my final remarks. I will um, not read them. There uh, for you, you have the, the presentation. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, as I said, my presentation is just an introduction. What's more uh, relevant for us, and I guess for this meeting, is uh, what you have to see. And if uh, we can end up after this workshop with, with a, a number of subjects or even experiments that can be uh, tried. That, that would be a great, a great success. So, really, uh, I thank you for, for, for your presence and uh, your uh, contribution to, to this. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> We have time for questions. Okay. So thank you very much for this presentation. So I'm sure you know because your connection with aliens that at Florida State University, the experimental group have been very successful in having machines that they are not decommissioned, but essentially the lab might have been decommissioned. So we have a penny trap that we inherit from MIT. And recently, we have installed a split pole spectro spectrograph that we inherit from Yale. So there is this culture in which some people go, get them, and install them. Is that also a culture that is built in here, getting to different laboratories that are being decommissioned and get some of the things? I love your comment. I'm envious of the separation. <laughs> That you have in, in, in the US. Uh, ours is the only university with a party separated in Mexico. So the, we don't have no one to fight with, to collaborate with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, uh, yes, uh, actually, the accelerator was a dimension. It came from the ICBS department. So, so we, we, we know about this, but it's not as easy uh, to. To move things from, from uh, Massachusetts to Florida as it is to move to, from Texas to, to Mexico. So it's, uh, there's a border there. <laughs> and that's, 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 that's I think there's, there's, there's a lot of difficulty. Uh, but yes, uh, sometimes we, we take advantage of opportunities like yeah. magnets from a bridge and the uh, uh, the accelerator and the tandem were positioned. We do not uh, uh, magnetic uh, quadrupole triplets from the world. We get equipment from time to time, but it's really, we are the last in the list. So it's, so something gets the commission, and then <coughs> if it's a national lab, all national labs take a look, then universities take a look, and if nobody wants to answer, then they read things up. But it's, it's really nice. Any other comment? Any other question? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> being the only university lab in Mexico, how much service do you give to other research groups around Mexico or industry? Of course, industry is the way you get some money. Uh, but uh, there are people, and there are a lot of uh, places working on thin films, on biology, on surface processing, uh, which I'm sure could use an enormous amount of 
the information which is available through ISV and Yeah, we have terrible at uh, promoting our, our, our work. So that's uh, that really, we, we work a lot, we get things done, and we know uh, how to do things, but nobody has knows about it. So that's, uh, that's a problem. So yes, that there is probably how the uh, source of uh, work and income, but uh, we have not been able to reach it so far. So hopefully we can in the, in the near future. Maybe you can orient us uh, a little bit in, in which they go. Some of my students have helped. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. You, I'm sure you'll tell us more about that. <laughs> okay, well, any other questions? Yes, uh, a really good question. Uh, thank you, Ray. Uh, regarding your key alpha measurements, uh, how, how is the background and can you couple also together with the uh, alpha detector, gamma detector as well? We haven't also, tried, we, and, we haven't tried. Yeah, sorry, just one last question. Also here in, you have the uh, uh, PAC uh, committee for proposals. Uh, you're, you're talking to me. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay. Sorry, sorry. 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 Let's let's go step by step. Well, the first is the the P alpha reaction. Do you have uh, to do with the background and how to do this? Okay. The, the uh, since we have a military selection, uh, you can you can identify the alpha particles, and uh, so the background is okay. it, it, that kind of background is. We don't have gamma rays in coincidence so far. Uh -huh. So that's, if you're referring to that background, we don't have that. Okay, great. And uh, the third and the latter, I promise. Uh, here, do you have a, a pack, a proposal committee to from <clears throat> someone from outside propose here as experiment? We, we don't have, we have a, we have a local uh, committee that uh, would uh, examine the proposal from outside. But we don't have that many proposals from from us yet. So you're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Ephraim. Well, my speaker, Andrew Rogers from uh, Massachusetts uh, University. Go well. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Andrew. And Andrew is going to talk about. Uh, uh, the nuclear science at the University of UMass Global Radiation Laboratory. And it's a pleasure having you here, Andrew. Thank you, thank thank you very much. Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's been really a great experience. It's my first time in Mexico. Uh, so it's great to explore Mexico City a little bit. And uh, I also really enjoyed the uh, Hope York uh, conference uh, that's been going on over the past week. So it's just really uh, great to be here. Um, <laughs> And it's like, great. Um, so my kind of goal, I think, with this talk is, uh, I guess, to make some connections uh, to what you're doing here. And I, I really appreciated uh, Twain's uh, talk. Uh, I think it's in a lot of ways similar to my talk, <laughs> um, because we have a very similar machine <laughs> at, at, at all. Uh, so it's really interesting to see what you're doing, uh, what the students are doing. And, and it's really great to see that you're doing clients with the machine that, that you have here. Um, so uh, I think where I want to go with this is I'd like this talk also to open up discussion either now, but also later on in the day, and hopefully maybe connections in the, in the future. Um, yes. So, um, so let me just start by telling you a little bit about where I'm coming from. Um, it's nice to be here myself and see everything that's going on and learn about what uh, you're all doing, but I, I don't think too many people here have been to Lowell. So. <laughs> Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background about our university and, and department. Um, so we're, we're a bit of a diverse department. We have a variety of research areas. Um, we have strong groups in nuclear physics uh, and space science, as well as uh, quantum information and, and other areas. So we have uh, researchers that are building payloads that go on uh, uh, balloons uh, and even something that goes on the space station. Um, and so we have a wide variety of research going on with about 100 undergrad students. Uh, about 80 graduate students, there are master's students, PhD students, and we're roughly 27 to 29 kind of uh, research faculty with a few uh, teaching faculty 
uh, in the department, you know, the scale of what we are. And uh, in terms of nuclear science, I'm going to tell you a bit about the radiation lab and really focus on our bandage act accelerator. Um, but there, there are mainly um, three or four of us that are kind of focused on low energy nuclear physics and in particular experimental nuclear physics. Uh, so I work with uh, my, my colleagues here, Parker Chowdhury, who's the director of the radiation laboratory, who I think some people here know. Um, uh, I also work with another colleague, Peter Bender, uh, which is me. So I'm actually the associate director of the lab for the accelerator facility. Uh, and then uh, Kim Lister, uh, who is now emeritus, but uh, we work with him uh, from time to time on various projects. Um, so we have programs that uh, laboratories like Argonne and Michigan State, where we're doing nuclear structure, nuclear astrophysics kind of work there. Um, uh, but I'm going to focus again on what we do at, at Lowell. We also have uh, two uh, newer faculty. One is Aaron Burleson, who we hired as a radio chemist, uh, and then Marion Jandel, who's focused on kind of neutron physics and using the reactor. Um, a little bit more about the department. We also have a program, accredited program in medical physics, and so you'll see maybe some connections there in my talk. Uh, as well as health physics and radiological sciences. And so all of these things are incorporated kind of into the radiation lab at some level um, and uh, uh, leverage the facility. Uh, so for those of you that don't really know uh, about some of the geography of New England, uh, I'll kind of explain where we are. So I know we're down here, Boston is, is up here. Uh, and uh, I very much appreciated the invitation because uh, the weather <laughs> was very pleasant. Uh, even hopped in the pool, which was nice. Uh, and, and while uh, attending this conference, I was getting a lot of uh, updates about the weather uh, back in, uh, in the US, such as uh, uh, flooding likely, high winds, Arctic blast incoming. <laughs> uh, and so I was very happy to be sitting by the pool for some of the time. Because I checked on some cameras back home, and uh, it did not look very pleasant. <laughs> uh, although afterward, it can look very pleasant if you want to go for a hike in the in the park. Okay, but to, to focus a little bit more, um, zooming in now on Massachusetts here. If you haven't been to Boston, it's another beautiful city, just like Mexico City. A lot smaller, uh, has its own character. Um, and just north of Boston, about 40 kilometers or so, I believe, is Lowell, and we're just south of the New Hampshire border. I put this up here not just to show you a map, but I also wanted to locate another uh, uh, place. And this is Burlington, Massachusetts, kind of in between downtown Boston and, and, and Lowell. Right? This will come up uh, again in a, in a moment. Uh, and so looking at uh, telling you a little bit more about our campus. So uh, this is uh, actually uh, our campus is kind of split into three different campuses. We have East Campus, the North Campus, where our kind of engineering and sciences are. And then uh, off the screen, there's the South Campus, where we have humanities and all sorts of things like that. Um, and Lowell's a very interesting town, I can discuss that later. We have a very powerful river, the Merrimack River, that cuts through uh, the city and the campus. And uh, I'm going to zoom in right here on the north campus. And if, if you zoom in, you'll see the, the radiation laboratory. This is Penansky Hall. At one end, we have a reactor facility. And at the other end, we have a vertical uh, tower, just like you, <laughs> where it, that holds the uh, accelerator facility. Um, so I thought I'd take this opportunity also just to look back a little bit at, at what where Lowell has come from because I also like to educate myself on the past. In uh, on the past, uh, I only started there in 2014, and so <laughs> there's a lot that, uh, that I don't know. Uh, and so we have a lot of old photos of when the building was built. So uh, at this this time, and um, uh, the, the university was actually called Lowell Technical Institute, um, and, and that was started in 1953. And in 1966, they started to pour the foundation to build the radiation laboratory. And so this is actually the foundation being poured for the accelerator tower. Right, and this is the tower going up. Right? And then at the other end, they constructed the containment building for the reactor facility. And so this is uh, late 60s, 1969. And then it has a paint job. And, and so the, the basis of the building is kind of getting complete uh, in the early uh, 1970s or so. And uh, I won't say anything really about the reactor uh, in the rest of the talk, but I at least wanted to put up a, a, a nice photo. And we really have a nice reactor facility there. It's a one megawatt open pool reactor. So when it's running, this is literally what you look at when it's on. It's, it's very beautiful. You can see everything going on, the shrink off radiation. Uh, you can really look at all the, uh, the core, the fuel elements, the different places where we can, we can irradiate samples and, and, and utilize this facility. And of course, uh, so there was a mention of companies. I will talk about this a little bit more. 
Our reactor facility is heavily used by local companies as well as people from all over the world um, who come to, to use the facility. All right, so now I want to focus on the, the Van der Graaff machine. Um, so uh, at the other end of our building, we have our, our tower, and inside, this should look very familiar, we have our 5.5 megavolt Van de Graaff. It's not as beautiful as the red one that uh, I saw a picture of a moment ago. I really, really want to paint ours. <laughs> Kentucky also has their paint blue and that would be very nice um but uh okay it, it's a it's a machine that works very well uh and when you take the tank off we have some scaffolding that allows us to work on the column um okay and to come back to the map um and this is something i actually would like to learn myself more about so this machine was built by all the high voltage engineering and we have a nice plaque that says high voltage engineering and at that time they were in burlington massachusetts so literally down down the road I don't know if they made the tank and everything there, but at least uh, they were located just a few miles, a few uh, uh, 20 kilometers away from, from the university. <laughs> <It helps. laughs> so, um, so I'm gonna now talk a little bit about our machine. Um, uh, so I think the first half of my talk here, I, I wanna focus on kind of the technical aspects of the machine. I, I, I've learned a lot about what you guys are doing, which uh, I've actually read the paper because I was interested in upgrading our ion source and, and so on. So um, uh, I think there's a good uh, amount of technical discussion that we can we can have. And then the second part of my talk, I'll, I'll kind of focus on how we're utilizing the machine. Um, so our machine, uh, we probably look like your machine, is a belt-driven machine. So we have a motor down here, rubber belt. I think the rubber belt is not going to be replaced in 20 or 30 years, if ever. <laughs> it still seems to be working OK. And uh, here's our column. Uh, it's a little hard to take a picture of, but the tank uh, is a vertical machine. So when we take the tank off, it has to go way up here on this, on this deck. Uh, and then we have one uh, staff member uh, for the accelerator facility that the university uh, supports. So this is Greg Parker. He's our accelerator supervisor. He, he takes care of the machine uh, and all the system and, uh, and, and, and running the machine. Now, um, when I came in in 2014, so a little bit of this talk is about my kind of experience as well. Um, I had never worked with a Van de Graaff machine, and I had never worked with a tandem machine. I'd worked with some ion sources. Um, I did my PhD at Michigan State University, so uh, I was involved in some projects, but not really with the cyclotron or anything. So I, I had a limited bit of uh, amount of experience. So of course, when I came in, we were trying to revive the machine. It had been kind of sitting idle. Um, uh, we wanted to, to start to use it. Well, if you want us to use it, uh, you have to learn how the machine works. And, and so this was an excellent time to, to kind of educate myself. Uh, and so the first thing you do, is, of course, is you look for the manual. <laughs> and we have bunches of manuals all around uh, uh, that I tried to decipher uh, and, and learned a lot about how this particular machine was, was working. So this is very useful for myself, but it's also very useful for, for students. And that, that was something that was really great this week at the Kokio conference, seeing all the students um, uh, the projects they're working on, because this type of machine and facility um, it is a really great educational experience. Students can get hands on it. There are all sorts of little projects that they can they can work with and, and really learn a lot. And there's a lot of really great basic physics here, uh, electrostatics and everything that, that you can learn from, from something like this. And so this is a really important thing and it's great to see all the activity in here. Uh, and of course, when things get, you know, when things break and you have to dive into, into more detail, you can get out the schematics and look at circuits and figure out this thing that was built 60 years ago, where one component is broken and what wire goes where, right? So there's a bit of a challenge here, but we involve the students as well. They <laughs> get involved with uh, opening the tank, learning how to use tools they probably never used before, uh, which is all a really good uh, experience. Okay, so a few details and I, 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 like the, I think you showed a picture very similar to this, and I, I, I thought you were going to because it, it's kind of nice to see the same the same system maybe somewhere else, and that people are, are thinking about it in the same ways. Um, so at the top of our column, if you take off the the, the, the cover, this is the the terminal, um, and uh, of course we have our ion source at the top with a few gas bottles. We're also running uh, uh, hydrogen, uh, deuterium, and uh, helium. Uh, and at some point, I'd like to put a helium three bottle up there, but we haven't gotten there yet. Um, and then we, we have our ion source. We have, again, a, a long bottle, which has a high output. We have the uh, our oscillator circuit. And, and this is all, I know that you've upgraded your system. This is all the original stuff, which has also been modified, but <laughs> is, is not upgraded. 
Um, and then we have a, a we, we have a, a straight through kind of uh, electrostatic uh, ionizer lens that helps us focus the ions and inject them into the into the machine. And then what's maybe a little unique about our machine is that we also have the ability to pulse our machine. And so the the first component of the pulsing uh, system is up here. We have a, a and there's an aperture and a chopping circuit that basically oscillates the beam and spurts out some uh, kind of long pulses of uh, of beam uh, into the machine. And when it's running, we have a nice, uh, beautiful uh, uh, hydrogen uh, plasma that, that goes here. Um, okay. uh, and a little bit schematically, so again, the ions get uh, extracted from the ion source, they get focused to the ions lens, uh, and then we have some steering electrodes that allow us to, to direct the beam and inject it properly in the machine, as well as uh, develop uh, uh, pulses if we want to do uh, pulse beams. Uh, so the beam comes down to the floor. Uh, we actually have a nice open experimental hall. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is this machine was really originally designed to do uh, neutron scattering experiments. And I'll say a little bit more about that in, in a moment. Uh, at the moment, we have three beam lines. Uh, there's, a, there's a beam line here. This is kind of our general purpose beam line. There's a scattering chamber. Um, we're, we're bringing out beams into the air, doing some external beam work. I'll mention that in a moment. We have a beam line here where we have an ion microprobe. Um, and then the, the beam line in the back that you can't see, but I'll show a better picture in a moment, uh, is the beam line for really producing neutrons and doing neutron time of flight experiments. Um, what's maybe a little unique is that, uh, uh, as well as is we have an analyzing dipole magnet that we actually rotate. So uh, we don't have a, 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 a magnetic uh, deflector uh, steerer system. We have a rotatable magnet. So in, in principle, we can add beam lines as much as we want, uh, as long as there's space. Uh, and so this is a little bit better view of, uh, of the neutron uh, beam line here, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. So if we rotate the magnet and connect it to this line, uh, the beam comes down, travels through here. There's a, there's a box here, which is a really interesting system that I, I won't go into the detail about, but we can talk more about later if anyone's interested. Uh, this is the uh, RF compression system. So the way this works is we have packets of beam that come down. Uh, they pass into this system, and uh, there's an oscillating electric field which actually uh, rotates the, the beam packet in a sense, uh, and that beam packet passes through this second bending magnet. And what, what happens is basically the, the back of the packet uh, is allowed to catch up to the middle of the packet, and the middle of the, and the front of the packet takes uh, a longer flight path and kind of gets shifted in time towards the middle of the packet. So you get a time focus, uh, time focus here at the target. Uh, 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 at kind of with a resolution of sub nanosecond. And that allows you to do time of flight uh, measurements. Um, this is actually a really cool system. Uh, so this is looking inside of this, this cavity. Um, so this big thing here, this coil, is actually a big inductor, right? And then at the bottom, you can see there's a, there's a small gap with some plates. This is a capacitor. We drive this thing with a huge uh, vacuum tube. <laughs> and so we have an oscillating electric field here. Uh, and so as the beam passes through, depending on its relative uh, phase, the, the beam packet will get will come in like this. It will get rotated uh, in, in, in this sense, and then it, it passes through this dipole magnet and sent to the target where, where it comes to a focus. So this is just, again, a really cool LC circuit, just massive and uh, a massive power. Um, so again, the, the way our uh, neutron production works, fast neutron production is this proton beam impinges on a lithium target. And we uh, evaporate lithium uh, um, uh, while the experiment is running. Uh, uh, if it's a thin target, we get a monoenergetic, uh, quasi monoenergetic uh, beam of neutrons that we can basically dial up and down uh, by just dialing up and down the proton energy. And, and then uh, we can scatter off a target or we can do uh, some, uh, some other work uh, that I'll talk about in a moment. So, zooming in on the target here, we just have a tantalum uh, piece that we just stick on the end of the pipe. Uh, again, the beam hits it, we produce neutrons through this uh, uh, lithium-7 PN reaction, uh, uh, which is actually really, really useful. So it has a threshold of about 1.88 MeV. So you need a machine like this to be able to, to create these neutrons. Uh, and actually, the, the cross-section uh, is maximum at, at something around uh, 2 MeV. And there's a bit of an angular distribution with the forward focus of the, of the neutrons. But this is a very useful uh, fast neutron source. Um, what's also useful about it is it results in the production of uh, beryllium-7, uh, which has a, has a half-life of about 53 days. And so what we can do is after we do a measurement, we can actually assay the target and, and uh, determine the amount of beryllium-7 that, that was produced, 
which then allows us to tell how many neutrons were produced uh, uh, during the run. Uh, we also have a pick target. Uh, this is for five flux kind of irradiations, or we need just a, a lot of neutrons, but this is, of course, a more of a continuous uh, spectrum of, of neutron energies. Um, okay, so now I, I want to shift over and, and focus a little bit about how we're using the machine and some of the science that has been done. Uh, and then, how much time do I have? Okay, okay. Like 15 minutes, let's say. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm on time. <laughs> uh, so, again, I, I, I don't know a lot of, of the things that have happened in the past. Uh, I should try and talk to some of the couple people who are around about the things that happened long ago. But as I mentioned, the machine really started to get going in the 70s early 70s, uh, and the, the focus there was really trying to measure neutron scattering cross-sections. And so, again, the way this was done is, so I, I went and grabbed one of the pieces that was on the shelf, the oldest one I could find. In this case, this is from 1983. I don't know if it was a good thesis, I just grabbed it. <laughs> um, just to kind of illustrate what was being done at that time. So, so here, the, the proton beam is uh, impinging on this lithium target. Um, you create neutrons, and you have, have your, your scattering sample here. Those fast neutrons are um, illuminating basically the, the target of the sample. In this case, they were looking at inelastic scattering of uh, thorium 2, uh, 232. Um, so the new fast neutron comes in, it scatters, so you have an N prime uh, interaction, and then you can detect the neutrons uh, with a neutron detector that uh, you know, uh, can be uh, shielded, for example, in a, in a big uh, paraffin shield, uh, also with lead and, and so on. Uh, there are also other detectors, monitor detectors, to allow you to normalize things. And what you get out here is, in this case, uh, this is a pulse beam. So you know when you produce the neutron, uh, and then you know when you detect, detect the neutron. So if you know the distance to the, to the detector, uh, and, you, and you know the, the, the time it took, then you can get the velocity and calculate the energy. And so this is the way in which uh, a lot of neutron experiments are done using neutron time of flight. And you get a spectrum then uh, here that uh, allows you to, to see uh, various states. You can also move the detector around, measure angular distributions. And, and this was really what, what they were focused on in the, in the early days. Uh, these days, um, we've been using the machine more for detector development and uh, applied work, as well as interdisciplinary work. Uh, so I'll, I'll go into a few of uh, these projects here. Um, one uh, particularly nice project was involving uh, really state-of-the-art uh, planar high-purity germanium detectors. So these are segmented uh, germanium detectors. We, we got these from uh, PhDs uh, through collaboration and uh, SBIR. Um, and uh, one thing with these detectors, so they, at the time, these were the, they might still be, the largest uh, planar detectors that are being grown. Um, uh, but the, the contact technology here is uh, using amorphous germanium. And so, you know, one thing that wasn't clear is how, uh, how well will these things survive if they're exposed to neutrons? Because if we want to do, for example, an experiment at Argonne National Lab, and maybe we want to take this and look at low energy uh, uh, photons, uh, maybe in some heavy ion, some heavy ion or super heavy element search, this thing is going to get blasted with, with neutrons. We need to be able to annihilate it. And so the, one of the PhD, uh, or two of the PhD uh, projects here was to actually go and, and use this detector, put it in front of uh, the neutron source, uh, uh, damage it, and then see if we could uh, anneal it in some way. And so what you're seeing here uh, is uh, after we've uh, uh, given it a controlled dose, and you can actually see the, the hole here, which is the damage, because that's the closest place to the, to the source of neutrons. And then in this case, um, uh, we took it upstairs, and it was just room temperature annealed. Uh, to see if it would recover. And sure enough, we could recover basically this, the, this detector. Um, so this resulted in you know, PhD pieces for two of our students, uh, Emily and Bilal, who are now, who are now uh, uh, in, in various uh, uh, industries. And this is one thing I want to highlight is this, there are really great projects that students get involved in with, with machines. Uh, the other, uh, one of the other projects was uh, working with some special uh, neutron detectors called CLIC. Um, um, so this was something led by Partha Chowdhury, my, my colleague. Uh, uh, so these are uh, kind of novel uh, uh, inorganic uh, scintillators. Uh, and what's really interesting about them is, so here we have a crystal coupled to a photomultiplier tube. And this crystal has a, um, has a response that depends on whether it's a gamma ray or a neutron. 
And so this figure on the left is showing the different pulse shapes depending on whether you have a gamma ray interaction or a neutron interaction. So if you use pulse shape discrimination, you can actually identify the particle, uh, in this case, create a particle identification plot of we have pulse, uh, pulse shape discrimination parameter versus uh, pulse height or energy. And this line are the neutrons, and these are the gamma rays. Um, and these crystals have a gamma ray resolution that's something like uh, sodium iodide. Um, uh, and um, yeah, and in this case, we can, we can count neutrons. And originally, this was designed, or the idea was to use this as a replacement for helium-3 counters um, uh, and relying on the, the lithium-6 in, in the crystal. Right, and, and this reaction, this N alpha reaction on the 3 6. What was really interesting though, and what was found is that there's actually a, a fast neutron response uh, on the chlorine, this, this uh, chlorine 35 NP reaction uh, that actually gives us a spectroscopic response, response to fast neutrons. So, in other words, we, we can measure the energy of the neutrons without needing time, without time of flight in this case at kind of the 10% resolution uh, uh, level. Uh, so we built an array of 16 elements that were actually uh, enriched in lithium-7 or depleted in lithium-6 so that we could get rid of the thermal component and just uh, look at the fast component. And so the one way which we've uh, used the, the accelerator, and uh, which is involved in a variety of publications here, is if we take this, put it in front of our neutron source and actually, and actually dial uh, up the neutron energy. So in this case, on the right, you see this PSD plot where we have a 1 MeV uh, neutron one and a half MeV neutron to two MeV neutron, and you can see the neutron uh, peak uh, shift uh, as a function of, of, of the energy. So this is a really uh, unique detector, and we're continuing to explore this using now uh, four uh, 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 long three-inch crystals, uh, square crystals, uh, one inch by one inch by three inch, um, that we'll be working with uh, here in the future. Um, again, coming back to maybe some industry connections, in Massachusetts, we have all sorts of companies that are um, uh, they're growing crystals, they're uh, developing optical coatings, things can go into space, they go into telescopes, they go into all sorts of uh, uh, different types of, of, of programs. Uh, and one company we work with a lot is radiation monitoring devices. They actually grew the glick crystals that, that, uh, that I just showed you. Uh, and we actually have a former student who's part of our being with close connections with, with this company. Uh, but they actually come to us occasionally because they want to test some of the, some of the things that they're, they're developing. And so this is one example. It's, it's maybe a little dim here, uh, but they were developing a, a fast neutron uh, kind of imaging camera. Uh, they brought it to the lab. We produced the neutrons, and they were trying to see, figure out, you know, how what kind of resolution do they have with with these uh, uh, with these uh, types of uh, uh, crystals. So this is a 250 nanometer um, uh, opening, and if you can see, it's a little dim, but you can see that we can actually resolve it uh, here, which may be a little clearer. Uh, is we put a piece of uh, brass, I think, with a hole in it in front of this uh, crystal. You can actually see the crystal is illuminated, and you can see the image of the of the brass uh, 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 cylinder uh, behind. Right? So this is a uh, one way in which we connect to the to, to industry. Um, we've also been uh, starting to go into some of the uh, ion beam analysis techniques, although uh, not in any serious way, not at the level that you guys are working on. So I'm, I'm very curious about that. So we, we have a general purpose scattering chamber that um, we use to, again, uh, irradiate samples for industry and vacuum, but we've also been using it to uh, uh, produce implanted targets uh, that have been implanted with deuterium. So uh, my other colleague, Professor uh, Peter Bender, has been kind of uh, focused on this, uh, and he wants to use these targets to uh, measure lifetimes of excited states, take them to places like Triumph, uh, and do experiments. But uh, beyond that, we also want to be able to characterize these, these uh, targets. And so one technique, which I'm sure we'll hear more about later, uh, is this elastic repo detection analysis that allows you to, to measure uh, the, the light particles uh, that are in the, in the target and determine the, the depth of implantation, which is really important for some of these lifetime experiments uh, that, uh, that we want to do. And of course, the students get involved in all of these things and really get their hands on, uh, on, on this. Uh, another uh, kind of applied um, uh, program we've been kind of starting is to look at uh, these PFAFs. Uh, these, uh, so these are uh, fluorinated uh, uh, compounds that people are really worried about getting into the environment that are in the environment, especially around uh, firefighting types of places on army bases. Uh, they're getting into water, and there's a concern that they, they are a significant kind of endocrine system disruptor. So our, our colleague, Graham Peasley at Notre Dame, has been doing a lot of this. I think Maxine will tell us more about this later. 
Um, so we've been uh, developing an external beam to do this type of work as well as, as other work. So uh, here, this is just an initial test uh, to, to look uh, and bombard some, some Teflon uh, and look at to see that we can identify fluorine uh, through this piggy technique where we where we uh, uh, basically bombard the target of the sample with protons. We excite the fluorine nucleus uh, and, and then it de-excites de by this 197 and 109 uh, KeV gamma ray, which we can, we can easily see and quantify. Uh, I'll also mention, you know, again, this is another great training ex ex uh, uh, experience. So this is one of our graduate students, uh, Yi Zhu, who just uh, completed her PhD work uh, uh, this past semester. And this is uh, one of my former undergrads, Andrew Douglas, who's now a graduate student at Michigan State. And, and so they get their hands on these things and that they can you know, use that in their uh, going on with their, into their graduate uh, work. Uh, we've been upgrading the system. We have a new detector or at least a uh, dedicated detector to now uh, dedicate to this work. And uh, Peter has been uh, now working with some people in chemistry to develop uh, uh, samples that we can really quantify uh, the fluorine content. And maybe one of the last things I'll mention here is something I've been working uh, with, uh, which is really some interdisciplinary research with our biomedical engineering uh, department. So this is uh, Neil uh, uh, Lojek. So he's a graduate student in that department. And uh, these, uh, this group is uh, trying to develop an interesting 3D uh, tissue model uh, in which they grow living uh, cells, in particular neurons, uh, to, to, and they want to be able to study the properties of this, 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 this model. And, and it, in some ways, it replicates brain tissue. Uh, and this is important if we want to understand, if we send you know, people to Mars, what's going to happen when your brain is exposed to high energy ions, or, or if you're getting some kind of high, uh, high heavy ion treatment, uh, in your brain, how is that affecting the, the, the nerves, the, the cells? And so what we've been doing here, even though we have low energy, um, they've been growing these cells, we keep them alive, and we basically expose them to a well-defined dose of, of protons. Now, we're, we're limited in energy, so we only uh, go about 200 microns into the surface of this, these samples, but that's enough to um, induce some kind of damage and to see if they can actually measure uh, uh, the induced uh, kind of uh, radiation exposure. And so they, they grow these things, they actually press them into uh, this 3D uh, tissue model that, that, they, that they've developed. Uh, they expose them and then they have a variety of readouts to the, that they're interested in. Uh, not only uh, things related to some DNA change or cellular change, but they also measure uh, the electrical properties of these, these cells. So this is something really new and we've been upgrading this so that we can uh, Actually, uh, now we have the beam coming out into air, scattering on the gold target. We monitor the beam with a silicon detector, and uh, we expose the sample below. It's pollinated. Uh, uh, and this, this work um, is, so this is actually work from, that they've done with the reactor, um, but we're, we're moving towards a publication with, with the proton work as well. Uh, we also have a, a ion microprobe. Uh, I won't say much more about that other than it allows us to kind of image things on the micron uh, scale. Okay, so um, let me just skip through to this. Uh, one other thing I'll mention is a little bit of an aside is, you know, part of this whole infrastructure is training students. Uh, we have a lot of students in medical physics, nuclear engineering, uh, physics. Uh, and so we also have a nuclear instrumentation course that I've been building up uh, where our students learn about all the electronics. They learn about signal processing. They use oscilloscopes. Mm -hmm. They use uh, detectors and digital data acquisition systems to, to do measurements in, in uh, in, in, nuclear, in, uh, in nuclear physics. Um, so, yes, and they get their hands on, they have all these nice little small vacuum chambers. They not only do gamma ray spectroscopy, but they also do charged particle spectroscopy. What about simple vacuum systems and, and so on? Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll kind of end here and just uh, briefly summarize. Uh, and this is our, by the way, this is our latest upgrade. Uh, so, this is a, a mural that was painted on the containment building. Uh, there are all sorts of beautiful murals in Mexico City, so I thought I'd show the one that we have. Uh, and it was actually made, uh, painted by a famous artist, uh, Piquismo, I think he's from uh, Puerto Rico. Um, and so people come and take pictures of this. Uh, and just, yeah, just to summarize, I think these facilities are really important, especially in, in our institutions for training students. And there's a lot of great science that can be done, both applied work, but also basic science, which I'm interested to, to learn more about uh, and, and would like to pursue more at, at our laboratory. Right, with that, uh, thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much. Any questions? Questions?
Yes. Uh, well, thank you. Well, uh, I, I don't. I might be wrong, but uh, there was a uh, left track accelerator that worked with the rubber that rubber belt, mm -hmm. and they had to change to Peloton because it was difficult to find the, the seller for this rubber belt. Uh, yes, so so I love the Peloton chain, Peloton <laughs> uh, system, but the belt works fine for what we use. The only thing is we have a lot of we have a good amount of current, so even if the beam is kind of moving around. Uh, the beam that makes it through that's stabilized, the current is still sufficient for us to do most everything. In fact, we we all we need to dial it back a lot. Uh, but um, we also have two belts that are spare, one that's never been opened, it's all sealed in a plastic bag, and we have a second that I think is brand new that's in a drum, but is not in a plastic bag. So at some point we're gonna have to replace the belt, maybe, maybe soon, but you know, it is a worry. So this is a problem with these machines is uh, at some point, you know, there's only so many things in the basement in the closet from 50 years ago that you can dig out. <laughs> yes. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a specific question. Uh, how is the control signal same for the high voltage sources? Uh, you mean the stabilized machine? Uh, I, I think that you have a control for the camera. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, no, this is actually a good, let me see if I can go back fast enough. Um, yeah, I'm actually interested to hear about your laser pulsing system, uh, because um, just recently over the summer, actually in the fall, we just closed up, and one thing we installed uh, that I wanted to test out, so if you look closely here, there's a little orange cable, so I've, we've actually run a fiber optic uh, down, the, the, down the column and out, um, and this is this, basically I put this in to allow us to pick off the um, oscillator signal that's driving the, the chopping circuit so that we can trigger our compression system at the bottom. Uh, and eventually I'd like to control things using the, using the fiber optics. So the, the fiber seems to be working just fine, but I blew up the circuit, uh, so we have to fix that. Um, but the, the rest of the machine is, is they're actually little strings. So it's the original, there's a little cell motor at the bottom, you pull on a string, and that pulls on a little a variac uh, a resistor thing up here, and that's controlling all the high voltage moving switches and, and doing everything. So it's very analog. So. <laughs> Thank you. So I have two brief questions. The first one is what's the creature that was playing the data? <laughs> okay. All right, I'll go to that one. So actually, that's an interesting story because we asked the artist, you know, so how did you choose the craft? Because he, he does all these famous chrome paintings. You should look at all the, the, the murals. They're, they're really amazing. Um, he's done these, uh, uh, this like a uh, uh, bulldog and, and all sorts of things They're all over the world. And uh, he said, um, yeah, I think he just, he was somewhere found a little trinket or something that he liked, picked it up. And he said, yeah, this is great. And then he didn't know, he was painting this thing. They didn't know what was inside the building. And so when I was talking to him, like, you should all come for a tour because it's, you know, it's a, it's a group of them. So we brought them in and they found out, oh, it's a reactor, this is the containment building. And so it's actually a nice story because it's, you know, like the like the crab here, it has the shell that's protecting it. And it's on it's on this building, the containment building that's protecting the reactor, protecting everyone else, maybe. <laughs> so so the second question, and I think goes also to Ephraim, is is there any chance to polarize the protons? Can you do elastic scattering to polarize protons? Mm -hmm. yes. I, mean, I, <laughs> I can breathe. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, so I've never worked with any kind of polarizing system. Um, but I mean, you could. I don't know how well it works with these these energies. I mean, it's uh, nothing I've experienced with. But it, you know, you need a system to, to do it, and I I, yeah, I don't know how this. How, how many? Yeah. I mean, essentially, you were mentioning elastic scattering, right? So if you do elastic scattering from a zero plus nucleus, you have the cross section, but the cross section is very sensitive to small effects. So if you want to calculate, for example, the analyzing power, you need the polarization. So I don't know if it's. We we've never measured the polarization of beams. But uh, there must be some kind of polarization for okay. because uh, there's uh, there's a magnetic field, yeah. so you 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 the beam goes to magnetic field, so there's some yeah. polarization. Okay, but okay, well maybe you can have an analyzer and see what yeah. kind of yeah, and you, 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 you look into it. Uh, 
course, um, those the way that people polarize nutrients have shed a different way. Yes, that's uh, I mean, we would never try it. Okay, that, that's that's interesting. Okay, well, thank you very much, Andrew. So let's move on. Our next speaker is uh, Roberto Lideres from the University of New Zealand. Yes. Oh, you say that? Sorry. <laughs> Brazil. Hola, thank you very much, Daniel. For those who were in the Cocoyoc, I present a different work. So I decided to just switch the gears and present some other work that I'm doing with some colleagues on the run which apply. So I think that this, this will be the first talk I will not mention about the accelerator. I will just focus on the React. I'm sorry for, for that. So just to uh, okay, just to give an outline of this uh, presentation, uh, well, uh, I was expecting to have students, so I prepared some presentation with some uh, uh, motivation for these uh, studies here, and uh, I will uh, of course discuss about the exotic structure in uh, light and fly, and I will focus a little bit on uh, these three guys here, lithium six, uh, lithium eleven, to ex example of a uh, problem uh, halo and fly. Uh, also. Uh, Point uh, uh, together with the bottom eight, uh, uh, a well known proton halo slide. And uh, from this point on, I will go back and forth with this uh, reaction cross section and discuss some uh, points on these reaction cross sections. And uh, at the end, just looking back uh, and present some two uh, measurements that we have been done in Texas. Uh, measuring the elastic uh, cross section for carbon 10, and from that we get the reaction cross section and then uh, nitrogen 12 here. So, and give some per per perspective. So, so very uh, basic here is uh, this is just a small uh, part of this nuclear chart focusing on the light uh, 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 nuclei. And the black dots, uh, black square here are the stable nuclei. We have the rich. Uh, uh, regional, uh, neutral region apply, proton region apply. Some of them are one neutron uh, halo apply, other are two neutron halo apply. So, so uh, I will not go through much details here, just to mention this point here that uh, will be important for the thing that I will discuss later here. So, uh, in this uh, nuclear chart here, we have what we call the weakly bound apply, which means that the, the, the binding energy between the core and the, the valence particle is very small compared to this six, eight NAV that you may heard in nuclear physics course. So look here, we have a uh, helium, lithium six, lithium seven. They are these are examples of a stable nuclei, but 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 the, uh, uh, the separation energy is roughly two point five uh, NAV. This is it is small. Well, and now we compare with this uh, unstable nuclei in which all this separation energy is. is Below one in so uh, this uh, separation energy is very low. Uh, uh, generates some new structures. This a lot of structures in these nuclei that I will discuss in a few moments. So just for an example here, I just pick these two examples because one is uh, the work of Lisa Costa, the other one is uh, Mario Cubero. Uh, these are two examples of. Uh, uh, two, uh, two neutron halo nuclei. Look at the separation energy for if you want to remove these two neutrons from these uh, two nuclei, all of them uh, very small uh, energy separations. But, uh, and this somehow defines what, what is the halo nuclei, which is basically uh, a system made of uh, neutron and proton, and somehow you have uh, a group of neutron and proton that's grouped together to form a, a nuclear core and you have a uh, one or two particles that moves around these uh, this core pretty much like the atomic system but in, in nuclear system here so well my, i would like here to uh, in this talk here to discuss how we can access this uh, uh, information about this structure here for the atomic nuclei what we have to do and what we have to measure in order to be able to uh, really uh, identify this structure here, right? 
So, and the basic idea is like this one, which is uh, you have a hammer, you have a, you want to know what is, how is the gears inside the wall. And basically you just smash the, the wall with the hammer and you see all the fragments here. Of course, after that, you will not have, have the, the wall anymore, but if you know your tools, which would be the reaction. If you measure the outcome, that would be the, the, the job of the experimentalist. You will be able to see what is the structure. And uh, uh, these three pieces here is work together uh, in the sense that the, if you know very well the reaction and the structure, you can predict the, the outcome. But if you know the outcome and the structure, you can have some insight about the reaction. So this is a uh, uh, three interconnected gears. <clears throat> so let me uh, tell you about. Uh, signatures of these halo structure and there is a very uh, nice paper review paper from Danny Hata just uh, is a 15 no 60 pages long this review page that I will summarize for you for in just two, two line here so <laughs> uh, very short to review of this paper here oh, so basically if uh, signatures of uh, uh, halo nuclide manifest itself in High interaction cross section. I will mention a little bit about that, but for those who know, this is more related to reaction cross sections. If you remove only the inelastic cross section, but uh, usually the inelastic cross section is very small, so you can say that the interaction cross section is basically reaction cross section. So, so this is the first point here. Uh, and the second is uh, uh, since we have a, a cluster configuration. They, and they are very uh, not very bound together. And since they, when they approach the target, they can break up. And if you measure these breakup fragments, and there are some correlation between the angles of these breakup fragments, if these correlations are well picked, so this is another signatures of a halo structure. So basically, if we want to uh, uh, if you want to say that some apply a uh, neutron halo or proton halo, you have to prove these two things. You have to measure these two things here and to show that they, they don't lie uh, as a bit this uh, characteristic here. Most of the, this presentation will focus on the, this point here, the reaction cross section, because the underlying here is that you need to compare. You have to compare with something, and uh, uh, I will spend most of the time with this question here. So, and what, what is the toolbox? What is the hammer that we have at hand? So basically it's the, the reactions, and I'm just uh, listening here, uh, actually I'm just using the, the, exactly the slide that I presented in Coco York, so uh, adding that uh, up in each theory. Well, uh, basically the toolbox is the elastic scattering, elastic <laughs> infusion, nuclear transfer breakup. Of, of course, there are many other reactions that can take place, but the point now here is that uh, the angular distribution of this elastic scattering somehow encodes uh, the effects of the other reaction channels. I mean, uh, uh, they are coupled, and the, and the effect of these channels here are somehow encoded in this angular distribution. So the main point here is to measure the elastic uh, uh, cross sections. The angular distribution of this elastic cross section. From this uh, angular distribution of the elastic cross section, you can get the reaction cross section, and then you start to compare the uh, yeah. cross section with the other systems to, to really know if this reaction cross section is higher or not. Okay, just uh, elastic scattering in a nutshell for these two weeks here. Uh, well, uh, this. Uh, all of these plots here is the elastic scattering for uh, alpha, which is very tight uh, system on uh, nickel. Is there? Yes, on nickel. These are very low energy, and the reaction cross section here is basically a Rutherford cross section. So, if you remind from the uh, lectures in mechanics, I would say yes, mechanics. Already, you see uh, Rutherford cross section in mechanics. Well. So uh, this is the typical uh, cross section, elastic cross section, the root of our cross section, and if you divide this uh, curve here by itself, you get a straight line. So most of the plot that I will present here is this plot here, the reaction, uh, 
the cross section measured divided by the root of the cross section. Why we do that? Because when you go up in energy, you start to see deviation from the uh, elastic cross sections toward uh, against the root of the cross section. So it, this deviation becomes bigger when you divide the, the, the elastic, the experimental, with the root of cross section here. And uh, if you have uh, a tightly bound system, like just like alpha and nickel, you will get these nice and well known uh, personnel structure here. Uh, Peak here, some of them also called the Coulomb Rainbow Peak or Fresno Peak. And uh, so this is also, uh, I give this in two hours in lectures, so in two minutes here. So uh, just uh, let's dive into some examples. Here is the Newton Hilo uh, Nuclei, uh, one paper of uh, Luisa Costa almost 30 years ago. I don't mention to, we are getting a little bit old, but. <laughs> and uh, uh, well, uh, the green and uh, this violet, yes, the, the violet curve here would give you what would uh, be the, the elastic cross section if uh, alien six was. Uh, a tight and bound system. If you can uh, uh, describe in the six, just like a, a, a drop, a droplet. And here is the experiment. So the, we have these deviations again uh, of the experimental data compared to what you would pre predict for a tightly bound system. And this deviation here is signatures, or is what we can, uh, how we can extract the reaction cross section, right? So my message here is that. And uh, using the words of uh, 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 a drastic change in the elastic differential cross sections is a consequence of, well, uh, let's put it, it's a consequence of halo structure, maybe. Uh, not, not for the case of Eden 6 or lifting 11, but just for the case for what I will present in the next. Uh, so, and uh, here is more critical here. It is, Points here are the elastic scattering for Litton 11, oh, sorry, Litton 9. And these are the elastic scattering for Litton 11. So a very big difference here. So in this uh, clearly uh, gives uh, one of the signatures of halo structure in Litton 6. Also, here is a, a, another signature of the halo structure of Litton uh, 6. Uh, and also, I would like to. Uh, mentioned here that this dot uh, curve here is the calculation of uh, what we call four body TTCT calculations. Uh, I can explain a little bit later, but basically you described your prototype as a four and two balanced particles. So you already have three body here and the fourth is the target. So, and uh, I would like to take also this opportunity because uh, although it, here, we are not able to measure using the radioactive nuclei, but in these uh, calculations, you must have a, a very accurate optimization <clears throat> between neutron and the target, between the neutron and the core, between the, the two neutrons. Well, it's very difficult to measure this. <laughs> and uh, between alpha and the, and the target. So this is a, a, a very important information for the calculations to have all these uh, off couple potential for the fragments. And this is something that can be measured in just a uh, uh, accelerator like yours. So, and uh, this uh, is the same CDCC calculation in which you assume that the beating uh, 11 has a resonance. And I would just like to mention these very, very big differences in the CTCC calculation. Now, a resonance, at that time, they predicted a resonance, and later on, was measured this resonance roughly at 0.7 MAP. <laughs> so let's move a little bit to, toward the proton halo, because this uh, will be uh, the main focus so far. Uh, here, I present the bottom eight, just to give an example. This is for students. Uh, this is the last scattering of uh, bottom eight on left to over eight but measure at very high energy. So this explains why we, uh, let me compare with this curve. So, uh, and this is the, the same uh, reactions with the same elastic scattering, but at 50, uh, 50 MAB. So this, this explains why we start, uh, measure elastic scattering at uh, energies close to the barrier, because it affects 
of the other channels are more uh, are more shiny, would say, it's more clear when you are uh, performing measurements around the flow barrier instead of going at very high end. So at very high end, it's basically what uh, I have mentioned the 10 minutes ago, perhaps. This is a very steep compression optic because at this energy, basically carbon debt is just a droplet, a lead to OH, just a droplet. But if you go at 50 mm, the, the barrier is around uh, 52 uh, uh, right? And you see this clear deviation here uh, of this renewable thing. So we must measure if you want to study the structure, uh, energy is around the cold barrier is the, that's the goal here. And, and also to let me just uh, give a brief comment here. Uh, it's not so intuitive to think that uh, we might have proton halo structure because naively we can think that since the proton is a charged particle and you have a core that is charged, so the repulsion between these two particles will prevent any formation of proton halo, right? Because they are charged. But, but it's, uh, it's not so, so the case here. So uh, this is just one piece of information, just like I mentioned, that you, from that you, we have the deviation, then this means that the reaction cross-section might be very large. But the second piece of information then was uh, published last year in our nature, was the uh, correlation between the fragments. So the correlation between the protons and the uh, beryllium seven fragments. And these correlations uh, combined with the previous measurements of the reaction cross cross session gives a clear signature that the bottom ink is uh, a proton tail on the client. So, okay. Uh, how much time do I have? Uh, do I have? 10 minutes, including the questions. Okay. Let, uh, <laughs> so, uh, now is the point that I will, uh, I don't want to be like here. Or not. Now at the point that I will be back and forth between uh, presenting some reaction cross session with you and then coming back and then discuss back and forth. Uh, uh, and the main point is this. Uh, consider uh, these uh, measurements here, uh, bottom 8 and lead to uh, 208. This is the energy in the center of the mass. Uh, the previous one was the energy on the left. And this is the reaction cross section. The reaction cross section that you can get from the angular distribution of the last reaction. So, and I invite you to compare these two numbers here with this another uh, elastic schedule, through line 17 on lead 208. This is the energy and this is the reaction cross section. So for sure it's very difficult to, to perform this comparison because if they are measured in a different system, they are measured at a different energy. So what we need here is a method that, well, I would say now minimize a method that minimizes the effect due to geometry because fluorine 17 might be larger <laughs> than the bottom edge. So if you have a, a, a larger projectile, of course, you will, would expect a, a higher cross session. And uh, also the dynamic that relates to the energy because if you are very close to the Coulomb barrier, so you might have more or less reaction cross session. Well, uh, in the literature, there are at least three methods. <laughs> All of them are uh, from Paulo Gomez. Paulo Gomez was uh, a famous physicist at my university. He passed away already seven years, I would say. Yeah, already seven years. And Roloff was in the same conference when he passed away. And uh, one of these methods is based on the Wong's approximation that I will uh, discuss very briefly here. So, uh, well, uh, this is just the, a, a very zoom on the Coulomb barrier. Don't consider the cause here, just pick one, let's pick the rest of here. So, uh, the Wong approximation is basically like that. Uh, you have a, a barrier. That streets are uh, inverted parallel on this uh, barrier, and then you will get the fusion cross section from the long approximation. And <laughs> uh, based on this approximation, we can uh, establish, and this is discussing this nice paper of Philippe Canto, uh, a reduction method in, in which instead of looking at the energy as in the center of the mass, we perform some uh, uh, conversions. And we establish this uh, uh, reduced energy. 
And instead of measuring uh, or comparing the action in cross section, we compare reducing the action cross section, which is all of these two quantities is related to the height of the barrier, the radius of the barrier, and also the curvature of the barrier. Of course, at this moment, you would say that, well, Robert, this uh, parabola is not very good, and I will discuss a little bit in a few minutes. So uh, here uh, I'm just showing in red uh, what will be uh, the reaction cross sessions. Uh, and I didn't measure all of this, I just read from the literature. And then put it on this. Uh, this will be the first time we will look at these uh, reaction cross sessions. Uh, this uh, dashed curve here is the universal fusion function of this would be the uh, take this as a minimum for the reaction cross session all over this energy range here so because you of course reaction cross session means that you have fusion and many other processes here so this would be the minimum <coughs> red the stable nuclei you you see that they well they are more or less grouped together and uh, a little bit uh, above the, the fusion meaning that uh, you all, you have a fusion, but you have other channels, okay? But seems fine. Uh, these are the well weakly bound uh, and uh, neutron able uh, examples here. And I just left this one here. Uh, actually, well, I will change the colors later. But uh, I just left this one here, which is the bottom eight. Uh, and you see here that the, the reaction cross section for the bottom eight is large compared to the one you see among the other systems. Well, is this uh, okay? Is this uh, a signature of the bottom eight it has a proper halo? I just mentioned that there are, there are also measurements of the fragments, and uh, these two combined gives uh, us the uh, indication that, that the certain that the bottom eight is a proton label applied. So now uh, I will try. To very fast here. Uh, measurements for carbon 10. Uh, well, carbon 10 uh, is a proton rich, but it's not weakly bound. You see that uh, to remove a proton from carbon 10, you have to pay uh, for MAV, which is larger than the other weakly bound that I showed in the in, in this presentation here. But uh, if you, we compare the envelope distribution of carbon 10 with the envelope distribution for carbon 12, which is the stable isotope. You clearly see the difference, and this, this difference here is related to, re, to, to the reaction process. So, yes, uh, I'm trying to be very fast. And uh, also, uh, this was uh, a measurement that we performed two years ago in Mexico, and last year, this December, yes, December, we submitted for publication, which is the last scattering on uh, nitrogen 12. What well, actually the proposal was to perform on less 208, but the, the target broke, so we have to change to uh, code 197. Okay, but uh, these uh, are the, the spectra. The good thing here is that we also have the region set as a contaminant that we were not, that we used just to check that the, uh, the uncertainty was uh, okay and to make sure of the uh, systematic errors here. So uh, these are the envelope distribution here. Uh, uh, well, again, we see some uh, large deviation. The error bar are not very uh, small. They are quite large because the mean intensity was almost uh, 800 particles per second. So, so very tough measurements here. And it, when, when we put together the data for carbon 10, carbon 10 is here. Yeah, is this one here. And remind yourself that carbon 10 is very, uh, although it's proton rich, but it's very time bound. So, and actually, it looked like they behaved like uh, the other system that I presented here. But nitrogen 12 has a huge reaction cross section, huge re reaction cross section. It is a signature that nitrogen is another candidate for uh, a proton halo in the flag. I'm not sure. And uh, this I would like to discuss with you. Uh, also, now I add here now this was a measurement. I, I don't remember who measured this, but I think two years ago. And uh, well, this, here it's difficult to say that the reaction cross section for now 70 is very large here. So let's look uh, 
Uh, I will try to summarize very quickly here. So these are uh, only looking at the problem reach. Uh, these, uh, well, the reaction cross section just like as measured. And these are the reduced cross section. And in this the table here, I would like to, thank you very much. I would like to make some, uh, try to extract some relationship between the reaction cross section and the separation energy. So namely, I would think that for those stars that has a, a very small a separation energy, so it would be very easy to break it. And therefore, the reaction cross section would be very large. So I would expect that this would exhibit a very large reaction cross section, but instead, uh, it is one that the uh, nitrogen job that exhibits you. So at this moment, I would just like to say that it's very difficult to from uh, comparing the compare by comparison of these reaction cross sections to to say which one is higher or or smaller. Now uh, I put as a reference here what would be the minimum for this reaction cross section. I mean, what would be the reaction cross section if we only account for fusion. And I'm taking the, the, the ratio between this number here and this number here. So basically, uh, in this uh, ratio here, I mentioned how far is the point uh, relative to the fusion cross section. So, and now, well, more or less, I, I understand that, well, this uh, bottom eight has a ratio that is uh, high because the separation energy is small. And uh, this one has a ratio that is very small because the separation energy is very high, so it's very difficult to break this, this guy here. Of course, it, in the middle here, we have a uh, fluorine 17, and, and that, that's a very good case here because separation energy is exactly the same of the nitrogen 12. But, well, this is my data, <laughs> this is the other data, so I'm obliged to say that. Uh, this measurement here, it was a very low energy and the bar was very high. So I think that would be worth to measure again this, uh, at least at different energy. So just uh, one more minute, I think. <laughs> when I, I'm trying to compare these reaction process, there are some limitations. The first one is that uh, this parabola is not a, a very good approximation, especially for light system. If you go for heavy system, you can approximate it. It's, quite good. Uh, the problem here is that you are uh, replacing this barrier here by, by a parabola that is smaller, which means that it is more transparent to fusion. So you're increasing fusion. And the second is, is which would be the best uh, barrier for a cluster system. So the blue one is, is if you consider this is some hollow potential because I'm from the top, but if, if you consider that the two particles, uh, the, the projectile and the target, they are just a droplet. And uh, if you perform a double folding of potential, you will get this. But instead, if you replace this picture by a cluster uh, configuration in which you don't have, a, for instance, if you have a, a nitrogen 12, but instead I have a carbon 11, and proton, this will reduce a little bit the barrier, and this is represented by this uh, uh, red curve here. Again, uh, I'm not saying that this one is the correct, and I'm not, this one is not correct. And at the end, this will depend uh, how how is my uh, how confident I am with the potentials between the, the fragment and the target, and this is something that needs to be addressed. So. Uh, uh, okay, uh, it, uh, just, to see, just to show that if we consider this cluster configuration for the potential, this is the effect that we get uh, for this is bottom eight, comes end up here. This is uh, nitrogen 11 end up here. So uh, this is, a, I would say that it's an open question, at least for me. And just to summarize and recap, uh, well, uh, I mentioned here that uh, large uh, reaction cross session and angular correlations are signatures. If you want to study a structure, the Zotsky structure on this uh, nuclei, uh, well, uh, bottom eight so far is the well established proton nail nuclei, but perhaps nitrogen 12 as well, uh, but uh, just this to be seen. And uh, uh, just to leave that for 
perspective, uh, we are planning to perform again this experiment on nitrogen 12 to measure the fragment because this will be uh, uh, together with the reaction cross session uh, a clear signature of this halo structure in nitrogen 12. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Roberto. Uh, any questions? I see so two, two lines summary of the 16 page paper. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. Uh, you can the you, indicator of the yeah. You kind of forgot to mention also like the important ground state properties that define the field. Yeah. Yeah. Such well, as yeah. <laughs> ground state properties like uh, charge radii. Mm. So they are basically you display a very large charge radii and minor radii as mm -hmm. well, uh, they're. Tiny little uh, neutral separation, which is. Uh, yeah, I didn't mention about that, but yeah. would you like me to comment on that? No, no. Uh, okay, yeah. That was my comment. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I mean, I'm looking more on the reaction <coughs> rather than on that, those measurements of the radius and charge radius. Oh, so to add, that should be combined with the uh, matter radius, I mean, to, to measure matter yeah. radius, charge yeah, radius. Yeah, so it's basically it's, it's uh, the, the combination of all of those properties. If we fulfill all of these, then you can say it's a hill. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, after Kokoyaka, uh, now we have the, the definition calculation. They can tell what is the radius yeah. right now, right? No, no. Please. Thanks for a nice talk. I, I think I, I hope that what's more or less that we present it. Because I arrived a bit late. Uh, well, according with, uh, I think in the case of the bottom eight data, uh, I'm not sure what is happening in the case of Matsopo because later was measured by Alessia, as I showed yesterday. And the behavior is very similar to this. Uh, 170 mm. I mean, it's the well, the, in this case, I don't know which is the target in the first case in the red one. Left. Yeah. So, so you have a strong uh, coupling with the type of things. I mean, you have yeah, column, the column coupling is important for this. Uh... But this is different because you have the proton, and the proton is doing uh, some uh, contrary effect. So for good reason, it reminds like that. It was that, uh, well, it's, it's the Angel of one article in 2004. But then in this case of, of Marco data, it's very strange that at the end, he's, he's around the barrier because it's 50 MV. I don't know if it's below, maybe. Yeah, but I mentioned that the barrier was around 52. I'm not sure. Uh, 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 I yeah, have to look that before if you check the person, for sure, was very close. Do you check these results from 2022? Is the article this, of Alessia? This, this is the Masoko point. Uh, okay. Alessia has to be. Uh, and uh, uh, Alessia has performed a measurement with zinc. Well, yeah, it's uh, different. Almost. You have a million demands, uh, of course. Uh, uh, then, but even, even you have less potential, so less, well, less contribution from the polarization. So, in the case of Marco, the rainbow should exist. I don't know yeah, what happens in that case. Yeah, well, it, uh, when you say polarization, it's, uh, it's a little bit different from the neutron because uh, when uh, a neutron reaches a proton target, so yeah. this, you have a, a neutron particle. Yeah. This particle just proceeds its movement without hitting the brakes. And, yeah. and you have that and, and, uh, here you have some this sort of a dynamical because uh, since you have a, a proton that is very uh, light compared to the core, this kind of uh, moves backwards. So you at the end, the effective barrier is a little bit smaller because you have this uh, screening of the core that screens the, 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 the problem. Yeah, but we, we can continue this discussion uh, because you're behind. But thank you, thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Jorge Felix from uh, Florida State University. So. Thank you.
Vocês querem resumo? Não, depois que está ligado, vocês querem resumar? Sim. Four things going to talk about from nuclear rally to neutron stars. Thank you very much for me. Oh, thank you for the invitation. So, thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted to, to be here. Um, I don't know why you want a series to give a presentation for 70 years of the standard, but here I am and I'll do my, my very best. But of course, the most important is I want to congratulate my colleagues and, and I want to wish you many, many more productive years of this accelerator. Um, so let me let me tell you two about two slides that I presented over in Cocoyoc. Um, but first, of course, I have to tell you that even though it's not a, in my town, which is in Florida, it's not as cold as in Andrew, Boston. Uh, it was very hard to leave paradise. Uh, we had a wonderful dinner in Tepoztlan, and it was just just wonderful time. So let me just try to explain essentially the connection between uh, what you do in the laboratory trying to measure radii, and then what you do in neutron stars. So this quantity L essentially represents the pressure of a gas which is made exclusively out of neutrons at a saturation density. So the density that you typically see in the interior of a, of a nucleus like, like let go away. And what you have here is the difference of two radii. So you look at a nucleus like let go away, and let go away has 82 protons, and it has 126 neutrons. So that means that it has an excess of 44 neutrons. And the question is, where are those 44 neutrons going to go? And if the pressure, this quantity L, is very large, then you're going to push against those neutrons, and you're going to create what is called a very large neutron scheme. On the other hand, if the pressure is small, then the neutron scheme, the extent of the neutron relative to the core, it will be small. And you can see here that there is, for many, many different kinds of models, there is almost a perfect correlation to the quantity that you can measure in the laboratory, a little bit different between these two radii, and a quantity that is absolutely fundamental to the understanding of neutron stars. Now, it's this same L that I have here that also correlates very strongly, not with the neutron scheme, but the radius of an object which is 18 orders of magnitude larger, which is a neutron star. So you see that the correlation is very, very strong because it's the same quantity that's pushing, pushing uh, against surface tension in the nucleus and makes a very large neutral spin. Uh, it's exactly the same one that pushes against gravity and makes a very big neutron, neutron star radius. So this slope of the symmetry energy, or this quantity here, controls both the neutron spin of a heavy nucleus as well as the radius of the neutron star even though they differ by different orders of time. So my pitch here is that observationally, we might not be part of this community. We don't have telescopes here that we're looking at the stars, but from the microphysics, it's absolutely essential. The role that plays in nuclear physics in trying to understand the um, So this is the other one that I, that I wanted to, to that I showed in Tokoyok. Uh, we just finished what it's called a decadal survey for the nuclear physics community. And in that report, there is a slide, which is called heaven and earth, which is trying to understand the equation of state, namely the pressure versus energy density that we need to understand the physics of neutron stars. We call it like the cosmologists like to call it the cosmic ladder, we call it the equation of state ladder. For very high density, you need to look for big for astrophysical observation. But to try to determine the equation of state at lower densities, you have either theory or precisely this experiment that I have mentioned before. So you construct a ladder with the lowest wrong being completely determined by your person. So now let me tell you a little bit about radio. And we are going to start with charge radio. So we <laughs> look at nucleus, unlike what example our colleagues in condensed matter do, is that we have two flavors. 
we have protons and we have neutrons. Now, already back in the 1950s, we were scattering electrons from heavy nuclei or nuclei in general. And then you know that because electrons participate in the electromagnetic interaction, then you have a photon, the photon couples to charge. So it's basically invisible to the neutrons, but it couples very strongly to the protons. So basically this picture over here has given you a state extraordinarily accurate, actually accurate picture of the nuclear charge distribution. And we have gone from characterizing the distribution of charge of protons in nuclei from essentially helium, very light nuclei, all the, all the way to the two grains. Now, <clears throat> relative to what Roberto has told us, remember the, the idea of the hammer. So he comes with his hadronic hammer and essentially obliterates the nucleus and then tries to reconstruct what happens. Our hammer here is very, very light. So we just tap the nucleus and see how the nucleus responds. We don't want to obliterate the nuclear. And what this affords is that the reaction mechanism separates very, very cleanly from the nuclear structure. So this is one of the merits of the electroweak product mm -hmm. that you can separate the reaction from this structure. And it's, of course, as nuclear physicists, we're trying to understand the structure. Now, I have a few formulas here, so I want to apologize, but let me go uh, very quickly. And I want to thank, of course, uh, Roberto, because he already talked about the for cross-section. Uh, mod scattering is essentially just the relativistic corrections to this formula. And if you want to scatter from spherical nuclei, then essentially what you have is the cross-section in the approximation that the nucleus is a point particle. But of course, the nucleus is not a point particle. The nucleus has a size. And that information is encoded in what we call the charge form factor. So this is what you measure, right? So if you want to do the same thing that Roberto was, was trying to say, you take the cross-section that you measure, you divide by the mod cross-section, and then what you extract is a purely nuclear physics information. Now, the charge form factor, you might say, what is the charge form factor? But it's actually very interesting, very, very simple to understand. The charge form factor is just the Fourier term transform of the density, right? So the density is you go to the nuclear, you start probing the nuclear, and you say, I have the density is whatever number of nucleons per Fermi cube. And then you generate, for example, the charge distribution. Right? <clears throat> so this is the charge distribution. And you cannot see here, there is an experiment and there is a calculation. <clears throat> so we do a calculation to represent the experiment. You take the Fourier transform of this object, and then you get the form factor. The form factor is what you measure experimentally. And I told you that the beauty of these electroweak reactions that essentially just tap the nucleus is that if you divide by the mod cross section, <clears throat> you extract this for this part, you take it for your transform, and you have the distribution. <clears throat> so the one thing that I want to mention, and it's specifically for laboratories which have very low energy, is what the radius, the information about the radius of the nucleus is encoded in the form factor at very, very low momentum. So at zero momentum transfer, the value is just one because of the conserved currents. But the slope or the curvature at the origin gives you information about the radius. <clears throat> so of course, as theorists, we would like to see the entire distribution. But if you only want to know about the neutron radius, all you have to do is a, it's, a, it's, a, a, it's an experiment at very, very low momentum transfer. So if the energy is small, you can compensate by doing the experiment at very large amounts. <clears throat> now we all know about the Fermi function. So the Fermi function is something that we use to characterize the two, the two parameters of the Fermi function, something that we use to characterize the density. <clears throat> there is a very closely connected symmetric Fermi function, which has much better analytic properties. And the beauty of this is that you take this function and you can analytically Take its Fourier transform. The Fourier transform allows momentum transfer looks like this. 
So you can see that C is the essentially the mean radius of the nucleus, and A here is the diffuseness parameter that you have in the in the in the service function. And you can see that there is a very clean interpretation of the cross section. <clears throat> the oscillations are controlled by the mean size of the nucleus, and the exponential follow is controlled by the diffuseness parameter. Everything is analytic. You have two parameters from the Fermi distribution, and the information here, the radius, is analytic and given by the interesting expression. <clears throat> okay, so now we know since 1950 everything we wanted to know about the distribution of charge or the distribution of the protons. The question is, how do we know about where are the neutrons? Because I told you that the information that we require to constrain the properties of neutron star are equivalent to taking the difference between the neutron radius relative to the proton radius. We have determined very accurately the proton radius. How do we determine the neutron radius? So if you want to do a very, very um, clean experiment, you do what is called quality violating electron nuclear scattering. So to determine the charge distribution, remember that here it is. You have an electron, it's hard to see, but you emit, you emit a photon. And the photon couples to the charge. So the charge, we already know, and we probe it not by parity violating, but parity conserving elastic electron scatters. However, even though the electrons do not have strong interactions, they have both electromagnetic and weak interactions. Right? So the weak interactions are mediated by three bosons. In the case that it's relevant to this experiment, this is the neutral boson, the weak interaction, which is the Z0. So, and again, you have an electron. Some of the time you need a photon, some of the time you need a Z0. So, this is a interference between a purely electromagnetic Feynman diagram and a purely weak Feynman diagram. Now, why is this interesting? It's interesting because in the standard model, you know how strong the photon couples to the different particles. And they couple, of course, according to the electric charge. So if I have an upward, the electric charge is plus two thirds, the downward is minus a third. So then you say, how does it couple to the proton? You take two of these, one of these, you have a charge of one, couples very strongly. You take one of these, two of these, they have a neutron, the charge, the electric charge is zero, photons do not see the neutrons. So all these experiments that were done in the 50s were very good at determining the charge, but couldn't tell you anything. But look what happened with the coupling of the Z0. So the coupling is given in terms of some parameters of the standard model, including the weak mixing angle. Now the upward has a charge of approximately one third. The downward has a weak charge of minus two thirds. Now you take <coughs> two of these, one of these, you get essentially zero. You put one of these, two of these, and you get minus one. So now, in the same way that the photon essentially couples exclusively to the protons, the Z0 couples exclusively. So then you do the experiment, and the experiment, this is the, uh, the parity violating the asymmetry. You measure two, two cross sections. In one case, the electron is right handedly polarized, the other case is left handedly polarized. You take the difference divided by the sum, and it's equal to some fundamental <laughs> parameters of the standard model, the Fermi constant, the fine structure constant. Mm -hmm. And then again, you get these four factors. And remember, the four factors are nothing more. That the Fourier transform of the charge density of the density. So in this case, it's the Fourier transform of the distribution of protons, and in this case, the fourth factor is the, the Fourier transform of the distribution of the Now, what are connections to other fields? So you measure radii and you immediately make connections to the other field. So one of the one of the experiments that was also discussed at the Copoli of meeting actually was by Alfredo. Uh, he talked about coherent elastic neutrino nuclear scattering or seven, right? So you never would have dreamed that you can do an experiment and you have a neutrino in and neutrino out, the nucleus remains in the ground state. Now, you will never be able to detect the outgoing neutrino. So what are you going to do to be able to reconstruct fully the kinematics? So what you do is you actually have to detect the extraordinarily slowly moving 
report, right? So you 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 have information about the flux of the neutrinos. In this case, the experiment was done at, at the Spanish neutral source no bridge. You measure the recoil of the target, and then you reconstruct the kinematics. And then again, you can find what is the cross section for this process over here, mm -hmm. something that was predicted 14 years, 40 years before the experiment was, was today. Extraordinarily challenging, precisely, because you have to detect the very slow recoils. So imagine that you have a ping pong. The ping pong scatters from bowling ball, and you do not detect the ping pong. Instead, you detect your recoil in bowling ball. So good luck with that. <laughs> but, uh, but of course, I always say that my experimental colleagues are magicians, and it took a while, but they were able to do it. It's very, very nice because even though it's a weak process, it's coherent. So this is the weak charge of the nucleus, but you see it goes square. And because the weak charge is essentially contained by the neutrons, it scales almost like the number of, uh, of, of neutrons in the target square. It provides a fertile ground for testing the standard model because the weak charge has the weak form, the weak mixing angle. So it can probe it at very, very different kinematics that you are probe, for example, at the beginning. And again, the first correction from co full coherence, so the four factor goes by one, minus Q over Q squared over six, and then the square of the weak form factor, you can think this is the size of the neutral distribution, right? Uh, so that is as far as the, uh, uh, try to test the standard model. It's also very interesting for dark matter searches because you have all seen this plot over here. Dark matter searches are becoming more and more sensitive, but they go down, they starting to almost encroach in what is called the irreducibly neutrino pattern. So this neutrino background, which they call the floor, and now I believe they call it the neutrino fog, uh, it's precisely this process. It's precisely centers. And eventually, if you fall down in here and you cannot have the sensitivity, then you can no longer determine whether the event was called by a coherent process from neutrinos or really a dark process. So the connection between radii extends not only to neutral stars, but also to the Now, uh, has the measurement been done? And the answer is absolutely yes. And again, I think that these uh, colleagues of mine are magician because remember that I told you what you measure is a difference between left-handed relative to right-handed, right? So the parity violating of symmetry, the figure of merit is one out of a million. So that means that if you have two million, one million is gonna go this way, one million and one is gonna go this way, and you have to disentangle the difference. But they were able to do it, and then the result is that the, new, the, the neutral skin thickness of left to a weight, which is defined, as I told you, where are the location of the neutrons relative to the protons, uh, they come up with, a, like, with this, this value over here, which of course doesn't tell you anything, but basically you are in a region where you're getting very large values of this, this quantity L. And this quantity L, remember, is the pressure of pure neutral mass. So the fact that you get a large neutral skin is also telling you that you get a fairly large radii for neutral stars. Uh, this is completely consistent with the most recent measurements from the NICE collaboration that can measure uh, radii. And also a stiff equation of state, non namely an equation of state that pushes very strongly against gravity uh, is also consistent because you have to make very large neutral star masses with the limit now is about this other mass. Now, some of my colleagues, uh, theoretical colleagues complain, and you see these are the predictions for my theoretical colleagues, right? Which is far away from what the experiment uh, is, is telling us, uh, but they always say the error bar is too large. So they always say, ah, oh, it's the error bar. So our calculation is perfect. You experimentally don't know what you're doing. The error bar is too large. Okay, fine. So we have some colleagues in Germany. They're building this fantastic facility to measure to measure uh, very precisely the weak mixing angle, and then we hope that we'll be able to put 
a lead target and be able to reduce the uncertainty bias factor of two. And then we'll see our initial colleagues say, uh, or we will tell them, tell you so. Um, but again, uh, the, the thing that for me is absolutely essential is this realization that experiments that are made, being made at nuclear, nuclear labs are informing the equation of state of nuclear stars. So the macrophysics associated with nuclear stars is completely within the domain of nuclear physics. Finally, I, I want to tell you something that is recently also very, very interesting. Um, so let me remind you how do we compute the neutron scheme, right? So the neutron scheme of a heavy nucleus is you take the nucleus, which has the protons and the neutrons, you say what is the distribution, what is the radius of the neutron distribution relative to the proton distribution? That's the scheme. Now imagine a world in which we have perfect charge symmetry. So perfect charge symmetry means that I turn neutrons into protons, protons into neutrons, and the system remains unchanged. So if I do that, the neutron radius, which is the hard thing to measure, of a nucleus that has the protons and a neutron should be identical to the proton radius of a nucleus which now has n protons and zero. So now here, the beauty of this is that you're making an experiment that only involves charge, right? You've got rid of the neutrons in favor of supplementing it by the proton radius of the muon. So we call this charge radio of neuron nuclei. And here's the definition, right? Now, of course, we do not live in a perfect world where charge symmetry is perfect because there are cool of interactions. But the idea is very, very strong. There is a facility at Michigan State University called the Vitola facility. They have measured the radius of the mirrors, and there are two, for example, two experiments and collaborators with Sirish that have done these experiments in these in these systems over here and also these systems over here. Now, from a theoretical point, how well does it does it work? So we have done some of our calculations with different models, and we can see that the neutron density, for example, in titanium 50 is practically identical to the proton density in the mirror, which happens to be the <clears throat> so this is also a very, very promising uh, field in which you can get information about the neutron scheme within four neutron stars by now doing the charge radio of mirror nuclei. Uh, my favorite case uh, for mirror nuclei is not necessarily titanium 50, nickel 50, because I'm much more interested in double matching nuclei. So my favorite case would be calcium 48, nickel 48. <laughs> Uh, and of course, nickel 48 is very, very hard. It lives for a very, very uh, short time, but we were in Coco And I was talking to Roland, and he said, I have incredibly good students. Tell me what you want, they're going to make it happen. So I said, okay, my dream is calcium 48, which we know very accurately what is the proton distribution, do nickel 48. So we'll see if these students are magicians, which I believe few young guys are, so maybe we will have the mirror nuclei uh, in the eight to four years. So we'll see. Um, <clears throat> so let me just tell you a little bit uh, the conclusions. Uh, so the most important conclusion for me is that if you can do low momentum transfer elastic scattering experiments, you will be helping this community a lot. And again, if you have, if you can have backward ion, right? I know the energy is small, but the angle can be large so that you can reach small momentum transfers to be able to resolve this curvature. Then you will pro pro provide critical information both for nuclear structure and the equation of state of neutral stars. Uh, I didn't talk about this much, but of course, there has been a calcium experiment that does quality violating uh, elastic scattering. And then you want to, to essentially find the correlation with argon 40, which is one of the nuclei that they are using to measure coherent uh, electro coherent neutrino scattering. The same thing for lead, and then another of the very, very important nuclei for both dark matter researches and for neutrinos, 
So these correlations are something that we're trying to explore now. Uh, I told you about the, the mirror nuclei. may require experimental campaign to measure charge radia of unstable neutron deficient nuclear isotopes. I was promised that these very, these very smart students at MIT might be able to deliver. Um, and then the message, I guess, for this community is that the electroweak experiments, remember the tapping just the nucleus, with very neutron rich nuclei will no longer be feasible, right? Because if you have very neutron rich nuclei, it's very clear that the nucleus is exotic, it's probably going to be short lived. So you, you must rely on hadronic probes, maybe protons, maybe neutrons, something that hopefully one can reach this region for very exotic nuclei. In that respect, I just want to tell you that uh, you know about the newly commissioned every facility in Michigan State, the facility for rare isotopes. One of the main science drivers is the study of nuclei with neutron skins three to four times thicker that have been possible. So this cannot be done with electroweak probes. They have to be done with strongly interacting probes, protons, neutrons, hopefully. And of course, the same message that I've been giving all the time. A neutron star is 18 orders of magnitude larger, 55 orders of magnitude more massive than a nucleus of lead. Yet, it's the same pressure in both systems that in one case creates the neutron skin and in the other case creates the radius of the so, so, let me tell you uh, something about, of course, I can tell you much about my facility because I'm, I'm not an experimentalist, but I'll tell you something about it. Uh, the first thing that I tell you is uh, invite you all to make proposals. We have a very nice group of, of uh, colleagues of mine uh, come to, to FSU to do experiments. Uh, if you were in Cocoyo, this is the di diagram uh, that Elaine is actually shown in her presentation. Here is Elaine who was a student of Ephraim, and Ephraim was kind enough to ship her to my other colleague. Mexican colleague in Florida State, Sergio Almaraz Calderon, which I think is was a classmate of Luis. Oh. Yes. And, and he's here. Uh, so we have one, two experimentalists already. And then something that I'm always very yeah. proud Avila and Daniel Santiago, uh, who are two students from Monterrey. Uh, at one point, I was invited to Monterrey to give a presentation to a very talented group of physics students that were finishing. And I tried to convince them to come to Florida State. They came, both of them did wonderful experiments, and they are now both staff members at our national lab. So there is a very strong connection. Oh, by the way, here's our tandem. You see, it's also painted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the colors of the university are garnet and gold. So this is the garden, and I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Questions? And again, congratulations, of course, on the <laughs> wonderful achievement. Okay. If there are no questions, we can continue discussing with the speakers. Uh, it's time for, for a coffee break and also to for a visit to the accelerator. So I invite you to take some coffee. I think there is a coffee break, yeah. And, uh, and then follow the frame. So our next speaker is going to be Eduardo Andrade. And uh, you are wondering maybe why are we starting earlier? Uh, because uh, lunchtime. So it could be traffic, and then we are taking uh, precautions to, to arrive to the place. Okay, so uh, we are going to try to leave around uh, 1 30 to, to the place to, to where we are going to have lunch. Okay, so Eduardo Andrade, thank you very much. Uh, and welcome. Okay, the type of my talk is about the, the second life of the vertical accelerator, or this way. I will briefly describe the quick history 
for the installation of the CL on the graph connected by Royal University to the Instituto in 1984. The way it, it was acquired by the IFUNAM was the result of a chain of fortuitous events. And today, more than 40 years after this world remembered it. I will speak also briefly, briefly about the other accelerators stored in the UNAM. Uh, there is a list of all the accelerators uh, produced by high voltage in the corporation. And the Rice University was the second, the second one in 1953. This is the reason because we are celebrating now the 17th anniversary. Uh, at Rice University, there were two accelerators, one of them the ECM, and the other one was a tandem, six megavolts. Uh, the nuclear physics field working in Rice, uh, most of them were about <laughs> experiments, uh, the three body particles in the final state. Uh, Dr. Bill mm -hmm. was one of the, was the director of Sanibone Lab. He was my PhD thesis uh, advisor. And this, this, <laughs> and this, this was the, my thesis, uh, my thesis publication. Uh, Dr. Phyllis commissioned me. <laughs> High voltage, uh, a porcelain machine, uh, uh, and it was of the upgrading most important. But for installing this ion, ion source, it has a, a porcelain machine system for measuring the energy of the neutrons by time of flight. The energy resolution was about 20 kb. And we asked for this change. The pressure vessel needed to increase for 70 centimeters just to hold the high voltage terminal. Uh, that, that is all the accelerators that have been installed in the university in the, in the, in the, uh, the first one was <coughs> the two MV van de Graaf, and for some time the only uh, accelerator available was the teaching accelerator of about 7, 7, 700 kV. Mm -hmm. And this is the MS, and this is the Peloton, and this is the CM. Um, the UNAM campus, they call Ciudad Universitaria, were inaugurated this same day in, in the accelerator by the Mexican president, Adolfo Ruiz Cortines. Uh, I don't know if uh, you have a chance to visit the main campus. Uh, is the time. Uh, about the first accelerator installed was the two megavolts on the graph. And the importance of this accelerator uh, we suppose they start the nuclear physics research in Mexico. Uh, some of the leaders of the first accelerator installed in the map was the rector, Nabor Carrillo, and all these people like Carlos de Fernandez, Fernando Alba, were the pioneers in this activity. Um, now, the history about how the uh, donation of this accelerator uh, is, well, is related up in some way by the super collider. Uh, maybe some people didn't know about this project. Uh, this super collider was supposed to, to be uh, 20 TV proton energy in the peripheral lane about 87 kilometers. And it was to be in, in Texas, North Texas. Uh, the project was $11 billion, equivalent to $30 billion now. Uh, the project started 
and they spent already about five billion dollars in the Turner. They built about eight kilometers. Um, I invited Philips, one of the leaders of the project, in May 84 to give a conference about the super collider. Uh, the, the US Congress didn't approve the super collider budget, and the project was closed in 1993. Um, about the proposal, uh, Dr. Miguel Jose Yacamán, director of the FUNAM, was informed by Philips that the nuclear physics program arise had been terminated in 1976. The six megavolt tandem had been donated to Voskovich Institute, Russia, in, and the 5.5 was offered in donation to the FUNAM, but the acceptance had to be immediately. The Victoria Kamara accepted the donation offer personal <coughs> the UNAM rector of uh, There is an interest in this but this one extra day delay in acceptance would be canceled the donation. Uh, the donation offer occurred in, 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 in May. It, it, it was until September when the director, Carlos Serrano, gave an audience to the Yakaman who led a, a group of the FUNA that requested the donation. Uh, the director uh, accepted the donation and to build the main investment was on the construction of the business. Uh, you see, they supposed to be in a hurry. The acceptance, it was made and it was until September when all the people, when the director gave the audience about the project. Uh, Felix commented immediately as the uh, director approved it, verbally, he didn't sign any document. Uh, we call, they called Felix, informed by telephone that the donation was accepted. And Felix commented, I didn't hear for, for months from you. I hired, I hired a company to remove the accelerator from the building starting the day after received your phone call. Only one day. <laughs> now, uh, due to the if not lacking of budget to pay the specialized labor to disassemble the accelerator, a small group of IFUNA volunteers traveled to Houston in October 84. The task was completed in, in three weeks. Now, in this picture, excuse me, you can see you. This is me, <laughs> and this is the frame. But you haven't changed. <laughs> I think that. He just finished his PhD degree uh, and he went to, to do all this assembly for the accelerator. And, 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 and something, um, for, for example, uh, the wood boxes were fabricated for us to put in the really kind of part of the accelerator. Um, it was difficult to find a company that can take out the components, the components of the accelerator. And finally, we, one of them, uh, West Ham Company, uh, he accepted the, uh, the proposal. And it was uh, some, something the, 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 the general manager explained that he was the same guy that he put in the accelerator <laughs> to build it. <laughs> And there is some picture about moving the, the, all the components. For example, of course, this company has all the equipment necessary to, to do all, all, the, all the work <laughs> because the pressure vessel tank, <laughs> the heavy is about uh, 14 tons, 14 tons for them. Um, 
the air in in November, four platforms arrived to the Instituto, and they were carrying only 70 tons. There is a picture here about the arriving of the accelerator components. Uh, because uh, there wasn't any uh, place to, only heavy pieces were unloaded in the open areas of the Instituto, and they were sitting there because no building was, of course. Uh, the Rector Rivero Serrano finished his term. Dr. Carpizo was elected as Rector for the period 85 to 84, 1984. Fortunately for the project, Dr. Carpizo approved the construction of the accelerator building, consisting in a tower with a height of about 10 meters, in construction in a surface, a construction surface about 1,000 meters. <clears throat> um, here, the construction of the building started in May 85 and concluded one year later in 86. Here are some pictures about the construction building. Uh, one critical moment for the project of the accelerator was to put uh, the, the 20 train up before, before the, 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 the building top were closed. Uh, a difficult introduction of the accelerator to the building and placing in vertical position was a difficult manure due to the lack of human. It was done using a tier four and the 20 ton cranes they was already installed. Here are some pictures. It took about uh, two weeks to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the brown pin they produced the produce you were here over here. Uh, this is the uh, uh, Dr. Carpizo inaugurated the, uh, the building, but the press mentioned that he was inaugurating the accelerator, but the accelerator was at the <laughs> There were only pieces inside the building. Uh, the platform to serve the column of the accelerator was left the rise. And for installing the column the first time, there is a picture here how we did it. Um, okay. We use some uh, scaffolding similar to those used by, by Mason. <laughs> You can see here. This is the first time. But uh, later on, one was uh, Gilberto Borja. He was CEO of the Association of Civil Engineers, manufacturer, and donated the, the column platform properly to the grain. You can see here. It's much better than the original. And I, I get the, the the displacement in the column, you can use it like an elevator. There is a, a crane. Uh, before disassembling the accelerator and rise, I created an album of photographs, which were crucial to assemble but The accelerator installation was like putting together a huge puzzle due to the large number of pieces to be assembled. Fortunately, None of these pieces were lost during the transfer. In July 1988, we, we were rewarded with observation of the first beam of proton produced by the accelerator in our lab. Of course, this event was emotional. Oh, okay. The main basis for analyzing material by the bombardment, like RBS, nuclear reaction analysis, and mm -hmm. fixing were established in the accelerator and applied in many uh, interdisciplinary projects. 
Both of the projects result in the publication of articles. More than 100, 125 articles have been published using the accelerator. <coughs> Experiments realized with the accelerator were used for students to obtain PhD, master, and bachelor, bachelor degree. Uh, thanks to the success of the projects, financial support was obtained for maintenance of the accelerator and obtained nuclear instrumentation. Now, I've been teaching for a nuclear physics course for more than 40 years, and many uh, students uh, were encouraged to go to the nuclear physics, and some of them went out of Mexico to the United States and mainly to England. So during the time, we had distinguished visitors to the accelerator. One of them was uh, Neil Olain. He was the National Science Foundation Director during the Clinton administration. Also, Leo Lederman, Nobel Prize winner in 88. He was in May, in, in, in May 88, when we, at the end of the year, he obtained the Nobel Prize. Also, uh, the uh, one Me Mexican president visited the accelerator. You know, and of course, many uh, rectors of UNAM visited the uh, structure. And also, uh, the Conacit, uh, Manuel uh, Ortega, he, he visited also the accelerator. And it's very important uh, his visit, the visit, because he, he provides some fun of the accelerator installation. Now, the accelerator can be seen in the media in, se in several ways. Uh, there are videos that they were shown in commercial TV. Uh, and one of, one of the, uh, the, 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 in the, there is a mural uh, in the metro terminal. It includes an artistic view of the accelerator. You can see the, the view over here, and the accelerator, the view artistic of the accelerator is here. This is funny because in the painting, there is a nuclear bomb. <laughs> and also, the painting is obviously about the pigeon of the pigeon. The pigeon is in some place. <laughs> Uh, the National Geographic magazine published an issue, a special issue to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the inauguration of the University City Campus. Uh, the accelerator was elected among the most important laboratories in the University Campus. Uh, the Dr. Frank Chavez accepted to take over the technical and scientific direction of the laboratory in my place eight years ago. He has obtained funds to improve the wind transport lines and to acquire new instrumentation to support research in fundamental and applied research. You already visited the accelerator, participated in the 70th anniversary, and learned about the projects. There is an ambitious deadline for the five MEV. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Any questions? <laughs> Me first. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the time you slide it uh, horizontal through the, through the big one. The, wow. Well, that was my. Yeah. Take cover. Take cover of the selector. Oh. The time. Well, this. Yeah. Well, this. Okay. This is uh, just a very brief uh, summary. Thank you, Eduardo, for this very emotional presentation. I know that uh, the laboratory means so much for uh, to you. I just want to say that it means a lot to us too. Thank you very, very much for. for the, any other question? Yes. So when it was 
disassembled from Rice University, we transported two pages for those stuff. Okay. Excuse me. Diagram. At this moment, there was any budget project for that. And one of Marcos Mazari, he was a, a leader uh, about democracy in Mexico. He was a uh, doctor. He, he was a uh, uh, member of the, how do you say, Junta de Gobierno, or? Uh, 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 he had the influence. <laughs> <laughs> and from other office, he provides the initial funds. It was very, 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 very two thousand dollars to pay for the for the 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 program for the people they went through, and also to take out the accelerator and also to pay the tracks to him. This is a, because I call it chain of something for teachers yeah. events that it was possible to installate this accelerator. Okay. Thank you very much for your so, our next speaker, Osvaldo Civitarese, uh, from the University of La Plata. So he is going to talk about some aspects of neutrino and dark matter physics. Thank you very much, Osvaldo. Sorry, I'm happy to be here. I'm yeah, it's a I think I, uh, I also share the uh, the friends and the person who have advanced in geophysics in Latin America, particularly in kind of physics and mental science. I remembering all those who have continued to build these machines and provide other conditions to work. In the case of Mexico, these two persons here, and also Scarzal in Brazil, and then Emma Ferreira and the University in Buenos Aires. Uh, well, I, I am also happy to speak because I, I did my diploma work in, in physics. So I, I was dealing with the calibration of the German lithium detector, building the acquisition data, and all the circuits, and also correlation table for measuring angular correlation. This is why I consider myself to be a theoretical experiment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so today I have to, to, uh, to convey the notion that uh, we had a very happy time of uh, history in physics. And uh, like the old Chinese uh, saying that. I wish you to, to live in a very interesting time. This is extremely interesting time because we have a common boundary between neutral physics, particle physics, and cosmology. And most of the information is just coming right away from the information when we can, it can be done in laboratory moments. So I, I uh, okay, so I, I, I will concentrate on, on this interface between particle physics, nuclear physics, and Cosmology by referring to a problem, which is a very different problem, which is from where the neutrino mass is coming. It's not coming from any fixed mechanism. Therefore, I mean, the standard model fails in this respect. The neutrino do have a mass. Therefore, therefore I mean, oscillation of pain has kept shown that. And, 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 and of course, we know the uh, parameters of the oscillation, but we don't know the mass of the neutrino. And then it can be neutrophysics because I mean, the, uh, the neutrino has have a meta decay, it's a tool for the decay, for, for this uh, to, to, to assign property to the neutrino. But again, there, we cannot tell anything, even if the neutrino have a meta decay is measured, then we, we uh, will uh, cannot say anything about the mechanism until we have a definite uh, control on the, on the theorem that is on the nuclear matrix element. But then it's coming again the experimental physics, because these matrix elements are nothing by the matrix element of operator between the states that can be measured by other means, like for example, doing proton neutron damper reactions or two proton reactions or charge change general charge change reactions, and also gamma spectroscopy. But then it can be the same way in that. I try to convince you that all ideas coming from Roberto Peche from Tim Binder and Frank Wilshek can give us a notion, an idea about in which direction we have to move to understand the 
So this is the somehow the token on the link pass because we have to go to range. <laughs> Well, uh, the QCD Lagrangian, so I excuse by the uh, equations that uh, we have been uh, before looking at apparatus. So it's a pretty Precisely. Okay, this is the Lagrangian. The, uh, where can I point that this went out? So. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. So this is the QCD Lagrangian. Well, now we have having the uh, the uh, uh, CP uh, and, and reversal uh, invariance and notation. There is a breaking of that particularly in dealing with the uh, electric dipole moment of the new. Uh, well, then, uh, if you uh, send this to the, to the neutral sector, we have something like that. And then goes the suggestion by by uh, Roberto Piche that. Uh, Part of the problem can be can be solved because there were something like eight order of magnitude uh, in the in, in the limit for the light form of the neutron to introduce a field by the way of an average expectation value, and they call that expectation value, which was a number here at the time, they call that the uh, action. And then by changing the coupling here, by adding the action field, they say, well, if I can then uh, get the vanishing uh, 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 result for this, then I can really explain this order of magnitudes for the uh, CP violation in the in the new. Well, then uh, uh, Wilczek and Weinberg were pushing the same ideas, but replacing the constant by a field. And they say, no, well, it's not a constant, it's a field. And because it is a field, we can write again an equation like this. And you see here, it's very interesting because that field, which is called the action, is coupled to the, to the quartz in some uh, way that uh, is preserving the flavor. Therefore, I can write that a younger vertices where the action is coming in, then a quark is scattering, then the quark joins an anti-quark, and then two pions are coming out. But I can do the same thing by uh, replacing the core by electrons. And if I do that, then the action, this uh, 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 tentatively proposed uh, uh, boson field, new boson field, which is me and the color, uh, will be coming in, and the electron will be scattered like this, and then the positron will be here, and then two gamma rays will be coming out. So this actually is actually a called ABMX. We try to measure this uh, things. Uh, well, uh, uh, then if it's only a question of the mathematics to replace, I mean, these uh, interactions at the level of quarks by uh, the interactions uh, 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 involving pi, which is the thing we can measure. And then uh, is coming the, uh, the uh, results by, uh, by Weinberg saying that, well, if this uh, action field is massive, then the mass can be expressed in this way. And you see that the quantity here, F, guarantees that this, this uh, field uh, is, is a very high scale. You see that F is of the order of 10 to the uh, 8 uh, JV. If you put in here, then 10 to the 12, 10 to the 8, maybe 10 to the 4. And this here have 10 to the minus 6. So that mass should be smaller than uh, 10 to the minus 2 uh, electron volts, which incidentally is the same order of magnitude as the mass of the K that we expect from the non observation of double beta decay. So, what is next? Well, next is our, our, our uh, little contribution to the field. So, we propose a Lagrangian where the action is coupled to the neutron. That's all. Now, this problem is such that when you take the time derivative, the zero order, the, the, the zero term here, time derivative, because the field is uh, the, 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 the amplitude time exponential that has the mass, will be coming down. And then by doing this time derivative, you get just the term here, the coupling constant, 
and then the derivative reaction field, and then the neutrinos. And then you see what happens. It appears a magnetic form. It's so simple that it has to be true. And I put my name on that, so it has to be true. And so I, I read a couple of the kilos for that. Look at if I take the time derivative of this, then I get the mass of the action that we already have from the previous equation. And then the neutrino mass will be simply the product of the coupling constant between action and neutrinos, the scale of the action and the quantum of two. But that, of course, I mean, this is a, a zero order mass, and you can then play as any, any, any theoretician with time. So you, you, you can play with adding corrections to that, getting the mass propagator, and then correcting the one loop, the neutrinos, and so on and so forth. But the beauty of this is that I am assuming a simple coupling T. I say actions are there. I need to correct for the problem for the dipole of the dipole of the, of the, of the neutron. I take this information into account. I propose a coupling with the Fermi, which is neutrino, and then plug these two equations together and get the neutrinos. Well, I mean, these are the parameters which uh, are already determined by the uh, by the oscillation thing. And then we are coming to something very close to what uh, you were talking about in your talk, which is just how these uh, neutrinos can interact by the way of some uh, mediators. So these vertices can be calculated explicitly once we know the nuclear properties. And the results are like this. So I assume the neutrino is traveling through the media. And we know that actions are neutrinos because they, they are so tiny uh, masses, and, and they are two of the primordial things before the pre hadronization that they can, can travel huge, huge distances without being practically put uh, up. So then what we have done here, that was the work of one of my and graduate students, uh, what you assume that the environment is the pure vacuum, the environment represented by these vertices has only, uh, sorry, diagonal contributions and also on diagonal. And then by using here different flavors for the, for the neutrinos, electrons coming to electron neutrinos, electrons to muon neutrinos, and electrons coming to double neutrinos. Which is possible because they oscillate between flavors. And, and you see that the, uh, part, the dominant part of that is in the electron, which of course is uh, by no charge because of the, the light masses coming uh, come there, but the others are non negligible, uh, particularly in the electron theory. And this is extremely important because there is another line of discussion in the problem, which is not only the electron number violation, which is implicit in the neutrino of electron decay, but also the electron. Flavor regulation, which is simply in the view of conversion. So then you see, I'm trying to get to, to convey to the notion that uh, at a certain point, I have to take into account all this information here and to see what it is consistent in the picture. This is happening mean, with uh, the plots of these uh, cross sections when I'm um, using the, the complete, uh, I'm modeling the complete interaction with the environment. By adding, I mean, you know, uh, they are on So the pure, the pure oscillation will, will then uh, go uh, uh, to be somehow uh, split it up in this in this way. Which, by the way, is a way of telling you in between the source and the, the texture is something in between. And this something in between can be a one. Okay. Now, I am sorry if you don't see that figure. Uh, this figure is supposed to be the one that you have stay at CERN. A proton is coming in and out, is uh, producing something here, then two electrons are coming out, and then the <laughs> Now, what is the double beta decay without neutrinos? Then the nucleus has, like, the 128, 130, or xenon, or, uh, sorry, the going going, going uh, uh, going to xenon, or say germanium, going to selenium, 
what they're doing. I mean, two neutrons are converted by the weak interactions in two protons. But then if the two electrons and the antineutrinos are coming out, this mode is called the two neutrinos observed and is observed by the angular distribution of the two electrons coming out. So that's just an important. Now, if there are no, no uh, uh, free neutrinos there, the box here is not zero only if the neutrino is a Majorana particle or if there is a connection between left and right handed currents or if it is a right current and right handed current. But if it is so, the two electrons are coming at a single energy, which is at the energy of the end point of the pair. So this is why the pair can have the problem. They have to tell something that if you take the half life of the two neutrino, for the case of Tellurium, uh, and, and you compare with the limits for the non observation of the neutrino less, there are at least four other moments. Is it useful? Yeah, well, so uh, if I mention about the elements that try to, to determine the value of the nuclear matrix element, which appear in the decay, by the way, of reactions. Well, we have a contention of that because reactions are moment independent. There are many more channels, but the channels are implicit in the decay. Anyway, the information is, is useful because it's just illuminating the fraction of the nuclei which participate in the decay. So this is how the matrix element looks. You have here the gamma stellar matrix element. Now, the Fermi matrix element and the tensorial one. So each of them has an equation that can, can work it out very, very easily. And as it is uh, mysterious here, except that we have to know the wave functions. Well, everything is cast in the half-life that has in the mass channel, the ratio between the effective neutrino mass, the value by the electron mass, and these factors, CMN0 new, is the one that contains all the nuclear information. So this, this factor is essentially uh, an integral coming from the, uh, from the electronic wave waves. And this one is the gamma of the matrix element corrected by, by the Fermi factor. This is now a table where I'm showing for certain values of the coupling constant between the action and the neutrinos, the logarithm of the action mass coming from the previous formula, that one was uh, six point something, 10 to the minus six, then uh, the uh, uh, 10 to the uh, 12 divided by the, by the F factor. And then here, I am writing the neutrino mass. And then you will shock because you see the values out of the order of one cent of an electron volt. Which is exactly one of the limits that we can now get from the uh, from the neutrinos that we may take, assuming that say 10 to the 25 years is a limit. The nuclear matrix center for the two neutrino are, I will show now, are very much affected by these regulations, which is not the case of the zero neutrino. So the nuclear matrix center for the zero neutrino are much more. Effective. So therefore, one can have more confidence on that than the one that we have in the city, the two new thing. Okay, this is an extended table where I have collected everything together. Also, with the scale coming to the to the to the action mass, then the coupling for different values of the uh, electron neutrino, going from tens to to tenth of uh, of electron volts, to see whether there is a compatibility. Among them. Well, this is what uh, what we know, say for the for the half life taken out the uh, current limits. Germanium seventy six going to uh, selenium, then sinus uh, one hundred and thirty six, and then this is half life ten to twenty five years in the limit. That means the non observation. And these are the values of the electron neutrino mass, which can be determined by taking a thunder or say somehow reliable neutron mass.
Well, as I mentioned before, when the decay for the two neutrino coming out, which is the measure of angular duration for the two electrons coming, coming out, which is a continuous, up to the endpoint, which is at the Q value for the reaction, the, the decay, sorry. Then this is a, a, a measurement. And the so called experimental matrix element, I mean, the matrix element you need to reproduce the half life where no information of the neutrino is coming in out of this other one, you say 0 0.025 and 0 0.01. And in theory, we can calculate 0 0.016 and 0 0.012. Not that bad, although these are very small numbers. This is not the case for the zero neutrino. In the zero neutrino, the matrix elements are very large. I tell you, five, the order of three to five, which is three to five compared with 0 0.0 something, 0 0.00 this is a compatibility plot. I was, I'm sorry, you cannot uh, uh, get the details. Uh, this, is a, this is a contour plot that I have calculated by assuming in the axis, the neutrino mass, the right to right uh, current uh, coupling and the right to left by taking a constant of that. So it's a, it's a surface and then projecting the surface and that and then looking at the mean to see if I can play the same mechanism by taking the neutrino to be massive or rather by taking the currents to be uh, an admixture of left and right handed currents in the economy. So this is the minimum, this is the, we have taken that for the two, uh, two experiments which are uh, now taken as the current experiment. Now I'm going to the, to the very fast to the alpha which is in the neutrinos, not the mass. We know that because of the oscillation uh, uh, that they have uh, 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 between, between flavors, neutrino flavors there. What happened with the leptons? Uh, can, can, they, can they also violate, I mean, the, the flavor symmetry? Well, if a new one is coming out, coming in, sorry, and then it's a, it's a target, and, and, and the new one is a changing, say, a set, uh, not boson, uh, assuming the standard model mechanism, with a nuclear, which is in a nucleus, and then it produces a neutrino of the you know, flavor. The neutrino can oscillate uh, within the nucleus to, to be an electron neutrino and then come out an electron. So uh, the, uh, the ratio of the decay is expressed like this. And again, here, we are facing the problem that if we don't know the nuclear structure part, we cannot say anything rather than assuming the process can exist. Well, now, because you have been showing me a lot of cables and chambers and the other way, I'm doing it. 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 And uh, well, my working hours and also units and would be that way the students to help you. And within the grant, you can make calculations. And after the calculations, they're coming out matrix elements, which are momentum dependent. By the way, these matrix elements are momentum dependent are the same matrix elements, or roughly the same, which will appear in any experiment that my unit. And this is what is coming out. Then it will be for the for the operators and scalar vector as a vector and tensor parts, the total contribution for the matrix element, the spin independent part, and the spin dependent part. So the first conclusion that you have from here is that this uh, muon to electron uh, the process will be dominated essentially by a spin independent side. Which the unit. This is how, how the matrix elements looks like for the Fermi, the gamma term, and the tensorial part. You see, the numbers will tell you what I said before. Well, and then some, some uh, 
gancho de eh, ascenso de electronegatividad de fía, puente de vuelta, no tengo super simple, yo a mí, so far involve a mí de exchange of the standard model, no tengo que hacer otro mecanismo. Bueno, this is how the matrix only will look like if you if you work them out in the in the in the in the scheme by assuming assuming the picture mediator rather than the standard standard process. Well, some conclusions of this is that the non-cohering process will dominate that, and the cohering contribution is practically ninety nine percent of that, and the underlying electron frame evaluation model can be determined the limits of this uh, in this process. There is a summary. Now, coming back to the Pechayan pin model, and then looking at the tensions done by Weinberg and Wilson, then we get a non-zero mass for the actions. So the actions are the scalar bosons, massive scalar bosons. Now then, can we capture why, why they are not mixed up with the other particles? Because of the scale, because of that F animal which is pushing them there. And then the coupling of the action with neutrinos is like the Higgs mechanism for neutrinos. Like, because then, the complete picture we have, then the SU3 in the in the in the in the front sector is SU2 left to to which you should have to add a SU2 right, then the U1 electromagnetic and an extra U1 coming from the from the action field. So this is the ring to get that. Is there any chance to confirm the questions? Well, as soon as the the machine insert will stop measuring again. We will see if this little jump, which appears in the region of two electron volts, is really jump around. If it is a peak, there will be the indication of right hand loss, definitely. Why? Because if I now recast the information coming from the nuclear and the metal decay, the non observation, with the limits I get for the nuclear mass coming from the coupling to the actions. Then you can predict the lowest value of the masses of the right hand bosons, which then someone will immediately ask, What about heavy neutrinos? Well, they should be coming up there, absolutely. <coughs> Therefore, I mean, rather than having three mass eigenvalues, we should have six mass eigenvalues the three in the lowest hierarchy and the Three in the in the in the higher mass. The second thing is that the mass of the neutrinos resulting from the coupling to the actions are indeed comparable to the number coming from this uh, left and number violating process, but also they are consistent with this, which is left on flame regulation. This is left on flavor at the level of the charge left on, not at the level of the neutrinos, of course. And then uh, I don't, well, I have to mention that I cannot avoid that, but probably I will, I will present that very soon. Because if the actions are the color losses, okay, what do the color losses? The concept. No, 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 the condensation. Now, what is the condensation? Well, the condensation is it's not a phase transition because you don't have any interaction here. It's simply you are populated to the phase with zero momentum. Now, there is one, one condition to that which is temperature. Well, one can ask which is the temperature of the universe today? It's about 2.5 or 3. If you take the masses of the uh, actions coming from the, the Roberto Peche estimation there and go to the uh, standard formulations of the of the uh, Bose Eichel condensation, you can see the extract from that 
Do you remember that the one safety condensation means that when you have an spectrum, you are populated to take the zero momentum. And if the temperature is, uh, is high enough, this state is going to be depopulated until you go to another state where the ground state is completely empty and everything is going to become excited. So you call condensate at best. Because it is at the zero momentum state, it could be completely delocalized in space. So therefore, I mean, again, this is consistent with the picture, saying that perhaps the dark matter, the dark matter may be eventually composed by actions going to this uh, condensed uh, condense space. Well, so I apologize for the equations and the mm -hmm. <laughs> And you see, this is the perfect cycle of the experiments, the theory of nuclear structure, and then the theory for, for yeah, these nuclear pieces. Any questions? Do we have time? Three minutes. Oh, but so, we can. <laughs> so, so, I'm sorry, it's going to be a little bit technical, but in the second bullet, when you say how do you acquire, how do you get rid of the iron mass from the copy of the Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> You want to come back to this? Yeah. Yeah. So if it's a mass, the same as the second one, after the last the mass first. The printed mass first has a gamma five. Why? Wouldn't it be new bar, new bar, new? No, I mean, so the, uh, which is uh, the when you are here, you have the new bar. And so you take here the gamma zero. You have a gamma zero and gamma five here, but the new bar is a new dagger gamma zero. So gamma zero is creating one. So you get the, the new dagger gamma five. And then the derivative is the field here is e, some amplitude times e to the times exponential to the minus i the mass and the proper time, you pay the liberty, and then you get the mass down, and therefore you have, you're coming out with it. Yeah, but not, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm used to see mass in the Lagrangian, but new, you can say new dagger, gamma, gamma zero, new, right? I mean, I'm confused with the gamma star. No, the no, that's because of the action. Yeah, but for a master. The action. <laughs> for a master, right? A master doesn't have a gamma star. Uh, well, but you, you can. Uh, okay, it's technical. We, 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 we I mean, because essentially, the, when you write the current, when you write it, it's gamma mu one minus plus gamma five. So this is the correction coming from the one plus one of gamma five. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Isabel. No, thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. We are back. Hi. Now our chairman is going to be a plain child. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to get started since we are over here. And uh, from the University of Notre Dame, I was in my scene, the uh, work with it. So you're uh, French in origin or? See, see, uh, other Francis. Well, he will tell us about uh, what they're doing with the uh, electrostatic accelerators in the Thank you. Uh, hello, Sergio. Uh, so, uh, Moy Cansado. Uh, he, uh, he can go. Uh, Muchas gracias por la invitación. Okay, uh, I will continue in English, otherwise I'll put myself to shame. Um, um, so I'm from the University of Notre Dame, so we have 
had over the years uh, eight uh, different uh, electrostatic accelerators. Right now we have four that are in operation, three that are on campus and one that is a mile on the ground in South Dakota. Uh, this, uh, these two photos show uh, the, the um, control room in the 1950s for one of our older accelerators. Uh, you can see that back in the day, the physicists were all uh, white men that dress up in suits. Uh, and here, right next, uh, we still have students that dress up in suits, <laughs> as well as female students. Uh, and this council uh, actually is the original council for the most part of our. A 10 megavolt uh, tandem accelerator that we received in 1968. We essentially follow uh, the golden rule of if it ain't broken, don't try to fix it. <laughs> so once something breaks, then we replace it. And the reason why my two grad students here are just like that is this was this photo was taken uh, last July, uh, the day that the, mo the movie Open Ivor came out. So we decided to dress up. To go and watch the movie. So, as a group, we all went to watch the movie and we dress up, I guess, as back in the day. <laughs> so, <laughs> so since, since we just come out of lunch, this uh, this talk will be a little bit more lighthearted. All right. Um, so, this is a history of accelerator. Um, a good deal of the slide I show, I just stole shamelessly the material from Michael Bisher. Um, so the <clears throat> so if you look at the history of the different accelerators, so we had some electrostatic accelerator, then we have a cyclotron and some more electrostatic accelerator, and the number six in time in the list is actually a electrostatic uh, generator that was constructed at the University of Notre Dame, and this was in 1936. And here is a photo of it. So I'll move to the next slide that uh, shows another photo of that. So that machine, our first accelerator was generating about one, about 30 microamps of uh, electron beam with an energy of uh, 2 million electron volts. And this machine was actually really home brew. <laughs> so they used a sewage pipe this is a sewage pipe <laughs> to uh, mount the sphere, and the um, the belt was made with all newspaper that they glued together. <laughs> and, and this was not in a tank like all of the accelerator you see today. It was open to air, uh, which um, led to some issues. But nevertheless. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I will describe some of these issues on the next slide. So uh, nevertheless, they did a lot of uh, like first, first in a kind experiments. Like the was the first experimental proof of the existence of chirical radiation. Uh, they performed some of the first photo disintegration studies of nuclei. Uh, they demonstrated react, uh, reaction phenomena such as mass scattering and branch spreading, etc. All of that was done with this homemade machine. Um, <clears throat> so in 1940, um, they realized that they had like, some problem that came with the fact that there was no tank to contain it. They were very susceptible to environmental fluctuation in temperature and humidity. So in southern Indiana, it can get quite humid uh, in the summer. Um, so for that reason, so they decided to plan a new accelerator that, uh, that would allow them to reach higher energies, a better stability, etc. And she, there was this, I found that very funny here, uh, snippet of an article in like the, uh, the university journals in the 40s, where you have a freshman, very curious as guy, asked the professor, why build a new generator? And the professor said, we need higher voltage. <laughs> what, what will be gained by higher voltage? The higher the voltage, the faster the electrons will move. High velocity electrons disintegrate many more atoms than low velocity electrons. Seems to me all this atom smashing is nothing else but the smashing of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and the professor answered, yeah, on the contrary, 
in a sense, it is not smashing at all. It is a recreation of the beauty of the method of the world. It is like coming down to the beginning clay of all things and discovering the infinite task of design and creation. <laughs> so, uh, of this, you, one thing you have to uh, realize is the University of Notre Dame is a Catholic university. <laughs> so, they, the professor had to come up with a, such a poetic and uh, religious <laughs> answer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the second, so that, so in the end, in 1942, so we built the second accelerator, and this was actually designed to reach eight megavolts. It's actually higher than the, the CN, but never managed to get there. <laughs> and so you can see this was like a very big machine, and it was actually not vertical, but horizontal, which naively thinking should lead to some problem <laughs> um, and it was also uh, homemade so it wasn't like a commercial machine because it's still like we really at the beginning of the, the field of uh, the electrostatic accelerators <clears throat> so this machine was actually uh, drafted in the war effort soon after it was completed because you can look at the date uh, something was happening with that period of time and this is also around the period of time where the the Manhattan Project like was kicking in, and so there was a lot of uh, labs throughout the U.S. that uh, were part of the effort, including Notre Dame. And in 1946, uh, once we reached peacetime, I was eventually returned to research uh, <clears throat> until, of course, there was need for another accelerator. But before I move to that, uh, these accelerators were in a building uh, that we call La Fortune. So there's a lot of you who are collaborating with us of Notre Dame came. And La Fortune is that place where you eat food. Uh, it's like basically just fast food restaurant and it's not very good. Fortune. The food here is much better. <laughs> Your canteen is fabulous. <laughs> um, so they begin the construction of Newland Science Hall, which is right next door. And this would became the location of the, the new location of the physics building. And <clears throat> with that, uh, the uh, nuclear physicists wanted to have a new accelerator that could be located in that new building. And that's the third accelerator, which was like another three MEV electron machine uh, that was used to perform research. And this was also around the time where they started getting like a PhD degrees. Uh, that were uh, given at the University of Notre Dame. And in 1968, uh, so decided people wanted to go to even higher energy to smash things even more. And uh, so this led to the purchase of a 10 megavolt FM 10 dem accelerator. And here are a few photos of that uh, 10 dem accelerator that is being lowered down into a pit. So they actually had to expand this new uh, Newland Science Hall, had to be expanded uh, to uh, make place for the uh, tandem accelerator, as well as the vault in which it will sit and also experimental vaults around it. So this was a really a big, a big project. And this uh, tandem accelerator was actually purchased from the same company as, the, as your uh, CM on the graph as well as the Lena machine that we just saw, uh, high voltage engineering. <clears throat> we have a few more uh, photos of that 10 megavolt FM 10 accelerator uh, from back uh, in the uh, late 60s. Uh, so at first it was uh, the 10 m accelerator. Uh, I have like uh, just those regular belts like you have for your CM machine. Um, but in the mid uh, 90s, we had like a few upgrades of the tandem. Um, <clears throat> first, we upgraded the terminal in order to go a little bit higher. Okay, uh, go past them. I go to 11 uh, megavolt. And uh, so we changed the belt for a penetron change system uh, from 
at the other company that deals with uh, electrostatic calculation accelerator, the National Electrostatic Corporation. And uh, even more recently, <coughs> we um, purchased a new uh, recirculation system of first uh, because uh, to handle the software exofluoride. Okay. Um, for many years, uh, we didn't put any software exofluoride because this is a very heavy gas. Um, so it tends to stay at the bottom of the tank. Okay, if you get it out, it's a ship. And so you lose it every time you, uh, you evacuate the, the tank, remove the gas, and you try to put it back, you have less and less of it. Uh, so we had to buy a dedicated uh, recirculation system uh, for that software and software in order to handle it. And uh, soon we will be able to operate with 100% software exoprite, which will allow us to go to those like uh, that voltage we we'll like to reach in our dream of uh, 11 megavolts. <clears throat> but uh, right now we uh, can't get up to uh, nine and a half megavolt comfortably uh, for uh, most of the time without uh, having big sparks. So this uh, FM tandem is really like the, the working horse uh, ac uh, accelerator at the University of Notre Dame. Um, it takes negatively charged ion from one of our two ion source. We have a helium ion source and a SNX or source of negative ions by cesium sputtering. So the SNX ion source is pretty much, you can pretty much accelerate almost anything except normal gases. Turns out it's very hard to stick an electron on a normal gas for some reason. Uh, but for the helium, helium is very special. It has a metastable state, electronic metastable state that lives for a few microseconds, which is sufficient to accelerate negatively charged helium at the tens of kilo electron volts and have it enter the tandem. And because the ion starts with a negative, negative charge, it's much more difficult to stick an electron than to remove them in an ion source. Uh, we're limited in terms of current, and typically we'll be on the order of a few microamps at most current that we can get uh, out, out of that machine accidentally. Okay, but because it's a tandem, so what, what happened, the reason why we call it a tandem for, for the student, uh, so we uh, so we come in, so it's negative charge at the middle of that tandem uh, accelerator. So we have a foil, and the foil is located at the terminal, which is at very high voltage, very high positive voltage. The negative ions are accelerated towards the foil. It has sufficient energy to punch through the foil, and as it punch through the foil, it will strip that electron, plus many more. So there will be a distribution of positive charge isotope that are receiving a second kick for your buck. That's why it's called a tandem. So there's two acceleration, like a tandem bicycle. Um, and then you get that acceleration. And after that, you have an analyzing magnet that is used to separate this different charge state by uh, the bending radius in the magnetic field. So different charge state or different energy, different ways of seeing that. And there's slits that will basically cut what you don't want and let only what you want pass through. And then we have a switching magnet here that basically sends the beam to different uh, experimental setups that are attached to that machine. <coughs> so the first so the first vaults in which uh, the beam from the tandem enters is here, is what we call our East target vault. Uh, the main device that we see is our accelerator mass spectrometry device, which is a big uh, Ron Bruckner spectrograph. Uh, so it's uh, used to do carbon-14 dating, but uh, many other type of uh, research in that field as well. Uh, we also have another line that goes to our R2D2 scattering chamber, uh, as well as one central line that goes to the next target vault. And there's another small line right there uh, that goes to something that is not shown because that, that figure is already dated. 
uh, goes to a NG spectrograph. Uh, it was like mentioned earlier today that uh, it's good to, like, uh, if you're in the university lab, to collect old stuff from uh, elsewhere. So at the University of Notre Dame, we're like frozen that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, since we have also limited resources, uh, so we're, we've got, we also, uh, just just like you, inherited uh, from uh, things from Oak Ridge National Lab. So one of them is this uh, in, an NG spectrograph um, from uh, uh, Oak Ridge, and this is installed right there. <coughs> oh, you wanted it, or you take it? We work on it. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's good that somebody is using them because it's a pity when nobody thinks like I think the tandem actually the, the big tandem I don't think anybody will end up using it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So after yeah, so the the central line goes to the next target vault that includes the. A twin soul radioactive aluminium facility. So that's I described it uh, when I gave my talk at Kogoyak. Okay, so this is like the uh, first radioactive beam facility in the US and the oldest one actually is in operation in the world. And um, this beam, the beam from twin soul, so many of you are using it, like Lewis, <laughs> uh, goes to trisol, okay, that Lewis uses, or goes to the St. Benedict uh, setup. Uh, that I'm using. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> also, that our target vault also includes a line that goes to uh, what was before the ice ball, not fireball, which is adopted used by Ani Atraman. So there's uh, so there's a lot of science coming out of the tandem now. Yeah, although it's a 1968 machine. Um, so my group, for example, so we uh, measured several half-life of um, super-allowed conditions between mirror and nuclei for the test of the standard model. And so this uh, this was our latest one, um, nitrogen 13. So this uh, half-life of like 10 minutes. And this is actually a very good example of the type of science that can be done in small lab, like ours, mine and yours, um, <clears throat> because the half-life of nitrogen 13 is 10 minutes. I try uh, convincing uh, the PAC at uh, FRIB or any big national lab uh, to, to sit for four hours to wait for the decay of that isotope. Because typically, if you want to measure it precisely, you want to wait for 20 to 25 half life. Okay. Um, we also uh, so did trisol experiments, and like several of you in here are listed. So I'm not going to describe that too much because I'll myself to shame and say the wrong things. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, so this is the type of uh, example of time still done with the FM All right, now I'll go back in time a little bit uh, <coughs> to describe uh, two accelerators that were purchased in the 19, well, 1990s, early 2000, for a program in nuclear astrophysics that was really pushed by Michael Beecher when he came. And there's a KM and a FN accelerators that both came from Canada. Uh, both were used back, back in the day in Canada and they did, needed them anymore. So they basically gave us those accelerators and then we made use of them at Notre, at Notre Dame. So these were the fifth and the sixth accelerator. Uh, so the KM is a 3.5 uh, megavolt on the graph. And this one was replacing this like four NEV Van de Graaff that I was talking about from the 1950s. So that one we used it for like, like 40 years. Okay? And then it was really at the end of his life and got replaced by, by this like a machine from Queens that was a, a little longer, but a more managed left. Um, and then the other accelerator was a one megavolt uh, GM from the University of Toronto. Uh, and both of them really, as I said, uh, were leading this uh, nuclear astrophysics program, um, <clears throat> which turned out to be very successful and led to 
um, applications for funding with the National Science Foundation and the university secured some funds for major research instrumentation development and to buy basically a new accelerator. Okay, for a change, we decide not to use something from somebody else, but have a new brand new machine. <laughs> uh, and this, this uh, on the right hand side is a plan, planned by the university architect of where we're gonna put that machine. So back in the day, wasn't sure where that would go. So we have here the current location of the JM and KM, and they were supposed to, to feed beam to some, they were feeding beam to some experimental setup and a future a recall mass spect a spectrometer, which is now the St. George mass spectrometer. So that would have been one location. And whoops. And the other one was right, right there, which was basically invading into space used now by uh, the astronomy group. Uh, <laughs> into discussion with the university. Uh, in the end, we chose uh, what was chosen was the least invasive one. <laughs> That's still, uh, that still made, that made our space a little bit more crammed up. Okay. <clears throat> so in that 2012, so this is when we received that seventh accelerator. Uh, so it, uh, the name is uh, Santa Ana because it's a university, it's a Catholic university. Uh, so we like to name things after saints. So they just said it was like a Saint George, uh, the recoil mass separator, and then like Saint Benedict, that's my trap system. So that one is Santa Ana. Okay. Um, so it's a five U, five megavolt penetron accelerator. And it has like a internal uh, ECR source from Pan Technique, uh, and this is essentially re replacing this uh, KM that was dismantled in pieces because it was really at the end of its life. And here's a photo of that accelerator was like crane down uh, into place here, so right on the roof of the uh, physics building, and then after they craned it down, they basically built up the tower around it. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so that's a photo of like the, so unfortunately for our accelerator, it's not, uh, I was really impressed uh, when I visited the CM here because I could really see like in perspective the whole thing, the whole tower. But for that one, we cannot because the tower is really like built fit right around it. <laughs> um, and so you, uh, this is the top, this is the, the middle of it, you can see the column there uh, with two former grad students pretending to talk to one another. <laughs> uh, so that's at the bottom. Uh, at the bottom of uh, this is where the beam comes from. And uh, as I mentioned before, so it's a Catholic university. So this is the Father Jenkins, who is the president of the university. And uh, he had to come and uh, receive you toss some uh, holy water <laughs> on, the, on the setup. Uh, you know, yeah. and just uh, make sure that uh, it works as uh, it works successfully, and that indeed we yeah. had a lot of good science out of that accelerator. Yeah. But, sure, he charges for that. Uh, it's free. It's, <laughs> of, it's free. It's part of his mission. It's job, right? That's <laughs> what they do. Uh, although we like, uh, like, so when he came and I tossed it, like people were a little bit scared because. It was like an electronic rack right there. It was like passing the only water on the electronic rack. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was your thing. But then I, I, we've been told that we, th there's no worry because it's deionized water. That's a good remember. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the 5G accelerator really it works in combination in uh, harmony with the FM, uh, where the FM is the high energy machine. This one is our single end uh, high intensity machine because the ions they start already positive. Okay, and then if you happen to start with like a very high charge state, okay, like you're trying to do, okay, you can actually achieve a good amount of energy. 
But in any case, for us, it's not really what we necessarily want. What we want is high intensity for the experimental setup, sorry, that comes afterwards. Uh, so we have here a photo, uh, a schematic of that uh, vertical accelerator. The beam comes out down, turns into an analyzing magnet, goes down the beam line shown uh, in photo here, and then goes to a switching magnet. And then it goes into the following experimental vault that has several experimental setup. So there's that St. George we call mass separator. Uh, and St. George is uh, used uh, to measure um, cross sections of interest for uh, like stellar burning. And these happen at very low energy. And at very low energy, those cross sections are very small. So because they're very small, you need enough current, a big current to see anything. Okay. For that reason, uh, and they don't need the energy. So for that reason, they are using the beam from that 5U. Uh, so there's also a, a station here where we can put uh, different setups, like one-off type of experiment. Myself, I did a one-off experiment there uh, using germanium detector in collaboration with John Hardy. That was actually his last experiment. Uh, that was actually done not at Exocianum, but was done at Major um, uh, We also have a Reno, the Reno gas target here. So these are a few, couple of uh, like uh, results, recent results from like uh, last year and the year before uh, of being uh, using the 5U. Okay, so measuring like a resonance strength for classical ANOVA as well as like doing some nuclear reaction measurements also for uh, interest in nuclear astrophysics. Okay, so essentially the 5 machine most of the time is nuclear astrophysics related science. I was the one off that did fundamental symmetry experiments with it. Okay, but uh, it's mostly nuclear astrophysics. Um, <coughs> okay, that one, that one megavolt GM. Oh yeah, I'm almost there. Yeah. Okay. That one megavolt GM accelerator. Um, so after we move that 5U, so that 5U could also go at sufficiently low in energy that we didn't need it, this like one megavolt machine anymore. So this was then moved into a mine in South Dakota, in the surf mine. And it's um, <clears throat> essentially used also to measure like uh, uh, cross sections and different uh, quantities that requires a good background suppression. Okay, because it's in the mine, you can suppress really the, the muon flux, okay? And so the, that machine can go from 150 kilovolt to one, like one megavolt. Okay, you have a R final source, can provide beams for up to 250 micrograms, which is a little similar to what our 5 u is also doing. Of, uh, of protons and alpha particles. So there is several, here is a, also like some of recent measurements. So there's like even a PRL that came out uh, of like measurements done with this uh, GM. So this is really like the proof that we can do very high impact science with like these little machine electrostatic accelerator. Okay. I'm not preaching the crowd. <laughs> um, and so the so in 2016 was our, our final uh, accelerator. Uh, so this uh, <clears throat> was again an accelerator used by somebody else in the past that was not used anymore. So it's a Ninus, a three megavolt tandem accelerator from Livermore. So here's a photo of Michael Beecher that likes to connect an old accelerator. And uh, next to uh, the uh, that uh, uh, three megavolt tandem, so we. Uh, bring it up from Livermore, so it was craned down, and then it was rolled, uh, rolled into the the building. <clears throat> and this accelerator of an alpha cross-ion source uh, accelerates uh, protons and uh, helium. And it's this is our machine that is dedicated for applied physics research. Um, so one thing we realized a few years before that is that we started having more and more users that wanted to use our FN tandem for applied science. And it was encroaching into 
are big times for basic science. And with having this machine instead, we can focus <coughs> all of the attention of basic research onto that new machine and have the basic science done with the FLTML. So this is the dragon's the what? Still the machine from Barney Doyle? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's probably very more. I don't know what, uh, who was using it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's the accelerator. And then, uh, so it goes, the beam comes out of it. There's an analyzing magnet. And then there's like a couple of beam lines where we have our target stations uh, over there. And so this this machine actually uh, got a good a whole lot of good use uh, since it came, uh, especially for like popular press. Um, <clears throat> and here is the most recent one. Uh, so there is like a wonderful faculty member, uh, Grant Beasley. Uh, he's really big into um, looking for PFAS, those forever chemicals. <laughs> it uh, already MP mentioned about it in this talk. So uh, so <laughs> so we're also working on that. And so this is the, the, the most recent one I could find. Actually, I, I found it when I was uh, listening to uh, the CBC, which is the Canadian News. Uh, every night I listen to the Canadian News to see what happened in Canada <laughs> and also in the rest of the world. Because as you know, when you live in the US, you only hear about US news. It's like the, the rest of the world does not exist. Uh, so when we were listening to the CBC, uh, so we... <coughs> So we've heard about that, that report about like, a, they had like a basically a, a survey of like PFAS contained in cosmetics. <clears throat> For those of you who wear cosmetics, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> You're putting a, a forever chemical on your face and it leaches on your skin. <laughs> it depends, yeah, it depends if they have it or not. So, but, uh, so what they found, it was like a great deal of them actually had it. And also, of course, it depends on how much you put it, and if you do it every day or if you just do it once a month. Um, yeah, so that's a, and it was also found in like in fast food, fast food wrap, fast food, sorry, fast food wrap. Uh, for example, like some restaurant like McDonald's, as a consequence of the, that research, decide to by themselves hold the use of those chemicals in the wrapping. Okay, so it didn't. We didn't even have to wait for regulation from the, the FDA and the government to, uh, to change things. <coughs> anyway, so uh, I'm running out of time, it looks like. Okay. So I'll conclude by showing you the slide that you can read and take questions. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Andy. This is a question about your um, five years uh, oh, sorry, uh, uh, of the uh, the, the, the three uh, medical machines, so uh, the single medical machines. So what's the lowest energy you can you can go, and how how does it operate at the low end? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <I'll be honest. laughs> but uh, yeah, so the it's probably more than like the naive thinking, like the JM can go down to a few hundred kV. So this will probably be a little bit higher because usually the higher the machine, the voltage, the lower end also goes up. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Is it quick question? How many of these machines are still in use? Four. Four. Yeah, so, yeah. so four. So it's basically these. So there is these three here, like that. Uh, the tandem from 1968, the 2012 uh, Spive U, uh, the the newest one that is used for the PFAS studies, the three megavolt. Mm -hmm. And these are all of the campus of the University of Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. And then the one megavolt GM, that's the one that's in the mind. So what happened one. to the other four? What happened to the other four? Well, the very first one uh, was probably dismantled, and the second, the second and third one as well, the KM was dismantled also. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, uh, it looks like our place is the cemetery 
You could be going to go somewhere else. Are you? <laughs> Sweet Mary to Catholic University. Sweet Catholic University. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Thanks. Thanks for this tremendous talk because it. I, I mean, I I think that Dr. Dam is one of the best uh, proofs that it's possible to use machines many times and. It's like I, the novel is about not uh, bundle wraps and tangents and whatever. You can make still continue making physics, yep. physics, material physics, and so on. At least sometimes here in Mexico it's difficult to convince people about that. At least our our parents that are not related to nuclear physics <laughs> sometimes. So uh, my my question is how you decide when you want when you need well I I think there is an offer of you want this accelerator. How you decide? You have a committee. You have. All of you, all the all the uh, researchers, yeah, so uh, make a meeting to decide. Yeah, so essentially, uh, uh, the nuclear group we have a bi-weekly meeting where we discuss various things, and if somebody will come up with an idea, or, oh yeah, I would like to get this thing. Uh, like for example, like the most recent addition, we didn't put it there. Okay, so there's a essentially uh, <clears throat> it's. Sort of like a uh, almost like a EMS system that was like in a naval institute uh, near DC that uh, we actually moved over at Notre Dame. But that that setup was not really used, it's not really used by us. It's like also uh, for the College of Engineering. Mm. But in any case, we always, the whole group, we discuss about future plans. And we have also retreats as well once a, once a year in the summer. We'll have a one-day retreat uh, somewhere where we'll discuss like future plans and oh, come up with like a consensus whether or not we want to move forward with uh, such idea. And you have to convince in that case that the authorities of the university. Right? Oh, uh, <clears throat> well, so, so first, so it goes like so we our group we we convince ourselves that this is something we want. And then after that, we go to the university. So one thing that is nice with Notre Dame is it's a private university that does have uh, good means. <laughs> so if you're nice and you, you beg on your knees to them, you may be some parts. So as, a good, as an example, this uh, recirculation system for the, yeah, for the software example, right? So this was funded by the university. So we basically have we had the proposal. The proposals came to us, and we had to visit the place and so like see all the great science we're doing. <coughs> but look at all, all like your know, controls. <laughs> her controls are and like we have this 1968 and then machine that. Uh, we'll really need a facelift, and we would like to go to higher energy, and uh, this will cost that much. Do you think we couldn't help us? And so that actually they said, yeah, yeah. So they gave us like the, the funds. And it was the same for um, Trisol. Trisol, yeah. so, Trisol is a little bit longer story. I can really tell you over here yeah, yeah. because it's not uh, before <laughs> uh, before you you kick me. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Professor Rulo Biker from uh, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> And I join everybody else in extending my congratulations to the 70th birthday of the accelerator. You know, the people who made it work continue to make it work. Uh, I arrived to Mexico 10 years after the accelerator. I was very pleased to find here a very active nuclear physics group, both in theory and experiment. As we've been able to see this week, uh, earlier this week in Copiok, uh, is we're still proud to maintain the same level of activities here in Mexico. Although we have very few, but it's a very active group. Uh, for this uh, talk, for this presentation, uh, 
I want to give present you some results on uh, on the study of the Hoyle state, especially on the analogs of the Hoyle state in neighboring nuclei. So nuclear in, the, in this case, I will focus on uh, carbon thirteen. Um, okay, for the visitors, I apologize. Some of the the, uh, the transparencies are in Spanish, but I guess that's not a problem. Uh, So first about the well, the state, the Hoyle state was already discussed in several talks at the meeting in, in Kokoyuk. It was also mentioned by by Ukraine in this uh, presentation. Um, this whole state was proposed by uh, by Fred Hoyle in the 50s to solve a problem to uh, to explain the abundance of carbon in the universe. So he's he proposed a mechanism that uh, well, if there is a if there is an excited state in carbon twelve exactly at the uh, at the the, the, the how do you call it the threshold for the triple alpha rushes, uh, one could <clears throat> use that mechanism as an enhancement of the production of carbon twelve, and indeed a few years later the state was found, and in honor of Fred Hoyle it was named after him. So it's not known as the Hoyle state. As far as I know, it's the only state, the nuclear state that carries the name of, of the person. Okay, uh, so in, in uh, this talk, uh, the results that I present are based on a model that we developed some time ago. Uh, it's a cluster model in which we describe states. Well, in the simplest version, we describe states in uh, Nuclei that consist of a certain number of alpha particles. So could be really made of carbon 12, oxygen 16, etc. Uh, I will focus on the case of three alpha particles. So, how do you get evidence for these uh, things or for these shapes? For example, a case that is very well known is here on the left hand side. We have spherical nuclear, we have deformed nuclear with actual deformation, and some fingerprints you can see here. It's, a, it's the structure of the spectrum. Yeah, so, here for the, for the spherical nucleus, you have a uh, states with a typical foundational nucleus. Here, there's the one fold excitation, two plus, and then there's a two fold triplet, four plus three plus zero plus, etc. Okay. For actually deformed nuclear, we have rotational sequences. Sequences that go like L plus one, and then we can have several vibrations also, which are called here by these names beta and gamma. So those are the first fingerprints to identify these nuclei to classify them according to a shape. Yeah. If you want to distinguish between rollate and oblate, you will measure the particle moment. So here on the right hand side, I have something similar, but then for the triangular configuration of the alpha particles in this case. So if that's really a triangular configuration, um, you analyze the consequences of this discrete symmetry. In the same way as you do for the uh, for this, you know, it has to be invariant on the rotation of 180 degrees. Here you have similar symmetry of operations and that tells you what are the allowed values of the angular momentum spin and parity. So for this case, you have a ground state band, and unlike the, the, the actual symmetry, here we have a mixture of positive and negative parity states. Yeah, so it's a still plus two plus three minus, here's a doublet, four plus four minus, and five minus. And then the, this structure can also have some uh, oscillations. Simplest oscillation is simply a breathing progression, which expands and contracts. So the shape of the, the triangle is preserved. So for this type of vibration, we have the same sequence of states. For the other case, it's a little bit more complicated. It's a two-dimensional vibration of this type. And the states are labeled by these, these quantum numbers. So let's, let's go to an example. So this is a figure that also was shown by uh, Ephraim. This is from a paper by uh, Chairman of this morning, Daniel. 
So here we see the sequence. So, so these are excit excitation energies as a function of LL plus one. So if you have a sequence that holds on a rotational band, they all lie on a straight line. Yeah, so here in, in blue, you see a brown state band. So this is the zero plus, we have a two plus, three minus, double four plus, four minus, five minus. This is exactly the sequence that I showed on the previous slide. Yeah, and which is typical, which is a fingerprint of such a configuration, a triangular configuration of the alpha particles. And this five minus was the work of the PhD thesis of that year. And in addition, there are other bands. So this is this famous Hoyle state, 7.67b. And also recently, uh, from, by now from 10 years ago, um, excited states of this Hoyle state were measured. There's a two plus and also a four plus. So these are also relatively recent measurements. And then here there are some other states of one minus two minus. Okay, skip this one. So now the question is, if we go to neighborhood group again, that's all. If you if we go from carbon twelve to carbon thirteen, we add a neutron. So this neutron couples to all the states in the in carbon twelve. So can we identify analogs of this whole state? Okay, um, well, here are some, some formulas, but um, for this we, we developed this model which we call the cluster shell model. So this is basically, it's an analog of the, uh, of the Nielsen model. So there's, but there's the Nielsen model, it explains you how, how states or single particle states Evolve with the deformation. If you put an external default field, what happens to the single particle states? They split in a certain way. Right? So, in this way, and in this sense, we do something very similar here. But now the deformed field is the deformed field generated by this cluster of three alpha particles. Let's get this one. So here, this is something, this is type of a Nielsen type diagram. So here, so this is as a function of the deformation. The deformation, sorry, this is, let me go back one. The deformation parameter here is this beta. Beta is the distance of these alpha particles with respect to the center of mass. Yep. So it's, it's kind of a size parameter for this uh, configuration. This angle state and phi um, define the position of these alpha particles. So that's so here. This is a simulation for different values of beta. Of course, at beta zero, everything falls on top of each other. This is for beta two Fermi, which is uh, very close to the value that we use for, uh, for to describe the properties of carbon twelve. And of course, at Beta becomes much larger, it's just like three separate alpha particles. So here in this diagram, so this is the reason why I went back. So this is a function of this beta, the separation, yeah? the distance with respect to the center of mass. Yeah? So here, this is beta equals zero. So this is beta, I put a, a, an arrow here, this is a value typical for the for carbon 12. And so we see here a sequence, sequence of lines. Yeah. So here, this is the 1s, 1s, 1f. That remains all these levels. Let me first say this all levels are doubly degenerate. Yeah. So this is the blue level. The, this is the P3f, it splits into two. And the P1f is also a single one, etc. And according to the 70 classifications, doesn't matter the names that we put. These are the names that are found in the uh, in the molecular physics literature. So let's identify them simply by color. Yeah, there are three types: it's blue, black, and red. Yeah, so S one half gives us a blue curve. P three half splits into a red and a, and a, a black one, etc. Yeah, so for example, for carbon twelve, so the first Two for carbon 13. No? The first two neutrons go here, then here we can 
come with it. The other four, and then the seventh. Yeah, goes either here or in this next level. Yeah, and their properties they depend on this, uh, these configurations. Ah, yeah, something goes wrong because we were supposed to see here the, <laughs> the levels give the rotational structure that are built on top of these uh, states. Mm -hmm. Now we skip it and we go immediately to them. We can't see it, we can also take the uh, PDF file. Maybe. Now you see it. This one? This one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I will look. Okay. Okay, this is the same trick, but focused on, on this part here, the lower part. You know, here it is. Okay. So, so here we have these this configuration here, just for comparison, for sake of comparison, here we have the results for the carbon 12. So it's this, this band, no, it's J plus two plus T minus. Double focus points. And then if you have the ground state band, then we add one neutron to any of these three configurations, you get the results that are shown here in these uh, these bands. That one that we will look at in more detail is this one. So now these states they consist of a series of K bands. Yeah, just as here for the for the ground state band in carbon, carbon 12. We have a zero plus T minus band six plus minus that's it. Yeah, so here we have the K is a, it's a one half minus five half plus. Seven. So that is also what we see in the experiment. So this is the uh, these are the experimental values, and here is the theoretical calculation. Okay, to get to this uh, this uh, the analog of the whole state. Uh, our proposal is to, to look at the form factors, which already defined also this morning in one of the presentations. So I'll be very short. So we have a, a, a distribution here, see the uh, charge distribution. So what the first part is the charge distribution of these three alpha particles. Then here we have to add the single particle part of the extra neutron that you have. Putting there, we use a very simple form. It's basically a, it's a triangle. The alpha particles are located at the edges of the triangle with the Gaussian distribution. Yeah, the Gaussian distribution has this parameter alpha. Yeah, and this is simply this one. So if you talk about factor, we call it the form factors. Yeah, that's simply the Cuvier transform of this form. So I will not go in any more detail. So what we get is something that we see here. So this here, just for the comparison a little bit time, uh, these are the low-lying states for carbon 12. So oh, zero plus, two plus, four plus, and here we have the three minus state. And here are the lower states in carbon 13. And the color um, the black refers to E2 transitions here. So we have one transition here that corresponds to these two. And going into the formulas, you can show that the sum of these two has to be equal to this. Yeah. The same for the uh, for the octopole transitions. And even if you only populate a single state, and then the uh, in the odd nucleus in carbon 13, this strength is divided among three three different states, it's fragmented. The sum of the strength is the same. And the same holds for the uh, extra decapole transition. This one is fragmented into two pieces. Okay, so these are relations that we can test or compare with experimental values. So this is what I do here. So this is for the ground, this is for the elastic one. 
So the elastic one, this is carbon 12, and here we have carbon 13. And they look very similar. The curves are identical. And superimposed here are the experimental values. And mm -hmm. alpha and beta are these coefficients that we have to determine. Alpha basically, alpha is the is the width of these uh, of the Gaussian distribution for the alpha part. So alpha is basically the size of the, the helium, of the alpha part. And this beta, this value of beta to be defined here, is fixed to reproduce the first minimum in the elastic form. So it's a very clean determination of these things. So there's no playing around with, uh, there's no parameter fitting in the, There's no additional fine tuning or parameter fitting. That is how these uh, things are become. Yeah. So in the bottom, the bottom, we see the inelastic form factor, in this case, the, the particle. So for the particle, this is the excitation of the two plus state. And here it's a sum of two excitations. One is there to the three R plus and other to the five R plus. And they also look very similar. Yeah. I have to add here, if you, for beta larger than one and a half or two Fermi, you start seeing some variation between theory and calculation. And this is because there other terms come into play that are not present in this simple model. Okay. Now for the whole state. So here on the left, let me see this, this are the data for the, for the whole state. This is a calculation that we published 20 years ago. So it's, uh, it's a little bit off in the maximum, but the form of the, of the form factor is very well reproduced. There's a clear minimum here that's a little bit higher, larger than two inverse Fermi. So this is the transition form factor from the ground state into the whole state? This is the transition form factor from the ground state to the whole state. Yeah. So then we looked in the, to the data for carbon 13. Um, the data for carbon 13, there are a couple which are well known. But since the, the, the experimental resolution is not sufficiently high, many of the states that are measured are really, it's the sum of several states. Yeah? They cannot distinguish between one and the other. This one is very well isolated. Yeah? So there is a state, one half minus, same spin and parity as the ground state, at 8.8 MeV, it's more or less, it's, it's an excitation energy which is similar to that of the oil, oil state in carbon 12. And this is the result of for the form factor. Yeah, in this model, uh, okay, the, theor the theoretical result is exactly the same, but also the experimental result, although the, 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 the maximum here is a little bit below what, it, what you see here, but the rest of the structure is very same, very much the same, yeah? also a minimum here, and of course, yeah, so this suggests to, to associate this state <laughs> as the analog the whole state in, in carbon 13. There have also been other attempts to look for, uh, for analogs of the whole state. This is a slide that, that I was sent by uh, Ivano Lombardo. And what we did here is, is this plot where you, you show the excitation energy again as a function of L plus one, L is the angular momentum. And here we have a color coding for the different nuclei. So black is carbon 12. I just read it because I know that back here it's hard to see. So the five curves are here is carbon 12 plus a neutron plus a proton. Well, Taking away one proton or taking away one nucleus. Yeah, so it's really the carbon 12 with the, all the neighboring nuclei. Yeah, so here we see for the ground band, we see all these curves, the solid curves, which essentially all have the same slope. Yeah, they're very similar. And then here, at this excite, excitation energy, we see the whole bands. They all have the same slope. <clears throat> Yeah, they have the same slope here. And so in this case, the, the, the analysis that, uh, that was done by Irano 
was based on energy systematics. And so here the analog of the whole state in carbon 13, which is the blue, is this state here. This is, is the same state that I just showed you the form factor. And so we agree on this point. So I come to the end of my talk. So this work on the on this analog of the whole state is basically the thesis of Alan Santana. The result was obtained a year ago, but he found a job in uh, in real life. So <laughs> we have a difficult time to to get him to defend the scheme. But I hope hopefully this year we will manage. The result was published in this uh, in this paper in physics letters. So the, the proposal of this, this work was to, uh, well, in addition to energy systematics, also to look at, uh, at the electromagnetic properties of, uh, of these states, in particular here, the, uh, the form factors, Coulomb form factors, to try to identify these states. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for such a very nice uh, talk. Surprising results. Osvaldo? Yeah, excuse me, my ignorance. I mean, if the e alphas are in a plane, yeah. and the neutron is in a line perpendicular to the plane, there's the oscillations of the neutron. That mode is not a rotation. So, is there any way to? Account that in a kind of audio vibration you have to Yeah, this is what we do. Oh, okay, cool. We couple it. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the, well, one of the figures that this figure here. So we have okay. this configuration of three alpha particles. So we have a configuration to add to that, we add. So, in addition, of course, here I, I focus mostly on the rotations. Yeah, yeah. But of course, you also have the vibrations. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, here I, I only showed you the results for, for the rotational yes. structure of the ground state. Yeah. Thank you. But of course, in addition, yeah. you have the vibrations. I, I, I have a question. Uh, sure. For the ground state bands, it's not the same in, in this line of cases. It's not the same to add or to remove a nuclear from carbon 12. So you get to a very different orbitals. And how come is that the, the moment of inertia is the same? If, if you, if uh, have... No, we have not. So far, we only looked at, at uh, but, I mean, the cases in which we add a particle, not so in which we subtract. I'm them. talking about the Ivano. Yeah. One is oh, yeah, 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 no. The only thing he did, no, but he did. Because that. Yeah. This one. Yeah. No, he did. It's not the same. <laughs> Taking yeah. away one or putting one, right? So you get it to very different. Yeah, uh, but the data, they, they show that here, these bands, they all have the same number. <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> I mean, this, this is purely. Looking at the data, there's no interpretation yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. No, this this uh, this uh, equivalent state that you're finding there, what showing showing there in the case of carbon thirteen, yeah. has something to uh, in relation with the epi mode state, which is the the value is very similar. No, that I don't know. I don't know. It's from carbon twelve. But yeah, yeah. There are no not many information about it. No. This uh, uh, the value is very similar. It's eight point something. Yeah. <clears throat> One more question here from the John. Yeah. That's a good one. Gamma also will affect. Sorry. Gamma yeah. also will affect. The gamma person. So sorry, I, I did not. You say Cor was the only one who was in the nuclear phase. Yeah. Uh, Cor, cool. with that state you mentioned here. Yeah. You say that state. You you want name it. Gamma also has a name in one thing. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Which one is it? Gamma, okay. Yes, yes. Gamma the gamma of rest. Okay, the gamma of rest. We have many, many states. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Okay. Okay, fine. Any more comments or questions? Sorry, I got it. Thank you. Thank you.
Luisa Costa. Well, I'm happy to be here as soon as I say. And now it's fair. Well, Brian and Daniel asked me to present something related to what we have here in the last years. I, I will in particular speak about what we have uh, for nuclear studies. Uh, maybe we have more, uh, for sure, uh, facilities or devices <laughs> related to radiation, physics, or uh, maybe uh, some other application. Not totally related to nuclear physics, but I'm I, I just going to speak about this. What we are using now with our, our nuclear group and department for nuclear studies. So as introduction, well, I have to say that the last 10 years were not not, uh, not the best, but not, not the worst. We, we, we got uh, important uh, entrance of uh, money we are, uh, as you see, a new accelerator there that is Lemma, and some upgrading for the other accelerators, that's 5.5. Five. Um, we have now new facilities, detection systems, that many of them already are in progress, and we have access here in Mexico to a research reactor that I'd like to show you a bit, uh, accelerators, at least Lemma and Cinco Cinco on the graph. Beamlines, new ones, uh, the AMS system, detection system, two or three kind of DAC systems, and as you see, I uh, just saw before, sample preparation labs. Uh, for this reason, I'm going to use this presentation to make some kind of uh, review of all these kind of things that we have now. Uh, show some examples uh, about international collaboration. As well, well, the facilities, well, this is the red one, our favorite that we have. We love this accelerator. I may I have the opportunity that I made my uh, bachelor thesis in this accelerator. I'm studying at the beginning uh, ion beam analysis. Uh, Gordon Lade was my supervisor. Uh, many years ago. I look young, I know, but I know. <laughs> <laughs> this is the five uh, five presently called uh, Carlos Refernal Laboratory. As uh, I, I maybe more <laughs> now at 70, this is all all all, all diapositive. So this, these are the beams. Now I'm trying and, and the team is are uh, developing more of them. And well, this is the as, as Eduardo say the third line of this accelerator. And uh, as uh, seen they showed before, well, these accelerators are novelist machines, and well, that's important because we work we, we can continue working with them for many, many generations of uh, uh, researchers, students, and uh, so on. These are the, what we call GAITA, it's the beamline separator that we have here. We have the possibility there at five uh, to have all these lines that in principle they have some kind of, uh, uh, they, they are thought to be the vote to something, but we have presently working two or three of them as you, as you saw before, and this magnet that also was an animation. Uh, uh, and now, well, during the last seven years, more or less, we have to uh, start a big uh, uh, work that was uh, commanded by Ephraim to put again this accelerator to work and we were from the road. So, Pi Phi is not a junior accelerator that we have uh, with this more or less the same characteristics in Mexico. The other guy that we use a lot in the last uh, 50 years, maybe, is uh, the Ining one, which is the, uh, uh, the Instituto of uh, Investigaciones Nucleares, Instituto Nacional de Investigaciones Nucleares in Spanish, Nuclear Institute of uh, Research Studies, which is at 30 kilometers to Mexico City, which is a good thing. Uh, and currently, we try to work there. And uh, in the last uh, Five or six years, uh, the initiative of Libertad Barron and later uh, Daniel Marin was to use the reactor that they have there. That um, it's uh, from my point of view, it's not uh, uh, well, 
it's in some waste the possibilities that we have with this reactor, but we start to use and we make some some uh, nice uh, publications uh, or using the reactor and the accelerators and a combination of techniques I'm going to show before uh, later, sorry. And this is the, the, the most young man, which is the woman, as you put it, it's the man. <laughs> so this is Lema, and uh, you will visit before. Uh, Lema is the one uh, megavolt machine, and uh, you, it was very well described, described for sure for, by, by Ephraim uh, in situ. In fact, well, we have the possibility to measure these radioisotopes. We start to try to make up some nuclear physics with this radioisotope, but also some kind of applied physics. This is the <laughs> Uh, with, with some money that we got from the council, uh, we got this uh, new beam line, which is now working, and we made experiments there. We have articles, some publications, very young. This line it started in 2017. We have now some uh, publications related to this uh, beam line since uh, ion beam analysis as uh, field uh, nuclear, nuclear reactions and some kind of uh, Test uh, articles. So these are well with the possibility to accelerate many of, of the isotopes, but of course at low energies as far as we can reach with the uh, excited states. So uh, something that is the, the part more related to some part of some instrumentation uh, to this line is, is this new data decision system. I'm going to speak a little bit later. So this is the chamber that we have there. It's a multi-post chamber uh, that we can use for ion beam analysis, X-ray, uh, nuclear reactions, uh, whatever that we can we can try there. Here is one of the first study. This is the commissioning of fixed technique that we uh, start to make in working with uh, uh, in collaboration with Javier Miranda, and this is the. Uh, X-ray spectrum. This is a pattern that uh, we are using in a in a sample that is a uh, standard one. So uh, it works very well. Uh, it is experiment was in 2019. We have now preparing a new one experiment that is a new a new a new PhD thesis. So the other studies was made by uh, as also as this is back in our thesis of Walter uh, Teresa that is related to. Uh, try uh, the big precision measuring energy of the lemma accelerator which at the end was very good and well these are two publications related to, to this kind of studies that are, are not exactly nuclear ones but are more related to applications so this is one of the best uh, proof that we can use a combination a good combination of these techniques maybe uh, if Ryan start to speak uh, a bit this morning of this about these studies, we start more or less around 2015. This kind of studies combining AMS technique, obviously using the capabilities of Lema, but also the reaction production. So, uh, how how we, how how we can make this kind of physics? Well, we need to find some kind of reaction where you can try to use these radioisotopes, aluminum 26. And beryllium 10 or carbon 14, which are curiously, uh, the three of them uh, has a good relationship with the sophisticated measurements. So it's possible to make some kind of physics around there. Then once you got this reaction, you try to produce this reaction. So many times uh, it's possible, many times not. So one of these reactions that are made neutron capture, like this and like this, are perfectly possible in the reactor. So it was a very nice initiative of Libertad Barron to go to the, to the reactor, to the new, and try to make the uh, enrichment of one of these, uh, one cathode uh, with neutrons and to try to produce carbon-14 and also carbon-13. It, it was successful. So uh, later, uh, Daniel Marin made exactly the same, but in this case, with neutrons and beryllium. And at the same time, <clears throat> with Victoria Arbo, me and Efraim, we start here in the five-pile machine, Van de Graaff, 
with a aluminum 26 with this reaction, the deuterium alpha, a bombarding a cathode of silicon with the deuterium, of course. So we try this uh, here at Vandergraaff, but that's what we need. And this is more or less what happened with a cathode when we put inside of the reactor. You can see here one cathode that was not irradiated by neutrons. This is a spectrum, it's a, a delta E, e spectrum that, that is the traditional one that we can obtain at Lemma. So the black region is where we are expecting something, as you can see in a, in a non irradiated cathode. There is nothing inside, right, practically. But in the case of the irradiation, we can isolate very well the beryllium 10 events and also separate from the isobar, which is uh, bottom 10. So, with these got numbers, we start to measure some total reactions. And in the case of this reaction, we got very good numbers comparing with the things that were published. And then, uh, with these results, we got a very nice PRC article uh, that was uh, uh, well. Uh, Lead by Daniela and Libertad. And also, we have some other, other works related to uh, this reaction for the 26. And later on, uh, with this same measurement, but with adding in this publication and this study of how 26 continue working. So, this is the best proof that we can use all these systems in combination together with each other. Evidently, it, it, it needs a, a hard work. Uh, and the students are always necessary. <laughs> well, let me show you now the ancillary systems that we have working now here. This is one of the guys that uh, well, we have we, we, we have a very good expectations of this uh, system, which was uh, built by, by, by Efrain and Fran Favela in the, the, the thesis of Fran Favela. It's a supersonic gadget target that has a very nice name, I love. Sugar. And uh, when you read sugar around the world, well, you know that it's a Mexican device, which is very good. So uh, it's a window less gas, gas target, which is now presently, maybe you saw that, uh, in the 60 degrees line on the pandograph. And well, the capability of this jet after the commissioning was to obtain a 10, a 10 times uh, to 18 atom per square centimeter thickness, target thickness in, the, in this. Language this is really, really thin. So this is very important when you are trying to make some kind of physics with this kind of uh, accelerators of low energy. So uh, this is good. The projection energy resolution that we found was 200 kV, which is also very good. So this is the commissioning that we start to make on 2015, I, I think. And we use a deuterium beam on Earth. Uh, Earth. You can just open the bulb and uh, let the air enter inside. So here is the telescope that we mount there with two detectors, and we try to measure something that was, in principle, it seems that it's touching nothing because it's gas. And uh, well, the gas is, is dead, I, 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 <laughs> I swear. So we study this reaction that is more or less known. But uh, in order to have something simple using uh, the nitrogen coming from there. This is more or less the setup that we use. Here is a prime, and here is Fran. They put the, the guilty that this was working. So, this is the spectra that was very nice when it was astonished when we found this spectra because the, all the alpha states, all the alpha stations are very well separated. So, you can see, you know, this uh, banana and then the deuterium uh, elastic is here. So, the, we start to be very happy and some. Of the, these uh, excitations were measured in an excitation function. So, uh, particularly these oxygen 16 levels, no, we, can, we can find many of them. And this uh, finally was published in this uh, special topics uh, fiscal review uh, in 2015. Ah, well, uh, it continued. We, we tried to continue <coughs> working with the jet till, till we have to stop the beam in the, in the pipeline. So, sometime we, we have some. Uh, Javier, Javier Valente visit here, which is now the people in charge of gamma collaboration or gamma experiment there at Leñaro. He proposed to make some kind of a plan or proposal for a, taking advantage of that Agatha returned to Leñaro some, some years ago. 
um, and we start to make a collaboration agreement between INFN, the Laboratorio Nacional de Leñaro, and IFUNAM. And well, we use as a first reaction this oxygen oxygen system that in astrophysics is a very popular one and one of the uh, venues. But also the reaction that I showed before and other reactions uh, that well, also was mentioned, of course, for uh, Berulo. So the IFUNAM signed this collaboration agreement in 2021. Yes, it's here. And well, the idea is try to support in some ways, in institutional way, uh, the shipping and the building of things to put our jet. Obviously, you saw that jet is like that. But in the first interaction or the first, the first interac interaction, we have to move this, this first part, which is the differential uh, system from uh, two meters from the chamber. So it was just to make the proposal, but the reality is very different. Here we have the chamber that in the design, well, is touching all the Germanium. Uh, each Germanium is costs of more than a million euro. So <laughs> this is not possible. Of course, we need to modify this. So the first necessary modification is to check if all the vacuum differential system will work two meters apart uh, from the chamber. So we plan a test that we developed this year to control this, <laughs> this, 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 this issue. And we start to work. You see many, many, many heads. They are all our students, as you see, there are many. Uh, and we are happy for that. So they are helping uh, put in this line. And uh, this is practically that we need at Leñaro, these two meters five. And we start to prove, well, we come with the, uh, I've come with the work from the workshop here to make some pieces to adapt the line and so on and so on. And finally, our tests of these things, uh, well, we measure the vacuum in many different points. And this was the result. This is the current uh, vacuum that we spec at the jet chamber, which is here, that is close to minus one torr. This is perfectly what we are waiting for in the in the in the previous in the previous configuration. So this is okay. But the important thing is what is happening here, and the history is very good because we are around minus two, minus three, minus five, and even minus six, which is a vacuum that we can use to connect the line and to open the valve to start to work with the assembly. So uh, the test was successful. On the other hand, we start to work with, with simulations. It's, it's still uh, a bit uh, uh, um, rare work. So raw work, we started. I showed you this, this, this video that is very nice. This is the how the how the gas inside the chamber start to get out from the chamber. This is one thing that we call catcher, and this is the nozzle that is uh, receiving the gas. And we can, with simulation, in particular with this, this code, ANSYS, uh, how, what, how the, is the behavior of this gas inside? It's important why? because we are making many modifications. And if we can, we can try to work with this, it's better to uh, see first in a simulation than work directly and try to build everything. So at the same time, we start to work with um, Thompson, that we have uh, Libertad again. La Libertad is an expert in this program because she's working with magnetic fields uh, for uh, her project uh, about neutrons. And then Erika is working in this uh, simulation. This is very nice. It's, it's very, very beginning of this, this, of this show. She started this year, well, the last year, 23. So you can see here something that for me is very nice, which is more or less the shape that we are expecting for the uh, jet target. That obviously in the program you can see. So this is a this more or less a, this, this work was started by David Bose, that is my PhD student, and Jose Juan Gomen, that is an engineer that is working also with us. And a part of the work is also done by Fabiola, Fabiola Silva and Erika, as she's in charge of this part with Libertad of Consul. And Carlos Valencia is making all the models to put inside of these programs. So uh, well, it's obviously a uh, work making in team. 
in another test that we tried to make inside of a uh, five pi accelerator it's here uh, well we move first but then once we're there we start to use the jet to try what happened with the detectors you know uh, well we are speaking about one gas that is centered in a chamber at supersonic velocities so it's always a doubt and it was very difficult uh, with italians to convince that we can put detectors inside so they are uh, for they is usual to use this kind of target that are solid. So you say, okay, it's a target that is getting out at supersonic velocities. You say, well, it's like a concord. No? I mean, uh, of course, you have turbulence inside, and well, the uh, bachelor thesis of uh, Fabiola just is trying to see what is happening with this kind of detectors. And we use very, very thin ones. 12, 12, 12 micron one and well, 12 micron gram and 60 micron one. This is a telescope, and we make a measure by eight hours without jet and with jet. And it's not clear, but there are many uh, spectra superposed. It's every two hours we took this uh, information and we put over the other, and we make this by eight hours, and we saw that the information is exactly the same. So it means that the resolution in the detector is not changing, and that is the message that we are not losing uh, the what we are not damaging the detector at least in this period. So later we will. This is another source. This is another source. Yes, yes. yes. And we 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 don't have beam. We, we still try with beam. We don't have beam here. With an alpha source CCC because you can cut and cut and open and open and we try with a monochromatic alpha source. This is an alpha source that is closed with some kind of material for the reason the resolution is not the best, but it's a merisium. Uh, here is the alpha source, uh, uh, triple alpha source. I, I, I don't see very well, but it's there. I promise you, it's two peaks. And this is a strip what for one uh, silicon strip detector. So you know there are bigger areas. And also you have always the you are scared about what happened with this is mounted here. The jet is uh, passing by here. So uh, also with this, here we have the eight hours superposed spectra, and we never 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 saw any any change in resolution, which is the message, the direct message that something is happening with it. So we are very happy because we can send this message to our colleagues and you, we can say, okay, your detectors. Are safe. You know, the detectors is one of the most expensive part of this kind of physics. About mechanics, well, this is a very incredible Google job that is making uh, Carlos Valencia. So this is the how how it's working now. We need to modify many things first to make a new chamber that you can see here, uh, and to make a new pipe to connect to all the jail system. <laughs> here is not Agatha in the, the drawing. This is easy to disappear it inside of the program, but here is again Agatha, which is a monster, as you can see. <laughs> and here is, uh, is the pipe that we, well, there is the, 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 the they, they call the shop, that is a big pipe that is holding the whole structure of Agatha. And inside this pipe that you saw in our experiment uh, of, two, of two meters and the differential vacuum, this is Prisma, that is here, and this in this pipe is the In the top view, well, you can see how the jet is practically at one centimeter from from Prisma, which is important thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm finishing it. And uh, the jet is very close to data, so we are on the limit. But I think that we have uh, it's taller us still. So uh, this is the the status of the jet. We are really close to have a final design to to prepare our technical report. To share with the Italians and to say, okay, we are ready uh, to start to building something. Well, this is the, the other part of detectors. This is the array that we start to build around 2016-17 that we call CIMA, Sistema Mobile de Alta Segmentación. And well, CIMA is composed of a very, very thin detectors, 20 microns. And well, this is the e detector that is a path, which is uh, a bit thicker, it's 130 microns. We make all the projection, and this was also a, a social service that we have to hear of Fausto Morales and Carlos Flores. Uh, these are uh, the designs that they start to make. 
We made everything, all our pieces, uh, not, not the disk, but all, of, all, all the pieces related to the detector are made by, uh, as you can see here, by 3D printer, which is not just cheaper, but also something that you can modify and modify and probably every six hours you can have a new piece, which is very, very good advantage in this and the best thing that they work very well on their vacuum <laughs> conditions. <laughs> then the DAC, which is a very modern one, is that they use a TSI. It was commissioning in 2017, I think. It's FEVEX, maybe you know them. This is now digitized, but they call digitized. It's a problem board with optical link extension where we can have sampling rate in uh, about 65 milliseconds per second. And it has different systems, specs or tricks or that are the, the electronics that's ASIC that is related to uh, how to manage the trigger, uh, the trigger signal, and with the cards are here. It's, it's mounted now at 5.5, maybe you saw that. So, which is the advantage of uh, that that is digitized, uh, digitized and not a, a, a no one, that you don't have amplifiers. And the amplifier is one of the most expensive things uh, when you start to make your data transition system. So, we can uh, forget these guys and go directly to the computer using the signal coming with amplifiers, which is yeah, the one advantage is that. Uh, well, you have to be very careful with noise because obviously the ground fire signal is, is, is more, it's smaller. So uh, you need to have a very, very clean signal and you, you need to find it, of course. These are the first tests that we made with this, the commission in Oxima that was very well. It was also in Cinco Cinco where we're, we found very, very, uh, maybe it's the best place uh, about noise. It's, 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 it's very, very clean about noise, even, even more than the map. And say to and uh, this is the alpha alpha test that we made there at five five, and this is the one peak cell inside of the uh, DSSSD detector. These are the small ones. We have also small telescopes with five detectors and with surface bearing detectors, and this is a very nice spacer that we this was the 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 piece the, the master thesis of uh, Luis Charon that. It was made a master thesis as the Libertad. The CMAS commissioning. Here you can see how was the last uh, pieces that we built. It's a, it's a very tricky system, but it's very safe for the detector, and, and we are happy with it. And this is the alpha source here. This is a 20 micron detector. It has very bad resolution, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that it's good for uh, to make a telescope separation, as you can see here with very low energies in the case of uh, high particle reactions, light, light particle reactions, sorry. This is the experiment, but this is the article that mentioned before, Masim, that we made uh, the last uh, two years ago at Notre Dame, where we have CMAS, the complete CMAS that is now with four telescopes working very well. This was mounted inside of the chamber of Triso to make this, this experiment. This is the spectra that now they have even better resolution with this trice on this, this third solenoid. So this is the article that was published the last year. That we are we're now very happy working with CMAS, but also in, inside of this collaboration, we are planning to make more. Are some of those there. things made with the 3D printer? Sorry? Are some of those things made with the 3D printer? Yeah. Wow. All the pieces. All the pieces. Even the base. Yes. <laughs> Except for the detector, and not the scaling, so everything, all this is, is 3D printed, wow. and it works very well. Well, this is my summary. Well, I, I was talking in this <laughs> presentation about our Bandegraaf accelerator, the tandem accelerator that we have at Benin, our research reactor that is uh, also at Benin. A lemma, the mass accelerator, and low energy lemma line that I showed you before. Well, this takes the important economic injection. I say that because in many other years it was not like that. And then it's not the best, but it's not bad. We have this money to make all these things and complete many of the system. And uh, well, I mentioned that we have now new beam lines, cast target, a very nice and novel array for charge particle identification that we call CMAS. And this very nice data decision system that is FedEx and other detectors on the worship and worship capabilities, as you can see, distribution of things. And well, always we are searching for new ideas to make new, new experiments. So, well, 
just let me thank you for your attention. I put just the names of the people that we have now a uh, permanent position here, but you know, gracias totales to all the social service students, bachelor diploma students, master students, PhD students, and bosses. And not just the three Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, first things um, Everything is fishy. <laughs> Anyway. Yeah, so you're, uh, you didn't talk about it much, but the, the trigger reactor is a very nice yeah. thing yeah, that you yeah. could be using. So, yeah. So, uh, is it open for like uh, users or? Yeah, I, the... I think that you have to go uh, to them uh, uh, by means of us, but yes, but yes, because. Uh, well, we started with Libertad. I, 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 I'm very proud about Libertad because it was not easy to convince them to make some physics because they make some applications or something to, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, <coughs> more, uh, modifications or something. I mean, you have to use uh, isotopic radioactive uh, isotopes for that But this is, this is something to make science if you, if you, if you, reach them with one of us, of course, with Libertad or Daniel that has experience. But I think that if you, you have a good plan, you can convince them because they start to get publications, <laughs> which is also good for them, no? I mean, this article is, 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 is a product coming from just this reactor for research. You have, you have at least four, well, to make this kind of validation, you have at least Three ports, I, I don't know, yes, three ports. Three, three, four, three or four ports, and you have different uh, amount of neutrons. This is the difference between the ports because they are far from and in different position and a different velocity. So you have the, no, one is moving, or the one is moving, this is in a ring. This is, this is done in the port. Yeah. And then they have four radial beams and four kind of beam lines. For neutrons. And so yeah. this, this, this iteration were done in the core itself. So, and they, well, you plan your cathode, your things, and you go there, you live there, and well, this experiment was made probably in one hour. <laughs> yeah, because you have a, a, a huge amount of neutrons. So, even you need to, to, to find these lines, but you have less rate of neutrons to have something more, better control. Um, but, but, but it works very well. At the end, this, as, as you can see, very intense. Spectra. Well, this is just neutrons from coming from in a in a cathode. It was a standard one, Daniel. Yeah. A standard one of very intense uh, uh, that we use for the lemma, for example. Yeah, when we did the analysis here at the AMS facility, facility, I came up with the cross sections. Our cattle bars were this big because of very well, at least put it probably an hour. So they didn't know exactly how much yeah. that, <laughs> those things were yeah. related to it. Yeah, but in carbon incident, it's even better. Yeah. Uh, when you put some graphite, you have tremendous amount of production of carbon protein. So yes, you are welcome. If you want to make something, yeah. you have a good plan, maybe we can try. Yes. Yeah, but the doors are open since uh, Libertad yeah. started going there and the results came out and they, they were published, they're happy. So yeah, yeah I think we, we think that they're talking about. Any other comment? Thank you, Luis, for uh, <laughs> so we're going to hear about something that's already been the, 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 the column of this laboratory for many years. This is the material that is uh, what I guess that's what you're going to yeah, <laughs> and uh, of course, Tim Wood is an uh, institution in the university, but for those of you who doesn't know this, he, he doesn't work at the Institute of Physica, but the material sciences, and uh, uh, we have been working with him in a collaboration for, for, for many years, especially at Harvard. He's been working with him for, for for two decades. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Great. Okay. So, uh, Philip and James spoke to the 
science of nuclear uh, physics to the use of the iron beams, sort of thing, that particularly in the area of thin films and nanoparticle research, which is what I mainly work on in the Institute. I give uh, a brief introduction to how I came into the world of uh, iron beam analysis. I did my PhD and MSc in Lancaster in England uh, and in conjunction with the Atomic Energy Research Establishment in Harwell in UK, which was one of the most important uh, iron beam labs. Uh, Jeff Dernerly was the head of the group. Many of you may have reckon, may recognize the name from early publications many years ago. Uh, I just thought I'd mention as well, so somebody mentioned it in the morning that uh, they came from near Boston, or they lived near Boston, right? <laughs> I was born near Boston, but the original Boston. <laughs> <laughs> the one was again. Okay. Uh, and the Howell one had, and there's two bits in my talk, uh, which I want to talk, uh, introduce at the beginning. One of them was based on the Crocker Fulton accelerator, which was used as uh, an iron implanter. It wasn't used for iron beam analysis. Uh, and today I haven't heard anybody talking about iron, iron implantation. Uh, I mean, uh, um, yeah, very okay. Uh, because it seems to have lost favor to a large extent. And I think it's something we're missing. There's, there's still a lot to be done in iron implantation uh, mm -hmm. to understand uh, the physics of what happens in materials and structures. Um, Cochrane Fulton, as I said here, I won't repeat what it says. Uh, this was what the Cochrane Fulton looked like uh, in Harwell, um, on the actual site. This was the Gleep, the back of the Gleep, first nuclear reactor built in England. <laughs> um, uh, at that time, it was not working, obviously, but it was the background to, uh, to the lab. Um, interesting, for those of you who are in, involved in the engineering, uh, this is uh, 1970. That's a turbo, a turbo molecular pump. <laughs> uh, that's a long time ago, <laughs> the, the turbo molecular pumps. Um, this was the, uh, the, the chamber where we landed our samples. Uh, quite a nice design with copying uh, Kodak where you could put the, the samples in plates of metal and then feed them into the multiple, uh, treat multiple samples without having to uh, empty the, uh, uh, to vent the chamber. Uh, and will work very well indeed. Um, the system, the Fiskop reporter was designed to put a very extensive list of elements that you could iron implant into whatever you have as a sample. Okay. And during my work, I did more about 34 <laughs> elements into pure chromium and then oxidize the chromium for such a time. And then I wanted to look at the properties of the chromium oxide uh, and the difference uh, the iron implanting uh, made to the chromium uh, oxi the oxidation process of the chromium to understand uh, better how. Uh, what we knew about the presentation. This was the vanograph that we had. You can see the desk here and somebody down here for the, the scale, uh, typical sort of scale for a vanograph generator. Uh, and at that time, they didn't just talk about Rutherford backscattering, it was Rutherford backscattering analysis. So it was our RBSA. And hydrogen, um, uh, hydrogen production. Uh, which was actually ERDA, uh, what we call ERDA these, these days. Uh, and this was the line that we used, uh, the actual line, and the measurement involved RBS using uh, protons, an alpha particle for elementary composition and thickness measurement, and induced nuclear reactions using these two uh, reactions, basically, uh, to look at the oxygen content uh, concentration and depth profile of the oxygen within the chromium oxide layers. So this is why I dedicated a few years of my life uh, sweating and worrying about trying to get my PhD. And then when I came out to Mexico, uh, I 
was fortunate enough to listen to a talk by Eduardo. He was talking about exactly what I used, I was quite accustomed to doing. So we started sitting down and started to uh, work together as an obvious mutual interest between us. Uh, one of the first works, which was 19, ended up being published in 1994, probably a couple of years before that when we started doing the work, uh, which was uh, Eduardo Juan Manuel Mendes and a few other people, where we were looking to use uh, nuclear reactions, um, to, due to, to look at the uh, distribution of nitrogen with the, uh, the content of the nitrogen in the boron nitride. Uh, we didn't, uh, we measured some, uh, some, uh, the, did some induced nuclear reactions of boron, but most of it, most of it was done with nitrogen. Uh, our interest in this was to use um, uh, plasma enhanced techniques, uh, PECVD and sputtering, to make cubic boron nitride, because at that time, cubic boron nitride was a very interesting, well, it still is, but at uh, that time, we, nobody knew how to make it. And we managed to show that under certain conditions using PECVD, we could, be, uh, could get circuit stoichiometric material and that it could be cu uh, cubic. Um, so that was great fun doing that work. Another one was an aluminium nitride, <coughs> with, uh, which was the work of my student, Pan Antonio Zapien, who at the moment is working in the University, City University in Hong Kong, and is the lead, one of the leaders in the electrometers in the world. Uh, very, very good contact when I want to do something with this. Um, he would use uh, rather for back to the nuclear reaction analysis again uh, to look at the composition of the aluminium nitride form uh, that we made. Um, interesting, I, I, I had a conversation with him. Um, we, how did we make this aluminium nitride? We start with a target of aluminium and we make a plasma of argon with a little bit of nitrogen and what you don't get deposited on the, on the substrate is aluminium nitride. But you've got a chemical reaction in there somewhere, but the aluminium gets together with the nitrogen and forms aluminium nitride. Now, does that occur? It cannot occur in the gas. You can't balance the momentum and energetic energy conservation ideas in the gas. So there's no reaction in the gas phase. The reaction occurs in the surface of the substrate or in the surface of the target. Which is correct, all the both of them could, could occur. And nobody really knew. And even today, if you look in detail at re uh, reactive magnetron sputtering, that piece of information is not clearly known. But when I tell you, came up with the idea that, okay, let's look at the sample which we made over a large distance. If the nitrogen is coming from the plasma, then you get a certain distribution of aluminium and nitrogen and certain variation of the co concentration, the ratio of the concentration. If it's all coming from the target, then the concentration will not be the same everywhere. So we did the measurements and he came to the conclusion that you, when you were using DC, the chemical reaction was principally occurring on the substrate. And when you were using RF, the chemical reaction was occurring principally on the surface of the target. And I thought that was a, an ingenious, uh, very clear idea of how to do good research. Uh, these were typical uh, sort of um, spectral that we would get because we would get the uh, induced reaction from oxygen and the induced reaction from carbon, but then it allowed us to look clearly at the amount of nitrogen that we had in the films. Um, I also did a lot of work on amorphous carbon and on carbon nitride. Carbon nitride, none of most of the people here won't know, but carbon nitride at one time was a very interesting material. It was called super diamond. It was considered that uh, if diamond had a hardness of 100, then carbon nitride theoretically, unfortunately, it gave me 
in, in scientific be a great number of doubts about theoretical works because they propose that uh, carbon nitride should have a hardness of, of 120 to 130. Uh, 20 percent, 30 percent higher hardness than diamond. This has been shown to be rubbish, but uh, <laughs> it's not true, okay, for a variety of reasons. But there was a lot of interest in doing work on carbon nitride, and we joined the uh, the mix of doing carbon nitride. Um, uh, trying to make C3M4, which was the, the super material that, we were trying, that everybody was trying to make. Um, we were particularly interested in using uh, the uh, iron beam analysis to work out the concentration of relative concentration of the carbon nitrogen. But of course, as you look, as you look at this, uh, this is not easy to get a good figure of how much carbon and how much nitrogen there is in there. You've got, you got all this big background of a very small signal. Um, but uh, somebody came up, I'm not sure they said, well, or it was me or one of us came up with the idea. Well, let's, say, let's take our silicon wafer, deposit a thin layer of titanium, thin enough, so that the silicon spectra gets moved to lower because you lose the energy through the titanium. And that you end up with the titanium and the nitrogen signals without having this big background. We tried it, it works, it occurs to work. The problem is repeating it. <laughs> Getting it right and doing it in a reproducible manner so you can compare how much carbon and nitrogen you get is very difficult. So yes, it worked, it was a good idea. It's not included in this paper because we didn't do enough of the work to, but it's the sort of thing you can play around with to play with substrates so that the iron beam analysis will give you better results than what would normally do. It was interesting as well, this quite large peak here, which corresponded to argon. Uh, well, argon doesn't react. This is argon, which has just been implanted into the substrate, in, into the growing film. And there's been four or 5% of argon that's been incorporated before the deposit. Okay. So yes, we could try new things and things work. Uh, this was work, I'm glad somebody talked about at the in in uh, uh, nuclear place. Uh, well, I've worked for many years with Enrique Camps, and Eduardo worked for many years with Saul Romero, um, looking at, uh, Saul came up with um, a software program to do the measurements of ERDA, uh, and using both for the carbon nitride work and for the uh, plasma nitriding work we were doing, because the nitriding system we use in microwave, where you're using a mix of hydrogen and nitrogen, then you always get some hydrogen uh, implanted into the uh, nitride layer. Uh, but <coughs> because of the problems of measuring uh, hydrogen concentration, very few groups in the world are actually measuring the amount of hydrogen. We came up with some quite interesting results. I don't know what else I've got in here. Yeah. Um, we have a CR source. Sorry? We have 2.45 CR source. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 2.5. That was the microwave, the ECR source, actually, that um, Enrique Camps did his PhD in Russia. Uh, and there they developed the ECR source. He, Came back to Mexico, made the ECR source, all homemade, all pieces of wire wrapped around to make the loop magnets, uh, and it works very nicely. Um, gives a very high density plasma, uh, typically 10 to 13, 10 to 14 uh, parts per uh, cubic centimeter, um, at uh, about 10 to the minus 4. So, this was a great source of ions for doing iron nitride. We were doing, with this system, we were doing, getting nitriding effects, tripling, quadrupling the hardness uh, over 10, 20 uh, microns of production in 40 minutes. Stuff that would normally take uh, a day. <laughs> okay. So the results were, were, were quite nice. And uh, we used it as something which I've always worried about a little. Uh, you can work out what the thickness is from nuclear reaction techniques. You can also work out what the thickness is 
uh, by using other techniques, uh, other well, photonometry and for EDX. So what I wanted to do was look at uh, how good is the thickness when you measure using different techniques. We tend to think, oh, this one works, this is my thickness. You really need to question that sometimes. It's not always the same. And the compositions, equally, compositions measured by different techniques, is normally somewhat different. The tens, the variations, do agree between the uh, techniques, but the thicknesses of the compositions might actually be very different. Uh, this was some work done uh, on silicon carbide for the Microsoft by Mohammed. Again, we have the problem of the carbon and the silicon and the nitrogen, um, but we managed to get enough uh, using the rock to, uh, to get uh, a fairly good description of what was going on between the plasma parameters that we were using and the results of the films. Uh, also, we looked at titanium nitride, titanium multi layers using sputtering, where you, uh, you sputter in argon nitrogen for a while and then you take up the nitrogen and use the sputtering. Right? So you get titanium nitride layer, then a titanium layer, titanium layer. We could do um, what Martin, Martin Flores, who was a student who did that, um, would make films up to 12 multiple layers. Uh, good, good patient student. <laughs> uh, the system worked quite nicely. And he worked out that the corrosion resistance of these films were, was very good. <clears throat> what we did do was use RBS to look very carefully and to model how the multiple layers, uh, because of course you get different concentrations of nitrogen, but you also get changes in the density. Uh, working out the thickness of this is uh, not a, an easy thing to do because one thickness layer has a certain density and the next layer has a different density. And that is very often not taken into account uh, in the calculations. Okay, hydrogen plasma itching. Here we were using a hydrogen plasma of very high tensor very high, 10 to the 13 uh, density plasma to hydrogen H uh, different, well, uh, silicon dioxide to start with in a hollow cathode system. Um, <laughs> we're using, or video, a video was working here with Alicia, I think, making uh, nanoparticles in quartz. And what they wanted to do was to remove the quartz and get down to the nanoparticles so they could do uh, good analysis of the nanoparticles. <clears throat> um, we found that uh, under certain conditions, we weren't etching the films. Uh, under certain extreme conditions, what we were doing were quickly, we noted a, a dark deposit on top of the sample. So we, got, we weren't removing material, we were pulling it. So we said, okay, what's this? Uh, I went to uh, applied uh, RBS and Pixie and came out with this very thin 2.8 <laughs> nanometer thickness molybdenum target on the top, the target of film on top of the target. And what we came to the conclusion was that our hollow cathode was made out of molybdenum. <clears throat> now, hydrogen sputtering rate of molybdenum is zero. It doesn't exist. But what you can get is hydrogen chemical uh, uh, sputtering where you promote uh, molybdenum hydride, which is what's out, comes out, came down onto the substrate. The substrate are those under these conditions that are very hot, you know, 400, 500 degrees. This would decompose the molybdenum hydride, leaving the molybdenum and the hydrogen going up. <laughs> so we repeated. How do you know the hydrogen thing? Um, we did it. That, that's an experiment which still needs to be done. Certainly, I was, I was going to say that because we repeated, <laughs> we repeated the experiment now, then with tantalum to make tantalum hydride. At very high temperatures, the, uh, the films were dark and conductive, therefore, probably preferentially metal. But at the lower temperatures, 
they were uh, transparent and isolating. Uh, we can have the temperatures on there. What we have here was that of a high dry, and at the high temperatures, it had gone down to tantalum. But uh, we've also done some experiments with titanium, also got the high dry. It's <coughs> one of these situations where this, for me, this is a really interesting project. I need hands, I need a student to take this up and go run with it. So that well, it's sounds decent to you. I'm going to tell you my opinion. But uh, you're com completely correct. Uh, do we have pure bone on it, or is it molecular and hydride? I don't know. I don't think the answer to that. It is molecular and different. Julio, um, where's Julio? Julio's out somewhere over there. Yeah. Uh, he's worked with Eduardo, he's worked with me. He's worked with various groups around here, and they developed the coast structuring simulation for uh, um, describing, predicting the distribution and composition of the deposit made by in the structuring system. Uh, in order to be able to check whether this is right or not, what they ended up by doing was depositing uh, whole loads of materials and then coming across and making RBS measurements. Uh, of these uh, of these films in order to uh, work out what will the composition it do that for five percent five or eight percent how many seven positions or five positions five positions on on each substrate so each sample was five RBS measurements uh, it's, a, it's a lot of work but fortunately things worked out quite well and uh, they uh, they did some. Uh, the, the, this this structuring simulation has has had <laughs> so so more than twenty years. Uh, I worked. There's been really nice work between the Institute of Physics and on our group Plasma Max uh, of the Institute of Materials, and we worked on quite an extensive <laughs> group of material. Not all of the work ended up in publications. Not, a, not always works out. You try things and things, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The, the, the sputtering work we did on amorphous hydrogen was very interesting. It gave us a way of calibrating uh, FTIR measurements to find out how much hydrogen was in the amorphous silicon. It was much easier to do an FTIR measurement of uh, the silicon than to do an earlier measurement of these, uh, of these samples. Uh, uh, the silicon carbide work. Carbon-based materials including amorphous carbon, nanostructured graphite, diamond-like and diamond films. The nanostructured graphite or amorphous carbon, uh, under one set of conditions, my student who was doing it for me came back and he said, uh, the deposit is, this is carbon, so the same thing as carbon, but I put it down next to a magnet, and all the carbon slammed into the side, I've got made magnetic carbon. Uh, uh, I to <laughs> but sure enough, the deposit, uh, colloid, put a magnet up against it, it was black at this side. So I uh, came to talk to Eduardo and we did pixie measurements on these. The metallic content was less than 10 ppm. So uh, 10 ppm, okay, yes, there was iron in it, yes, there was copper in it. But is that enough to explain such a strong uh, magnetic property? No, uh, it was a very interesting material, but it was one of these experiments which unfortunately could not be re re reproduced. <laughs> we, uh, we had five sample followers, and that was it. We tried to repeat it many times. I mean, uh, it was magnetic carbon, it didn't have a lot of metal in, so the metal was not an explanation. Why were and they, we did we managed to do some measurements on the magnetic properties, some interesting magnetic properties, but not enough to be able to do uh, serious reproducible measurements. Oh, it. So it was interesting. Metals, metal oxides, metal nitrides have been our principal work. Uh, Multi-layer films such as metal and metal oxides. Uh, and multiple co component vectors. Some of the more recent work has been chromium, polymer, molybdenum, zirconium, etc., etc. Ternary and uh, quaternary uh, groups of uh, um, elements in, in samples. We 
with or without oxygen or nitrogen. And what we're interested in is the composition and the profile, the profile of the composition. Is it the same profile throughout or does it vary? Uh, carbon coated metal nanoparticles and nanocomposites. This was uh, uh, another area. <laughs> the same student for me who made the magnetic diamond said, I want to do some experiments. And what he was doing, he had two graphite electrodes, one millimeter pieces of graphite, a whole bank, uh, bank of capacitors, and he would discharge the capacitors. This is it. <laughs> discharge the capacitors between these two points. Uh, about 8,000 amps in 20 microseconds. Okay, that is a big bang. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Uh, and they produce a lot of material. Although. And you came in and said, Look, I want to try this, but we'll change the take away one of the graphite and put a piece of metal. Got all of it. And he made it. Now, that produced, for me, I mean, uh, surprising results. Yes, with that amount of energy, you are vaporizing everything in a very, very short space of time. So, what you've got is a vapor of metal ions and carbon ions. Now the carbon likes to solidify, condense 3,500 degrees. The metal or something like that, <coughs> 1,000 degrees. What are you going to get? You're going to get a carbon nucleus covered with a metal, or are you going to metal nucleus with a carbon in the outside? Now my simplistic thought was the carbon is going to get cold first, and the metal is going to cope with carbon. I'm wrong. <laughs> you get a metal nucleus covered with a metal carbon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm still not I completely understand why that worked. When we did it in a little bit of oxygen, we got a metal oxide coated with amorphous carbon. We did a couple of experiments with titanium and nitrogen. We got titanium nitride covered with amorphous carbon. Uh, we've done quite a lot of work on that, and uh, the results have been very interesting. Uh, deposited as well with an amorphous carbon uh, <coughs> matrix. And there's some very interesting results coming out of that. These samples for RBS, where you've got a 3D structure, are not easy to analyze. If anybody's here, if you want to get a good idea of how to analyze these things, it'd be very interested to know that. And, and developers of uh, software, the course software, Julio, on the spatial distribution of things. It was essential the, uh, the work on uh, RBI, iron beam analysis was essential. So it has been a productive collaboration and great fun. Stephen, comments, questions? For Stephen, uh, Osvaldo. Yeah, see, I, I mean, about the thermal effects, yeah, can you tell something about the, uh, the way in the specific heat from the, uh, uh, say, thermal evolution of this uh, system where you have a carbon and the, and the metals coming out? Because can be the, you can make kind of, for uh, uh, in that. Uh, yeah, well, we did quite a lot of optical scattering work on the explosion. Yeah. Okay. And we got the conclusion you needed, if you did it at very low pressure, mm -hmm. 10 to minus 3, 10 to minus 4, you didn't get nanoparticles. All you got was amorphous material. If you got up to a, a pressure, normally we're using argon, of around about 0.5. 0.6 to 0.8 then we would have started to get nanoparticles and the pressure determined the, nano, uh, uh, the diameter of the nanoparticles. So we could make nanoparticles from 10 uh, nanometers diameter up to 90 nanometers with about a 20, 30 uh, nanometer uh, variation in the base. That's about 400. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
For, so, so my conventional colleagues are very excited about this uh, twisted binary graphic. <laughs> is that kind of research can be done here? Or yes, it is done here. Uh, I'm going to call a link to Mendoza who does that. Also, that's what I'm doing. Uh, he's been looking at, uh, he developed uh, a light switch, basically based on graphene, where you apply another light source and that turns <laughs> off, changes the transparency of the graphene layers. Thank you very much, Stephen. Well, okay. Um... Well, thank you, Well, uh, we, we have planned a uh, uh, round table so we will happily uh, talk about what we, what we think and what we can relate and retire on is not going to be very successful. So, what I propose is that. Uh, we came back to uh, each other with the uh, uh, thoughts and uh, ideas and uh, make a document of uh, what we think happened here. Uh, I'll start saying that it, 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 it was a fantastic meeting. There was a lot of uh, empathy and, uh, and uh, coming in. And thank you very much for, for your patience, for your contributions. And uh, well, I hope. We will continue working together to work for the time. I thank you for the organizers and the Javier, Pisa, Javier, Alan, who worked very hard to get this to work of, uh, uh, together and uh, uh, all the students for the collaboration with the town and uh, everybody for, for the guidance. Uh, Yes, I really want to thank you, uh, all the invited speakers, for accepting to give this talk. So, and uh, it's been a pleasure meeting you, you and having you here. I hope and we can keep this cooperation. And one more thing can we take a photo of you? Uh, well, if you want to take a photo of him, or whatever, right? yeah. you know, just quick and then you disappear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that you have been all of you have been one of the wonderful colleagues. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. And and the fact that there are so many men in the session is pretty inspiring. We, we cannot do this without them. So, yes, yes. thank you. Thank you.